Amazon superhero show The Boys was a huge hit, so let's get you caught up on what happened in season one. It would help if we introduced you to the main characters. They are the seven. Honestly, it's probably easiest if I compare them to superheroes that everybody knows. So you've got Homelander. His suit looks like Captain Marvel. He's kind of supposed to be Captain America, but he has the ability to fly. Cyclops-like lasers that come out of his eyes. Supersonic hearing. And he can see through walls. After that, you've got Queen Maeve. She's supposed to be like the Wonder Woman type. She's fast, impenetrable, can also fly. You've got Black Noir, who's like a ninja type. The Deep, who's supposed to be just like Aquaman. You've also got the A-Train, who's supposed to be like the Flash. His superpower is that he runs so fast, nobody can even see him. Then there's Translucent, whose superpower is he can turn invisible. And finally, Lamplighter. But Lamplighter is retiring, which leaves a hole in the Seven. And all these superheroes live throughout the country. It's a lot like the X-Men. And when you're a superhero or soup, you sign a deal with a company. Think of it like signing a deal with a professional sports team or an agency. And in this case, the company that owns the Seven, who is by far the most popular superhero group, is a group called Vought. And they literally own everything. First of all, they own 300 superheroes throughout the country to protect cities. But they own film rights, merchandising rights. All these superheroes aren't just superheroes. They're a product. They're a brand. And they'll even sell their superheroes from one city to another, which we'll get to later on in the episode. So the first episode starts out with... Homelander and Queen Maeve thwarting a bank robbery. And after they do it, they're taking selfies with the public. Everybody's loving it. It just shows their popularity. Shortly after that, in the same city, you get introduced to a guy named Huey. Huey is an introvert who works at basically a radio shack. And he's so much of an introvert and so much of a non-confrontational guy that he gets scared to ask his boss for a raise. With that day, his girlfriend comes into the store and as they're leaving, they're talking about their future, moving in together. She's got one foot in the street. As they're having this conversation, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she completely explodes. It leaves Huey with her blood on his face and him just holding her hands. And what happened was the A-Train literally ran through her. He was going so fast that he runs right through her and kills her. Now, this story does make news, and the A-Train states that he was trying to stop a bank robbery, and she happened to be in the middle of the street, which infuriates Huey, because... None of that is true. She literally had one foot off the curb. This leaves Huey extremely pissed off at this lie and pissed off at the company. But the company is trying to make amends. They're willing to give Huey $45,000, which they don't have to do because they weren't married. But the catch is he has to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And just like when he wants to ask his boss for a raise, he pictures this moment in his head where he goes off on the guy, but it doesn't happen. He simply says, let me think about it. He doesn't seem to want to take the money, but his dad is pressuring him to take the 45 grand because it would be huge for their family, but also the dad saying, you can't do anything. You can't sue them. You have no case. Take the money. We could use it. And shortly thereafter is when he's approached by Billy Butcher. Billy Butcher claims to be an FBI agent who approached Huey because of the fact he didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement. He states that he's the guy who gets these superheroes back in line when they step out of it. And this happens far more often than you think. Yeah, every once in a while a story pops up on the news, but so many people take the hush money that you never really hear about it and it gets swept under the rug. Superheroes aren't charged for murder if they're out doing their job and protecting the public. But both Billy and Huey both think that the A-Train should have to pay for what he did. After a little bit of convincing and negotiating, Huey agrees to come along and help Billy to try to get vengeance for his girlfriend Robin. And Billy takes him to a nightclub that Huey's never seen before. When they get to the door of the nightclub, the bouncer says, you know, this is police brutality, to which Huey tells Billy, I thought you were an FBI agent, and Billy says, well, FBI, cops, it's all the same. Upon entering this club, they realize it's a club unlike anything Huey has ever seen before, because all around them are these superheroes that everybody seems to know, but they're doing some scandalous shit. Billy tells them that this is where they can go without being seen by the paparazzi and kind of live out their fantasies. You've got an Ant-Man-like guy diving into a woman. You've got one superhero that's kind of like Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four. Apparently this guy is very anti-gay, but yet he's giving two guys hand jobs. So it's your first clue as to these superheroes aren't exactly the great guys you're used to seeing from Marvel and DC. Billy takes him up to the office and shows him video of the A-Train, who was there the previous night. And the A-Train is telling another superhero that when he ran through this bitch, his words, not mine, that he actually swallowed her molar. And then he starts laughing. And the fact that he's laughing pisses off Huey because they're laughing about Robin's death. With Huey enraged, Billy tries to set up a plan that Huey is to call back Vaught 
and tell him that he will take the hush money, but he wants A-Train to apologize to him face-to-face. Shortly thereafter, he'll plant a bug in their home office so that they can hear everything they're saying and try to take him down. Now, once again, initially, Huey doesn't want to make waves, doesn't like the story, but he eventually agrees to it. Now, we mentioned earlier that the lamp letter is retiring, which leaves an open to the Seven. And Vaught does a nationwide casting to find the seventh member of the Seven. And they find it in Annie January from Des Moines, Iowa. Her superhero name is Starlighter, and her superpower is she can kind of use light to knock people out, and even blind them at times. She's a very wholesome girl who wants to be a superhero to do good and save the world. And when she gets introduced, she gets introduced along with The Deep. Now, The Deep has been a member of The Seven for a while now. And as they're talking and having a conversation in their office, and it's just the two of them, Annie reveals to The Deep that she actually had a poster of him on her wall back in Des Moines, and she had a little bit of a crush on him. And as she turns around... The Deep has dropped his pants, dick in hand, and he says, well, if you had a crush on me, you might as well. Now, you can imagine Annie is disgusted and annoyed, but The Deep says, hold on a second, I'm number two here. And if you want to stay with the seven, look, you'll play with it for three minutes, if that, and we'll go on our merry way. Once again, this is further proof that these superheroes, a lot of them, are some seedy individuals. I guess it's typical to what America is, right? Like, celebrities are usually douchebags. Anyway, Annie reluctantly agrees to do it to help save her career, but she's completely disgusted with herself. And the sad part is, the Deep isn't the only scumbag. Translucent hides out in the bathroom to watch the women go in and out. And at one point, he gets caught by Captain Maeve, so a lot of these superheroes are just pieces of shit. You find out that the only clean-cut guy is Homelander, who doesn't drink and doesn't smoke. Now, this is tough for Starlighter, who's propped these superheroes up on a pedestal. She goes to the park and tries to call her mom, but her mom is so proud of the fact that she's made the seven that she uh, decides not to do it. Coincidentally, Huey is actually sitting right next to her and comforts her the whole time acting like he doesn't know who she is. Afterwards, Huey ends up seeing Billy and says, I'm in. Calls up the company, agrees to the meeting, and when he meets with A-Train, all he can picture is A-Train's face covered in Robin's blood. But he holds it together and says, hey man, it's okay. He heads to the bathroom to get the bug and ends up planting it right under their desk. Unfortunately for him, however, he had no idea that Translucent was in that bathroom and was watching him the entire time. He follows Huey and Billy back to Huey's store, and right before closing, he walks in completely invisible. He starts roughing up Huey at one point, and it even looks like he's going to throw a TV at him. But at the last second, Billy comes in with his car and runs him over. They get into a fight, but eventually two against one wins out when Huey grabs a wire from a TV that was ripped out and electrocutes Translucent. The same thing that makes his skin invisible is also extremely conductive. So they are convinced that they have killed one of the seven. Huey is freaking out, thinking he had just killed a guy, and Billy says, hey, help me get him in the trunk. And Huey goes, dude, I'm not going to do that. You're a federal officer. Just call the feds. And that's when we find out that Billy isn't really a federal officer. Now, finally, I had mentioned earlier how Vought will sell superheroes from city to city. And we see this happen when the CEO of Vought approaches the mayor of Baltimore trying to sell a superhero named Nubian Prince. Nubian Prince is posted up in Detroit, and she's willing to sell him to Baltimore, who has a major crime problem, for $300 million, but they'll get some points on merchandising and movie deals. The CEO says, I don't like $300 million. How about $200 million? But she's sticking true to the price of $300 million, claiming that Atlanta is waiting to strike a deal. But that's when the mayor of Baltimore says, well, I think you're going to do it for $200 million because I know about Compound V. And the CEO puts on a good poker face saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I will say there's a lot of rumors out there that are completely untrue. But eventually they do reach an agreement for Nubian Prince at well below $300 million. As the mayor of Baltimore is flying back on a plane with his son, his son looks out the window and sees Homelander and says, Hey, Dad, look, isn't that your buddy? Yeah, not so much, because Homelander uses the rays that come out of his eyes to literally shoot the plane down. In episode two, we find out exactly how the seven end up fighting crime. They have powers, but how do they actually go out and find the bad guys? The head of marketing comes to Starlighter and says, We're going to put you on our first mission. And she introduces Starlighter to these analysts that their whole job is to pinpoint where crime is going to be based on patterns. Now, Starlighter wants to go it alone because she's used to doing it alone, but she also wants to go it alone because they're teaming her up with The Deep, 
Unfortunately, she's now in the big leagues and she can't do it alone. So she's forced to work with a guy she doesn't want to work with and they head off to the docks where this crime is going to take place. Now, the Deep is just acting like everything's kosher, everything's fine, but Starlighter is definitely pissed off. Typical guy, he has no idea why she would be annoyed and finally she loses it on him. The Deep initially tries to act tough, but Starlighter cuts him off and says, you know, I asked around and you're not number two. You're just a pathetic fish boy. So if you even come near me, if you even touch me, I'm going to blind you with my power seems to put the fear of God into the deep. They end up going through the mission and taking down the bad guys, but as soon as they do, they are accosted with cameras right in their face from the marketing department. Now, the deep, he's used to this, but she's not, and she isn't really liking her celebrity status. On the way home, she's kind of thinking about life, contemplating things, realizing this isn't really what she made it out to be. And suddenly, she sees a girl about to get raped, so she takes actions in her own hands. She beats these guys up pretty good, but unfortunately somebody was filming her and put it on the internet and recognized her. Now her cover is completely blown, but also she's got the marketing department on her ass screaming at her for doing this. The head of marketing is yelling at her saying, I can't believe you were so stupid not to look around and find cameras, see if anyone's filming you. And she says, well, there was a girl about to get raped. Unfortunately for her though, in the video, you don't see any girl because the girl ran off. So it looks like Starlighter is just beating up these two frat boys for no real reason. This is another example of everything is an opportunity and everything is being marketed toward the public. And even if you're trying to do the right thing, it doesn't really matter in the end. Now we'll move on to the way that episode one ended. You find out that the CEO, Madeline Stilwell, did not order Homelander to shoot down that plane. Homelander simply has supersonic hearing and heard the blackmail go on and took it upon himself to shoot this plane down. The plane was actually found by the Deep, who tells Madeline Stillwell that there were laser beam shots in the plane. There's only one person that could do that. That's Homelander. So she comes to him and kind of confronts him about this, to which he responds by going to the Deep and letting him know really who's boss on this team. Now, as far as the public concerned, it was engine failure, but we all know that it was actually murder by Homelander, who's supposed to be the cleanest one of the group. You definitely get this sense in episode two that Homelander has a crush on Madeline Stilwell and feels it necessary to kind of protect her at all costs. But Madeline Stilwell isn't concerned with Homelander or the dead Baltimore mayor for that matter because she's concerned with getting her superheroes into the army as like a privatized military. Basically, the U.S. government would pay her to dish out her superheroes to war. But when she starts talking to this one congressman from Oklahoma, she realizes that there are going to be struggles with this. Because he says, this is never going to pass. On top of it, he has little interest in it, and he's not the only one. But that doesn't deter Madeline Stilwell, who sets up a blackmail situation where that congressman is having sex with a girl, but the girl is a shapeshifter. And she blindfolds the congressman and starts having sex with him, but then shifts into the body of a guy and starts snapping incriminating photos. And shockingly, that works. It's not really shocking at all, but the congressman is going to put the bill to the floor to try to get a privatized military with the superheroes. But most of this episode revolves around Translucent, Billy, and Huey. They put Translucent in the trunk with the idea of dumping the body because they think he's dead, but he's not dead. He's actually alive. He's very tough to kill. But now they have a problem because he's seen their faces, so now they mean to make sure that he's dead. Luckily for them, Billy knows a guy. It's this French dude. And this French guy has killed a lot of people. He's done a lot of jobs. Kind of a jack of all trades, if you will. So with the help of the French guy, they take him to an abandoned building and start trying to kill him in this cage, but nothing's working. Bullets aren't working. Electrocution isn't working. They're kind of at a loss at this point. So Billy ends up heading off and talking to a former colleague of his who works for the FBI. So Billy's not a fed, but he might have used to be a fed. And the whole purpose of this is to try to get a file on Translucent to try to figure out what his weak point is. But Billy doesn't end up getting the file. And to make it worse, Translucent is chipped. So Huey has to put up some foil to block the signal on top of the fact that they still have to figure out how exactly they're going to kill this guy. But Huey doesn't have any real interest in killing him. He realized that he needs to, and it's probably going to happen, but all he wants to do is get justice for his girlfriend. So he asks him, hey, where was the A-Train going that night? And Translucent gets all uppity and gets an attitude and says, look, man, you're a bitch. I'm a superhero. Homelander's going to find me. He's going to kill all you guys, and I'm going to be fine. And even though I'm in this cage, you're actually the one who's trapped. So Huey kind of walks off a little bit defeated and is now sitting with the French guy trying to figure out exactly how they're still going to kill this guy. And the French guy is a great idea. Uh, We'll just take LSD and get ideas. He offers it to Huey, but Huey doesn't want any LSD. Say no to drugs, kids. So more LSD for the French guy. And 
it actually works because he sees a turtle on a TV screen and has an idea. Turtles are obviously protected by their shell, so we need to get underneath the shell. So they electrocute Translucent, knock him out again, and stick a bomb up his ass. At this point, Translucent is freaked out and scared and starts freaking out and starts giving up information to Huey, saying, look, I don't know what he was doing, but he was coming from this person named Popclaw. And Popclaw isn't exactly somebody you want to be seen with. But Translucent says, look, if anybody knows where he was going, it's going to be Popclaw. Now, while it's great that he's finally giving up information, the problem is Homelander is flying around their base because the chip is going off in the area. And while they can't pinpoint exactly where he's located, they know that he's in that area. So Billy and Frenchie have an idea to blow up their other warehouse to kind of distract him. And while they're waiting for that to happen, they're kind of getting interrogated a little bit by Homelander. He sees these two guys just sitting in a van outside, and he gets suspicious. But luckily for them, right before he really starts looking around, their other warehouse does blow up and he flies off. While this is going on, Translucent has been able to get out of the cage by frying the electrical system. While he's walking towards Huey, he's kind of going, look, man, all's forgiven, just let me go. And it seems like Huey is going to do that, but at the last second, he presses the button, blows up Translucent, and Huey is just covered in his blood and guts. Episode 3 starts out directly after Episode 2. The group is looking at the aftermath of Translucent's body literally exploding, and Frenchie and Billy agree that they'll clean it up. Huey just wants to go home and kind of decompress, and after some convincing, he's allowed to do so. When he goes home, he sees all of this merchandise from the Seven all over his room, and he just destroys it. His dad tells him that he really should talk to somebody. He's concerned about his son, but his son doesn't want to talk to somebody. His son just wants revenge. We'll get back to Huey in a bit, because Starlighter is being called into Madeline Stilwell's office, and she's assuming that she's going to be yelled at for taking out those two wannabe rapists. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. The girl that she saved has come forward, and because of that, Starlighter's ratings are going through the roof. They feel like this is a good time to up her brand, and the way they're going to do that is with a new suit. But the new suit is a lot more scandalous than her old version, and she doesn't really like it. Starlighter says, look, it's my body, and if I don't want to wear this, I don't have to, to which Madeline Stilwell replies, well, you don't have to, you just won't be a part of the Seven. So unfortunately for Starlighter, she's going to be showing a lot more skin than she wants to. Now let's shift gears to back to Billy, who is going to need more help getting rid of Translucent's body. He goes to a guy named Mother's Milk, who he knows, who's actually helping at-risk youth, and Mother's Milk wants nothing to do with the project until he says, we killed a suit. As soon as he says that, Mother's Milk is in, but he wants to make sure that Frenchie is not, to which Billy lies to him and says, no, 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 it's just us. Unfortunately for Mother's Milk, when he shows up at the stakeout van, he realizes, oh, no, there's Frenchie. And after a little bit of a tiff, they agree to kind of squash their beef for the time being. Now, the mission is going to be to stake out Popclaw's residence. Popclaw, if you remember, is the girl that the A-Train had been seeing. Now, they need to figure out how they're going to get into Popclaw's apartment. And Huey, because he worked in an electronics store, says, we don't really need to set up cameras. We just need to get an RIP because I can tap into every camera in the house. So that's exactly what Huey and Mother's Milk do. They pose as guys trying to give her better internet access through the building, but in reality, they just tap her cameras throughout the house. As they're leaving, they actually run into A-Train, who has no idea who Huey is. And even after Huey says, haven't we met before, A-Train has no clue. This infuriates Huey, but they end up leaving at the behest of Mother's Milk. With access to the apartment, they're able to watch Popclaw's every move, and she's about to fool around with the A-Train, but the A-Train is distracted because he has this huge race coming up, and he's worried that he's going to lose. Madeline Stilwell has told him that if he finishes second, he's out of the seven because nobody wants the guy finishing second place. So he asked Popclaw for some compound V, to which she says, you really shouldn't take this. When you do, it's a slippery slope. The last time you took it, you literally ran through a girl, and obviously that would be Huey's girlfriend, Robin. But he doesn't care. He just wants the stuff. Right before he's about to leave, he tells her that he'll meet up with her after the race, and she is distraught because they were supposed to go public with their relationship at the race. But it sounds more like a pop claw problem because the A-Train just wants the Compound V. And now Huey, Frenchie, and Billy have a lead. They need to find out what Compound V is. Now, while all this is going on, Translucent, to everybody else's knowledge, is just missing. And the only person that seems to be concerned about it is Homelander. Homelander ends up meeting up with Queen Maeve at a mission. There's an active shooter in a building, and they're casually walking through the scene, getting shot at, but they're not worried about it. They're having casual conversation about exactly what the deal is with Translucent. They reach the top floor, and they find the active shooter, and he's basically giving himself up, but it doesn't matter. Homelander kills him. But they need to make it look like he shot at them first, and it gives you another indication that these superheroes aren't the great guys they're made out to be. Afterwards, Queen Maeve, Homelander, Billy, Huey, Frenchie, Mother's Milk, they all head to the race with different agendas. All the people in the Seven are just doing propaganda, but Huey, Frenchie, and Billy need to find the Compound V. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that at one point before they head off, Huey admits to Mother's Milk that he actually liked killing Translucent. Mother's Milk says, man, don't, don't do that. That's... 
That's no different than what the A-Train's using. That's like a drug. But it seems like Huey has a taste for it. But with that out of the way, they need a plan. So Huey is going to pose as a photographer down in the VIP area. Mother's Milk and Billy will be in the crowd, and Frenchie is going to try to find out where the Compound V is. So while they try to find out what Compound V is, Black Noir and Starlight are actually doing an autograph signing. A little girl comes up to Starlight with her old costume and says, I'm saving up for the new one. And while they pose to take a selfie, somebody says, hey, Starlight, show us your tits. And that's when she looks at the little girl and says, don't buy the new one. I like the old one better. Afterwards, she needs a minute because she wants to kill these guys. So she heads back to the locker room, and it couldn't be worse timing because this is the time where Frenchie is actually going to go look for the Compound V. Huey recognizes Starlighter and says, Annie? And basically saves the day because he keeps Starlighter from going in that room finding Frenchie by asking her if she wants to go get a beer. Huey apparently had no idea who she was when they met on the park bench, and these two are smitten. And good on Huey because he copped her phone number, and she is way too good looking for him. But while those two were going on their kind of first date, Frenchie struck out with finding the Compound V. He looked all over the place, and there's nothing. And the reason there's nothing is because the A-Train took it all, and he dominated his opponent, Shockwave, in this race. He is still the fastest man on the earth. But right before the race took place, you learn some things. One of them is that Homelander and Queen Maeve actually dated at one point. Also, right before the race is to take place, everybody is looking down at the field, Except Billy, who is staring at Homelander, and it's a very awkward scene. And then there's Mother's Milk, who has kept tabs on Popclaw at her apartment with the surveillance equipment. And he sees that she's about to take Compound V, so they all head back there to kind of still keep an eye on her. And she ends up taking it, and it's basically steroids for superheroes, because she is benching a ton of weight. And you find out why she's called Popclaw, by the way. She has these Wolverine-type claws that pop out of her forearms. While she's all hopped up, the landlord comes looking for his rent money, and she ends up bringing him in and seducing him. And while they're having sex, she ends up accidentally killing him. She doesn't realize it at first, but when she does, she's distraught, and that's when Billy makes his move. He tells her, look, we're going to solve this issue with you killing this guy. All you have to do is tell us what exactly Compound V is. Now, the one guy in the seven we have not talked about is the Deep who has discovered, thanks to a porpoise, Translucent's body. They dumped it in the ocean, and it seems like they wanted the Seven to find it. They put it in a box that they knew Homelander couldn't see through, but they also knew that they would find it because they put a sign on the box that says, we're coming for you. And when Homelander reads this, he says, we're basically at war. In episode four, we learn through a flashback that Butcher actually had a wife. Now, we don't know what happened to her because when he wakes up from the flashback, He heads to this table, he's eating breakfast, and he watches a video of his wife looking very nervous on a park bench, and she just walks away. So that's how this guy starts his day, and it seems like he starts his day every day like this. Afterwards, he heads to the CIA office of the woman whose house he broke into, the deputy director, and he tells her about Compound V, but unfortunately for him, he doesn't have proof of it. And until he has actual hard evidence of the Compound V, there's nothing she can really do. And Butcher and the team have been trying to get proof, but they've kind of struck out. Butcher calls Popclaw screaming because they still haven't found the Compound V. The group is staked out in Chinatown. And I only haven't seen Compound V, but haven't seen the A-Train either. And she says, look, all I know is when he shows up in my apartment, he's got the sesame noodles from this one restaurant. But Butcher's getting impatient. He says, look, if we don't find Compound V soon, that video of you and your landlord, it's going to end up on Pornhub. Luckily for Popclaw... Frenchie, Huey, and Mother's Milk end up seeing a guy holding a bag and also packing heat. So they end up following him all through Chinatown. Through back alleys, back restaurants, they end up in a basement of a store, and it's pretty clear, yeah, there's something being smuggled. Now, while Mother's Milk is frantically looking for Compound V, Frenchie's attention is turned to a TV that's on in a cell. It's playing this music, and then he notices there's actually a woman underneath a table watching the TV, and it seems like she's a prisoner. Now, Frenchie, being the good guy, wants to let her go, but Mother's Milk says, no, man, stay true to the plan. She's not a part of it. Let's get the Compound V. Let's get out of here. But Frenchie doesn't listen, and he ends up letting her out. Now, as soon as he lets her out, these soldiers come screaming in their native tongue, don't let her out, and there's a reason for that, because this girl is an absolute killing machine. She slaughters pretty much everybody there, and right before she's going to go after Huey, Mother's Milk, and Frenchie, they decide, "Eh, it's probably best if we hop in this cell and close the door behind us. The group ends up having to call Billy to get them out of that cell. And now they're questioning who exactly this girl is. But Frenchie found a clue. It's a little bit of a burnt train ticket that they could possibly use. They've also located Compound V. In episode 4, I also learned that I've been saying Starlighter and not Starlight, which is her name. My bad. We all make mistakes. I might make it again. Who knows? But Huey gets a text from Starlight. The two were supposed to have a date, but Huey doesn't think it's a really good idea right now because he just watched a bunch of people get slaughtered and almost lost his life himself. 
But when Billy sees Huey's face react to the text message, he wants to know what it's about. And when he finds out it's a date with Starlight, he says, you're going because we need you to bug her phone. Now, Huey insists that she's not like the others, but Billy doesn't want to hear it and says, she's a soup. They're all the same. So Huey doesn't want to, but he's going to go on a date with a ridiculously hot girl. You really feel for the guy. So Huey's going to go on the date. Frenchie is going to try to find the girl that escaped. And Mother's Milk is going to try to find out exactly where Compound V came from. So while they try to figure out where Compound V is coming from, Madeline Stilwell is trying to figure out how to convince the world that America needs superheroes in the military. And she has a prime opportunity. Because a plane has just been hijacked heading to Paris. And while they're not allowed to do anything in Paris... Because the plane is over the Atlantic Ocean, it's anybody's game. So Homelander and Queen Maeve end up heading to the plane and forcing their way in and taking out all the hijackers. And everyone's clapping and happy because they think they've been saved. The problem is there's one hijacker left and he's in the cockpit. And when Queen Maeve and Homelander force their way in, he ends up shooting the pilot. And just as a reaction, Homelander ends up taking him out with laser beams. But when he takes him out, he also damages the plane. And this thing is going down fast. Homelander and Queen Maeve quickly realize there's no way they can really save this plane. So Homelander is telling everybody, it's fine, don't worry, but he's heading out. Now a few people are getting suspicious about this and saying he's leaving, he's leaving, no. And even Queen Maeve says, we don't need to let everybody die, why don't we just fly them down? But Homelander doesn't like that idea at all and says that would take too long. Queen Maeve grabs a mother and her child and says, here, just take them. But Homelander flashes his eyes at them and says, get back, everybody get back, we're leaving. He doesn't want to take the mother and the daughter so that they can survive and tell everybody how they let everybody else die. So Queen Maeve and Homelander escape the plane and watch it go down. Homelander and Queen Maeve head to the shore to watch the remnants of the plane crash come ashore. And at this point, camera crews have shown up. And even though Homelander didn't save the plane, he's not going to let this opportunity slip by. So he grabs one of the camera crews and says, this all could have been saved if they just would have let us know what's going on. The military won't alert us to these situations, and if we had been alerted, we could have saved this plane. And if they would let us in the military, this never would happen again. Now, Queen Maeve is furious because she could have saved people and she didn't. But Homelander is using this opportunity as a PR stunt. And it's genius because nobody actually knows that Homelander and Queen Maeve were ever in the plane in the first place. Now, speaking of the ocean, since that's where the plane crashed, I guess I'll give you the update on the deep. He's talking to a therapist and he's complaining that nobody takes him seriously and everybody just thinks he's a fish boy. He wants to take matters into his own hands and he goes to Madeline Stilwell about one of his sponsors abusing animals. But she has no interest in going after sponsors, so the deep takes it into his own hands. He breaks a dolphin out of the place and is fleeing the cops. But eventually they catch up to him and he has to slam on the brakes and when he does so, the dolphin flies out of the car through the windshield onto the street where he's run over by a car. Not exactly a great sign for the deep. Now we'll move on to the A-Train, who has stopped by the place in Chinatown and seen that it is swarming with cops. Now he needs to find the girl that was trapped in there, but he also needs to find out exactly how the cops found out about this location. So he heads to Popclaw's place. He's asking her, who did you tell? But she's doing true to her word that she didn't tell anybody. Obviously, we know this not to be true, but she's putting on a good poker face. Eventually, it seems like the A-Train just kind of gives up and says, look, pack your stuff. We need to get you out of here for the next couple days because somebody knows about this place and somebody knows about Compound V and it's not safe for you here. So while A-Train is tending to Popclaw, Billy, Huey, Mother's Milk, and Frenchie are looking for the girl. But the big question on everybody's mind is what happened to the girl? Well, her first stop on Vengeance was to a nail salon where she goes to the back where the manager is and murders her in brutal fashion. You're led to believe that this is the person who smuggled her into the country. When Huey, Billy, Mother's Milk, and Frenchie go to the nail salon, they notice that the A-Train's there. And the A-Train's not just going to go there for a low-level murder. It gives credence to the fact that they're on to something. They also know, though, that the A-Train is extremely fast and probably will catch her before they do. But luckily for them, they have the clue of the train ticket. So they all head to the train station, and it's a great lead. The group splits up looking for him, and Frenchie is armed with this gas that's going to knock her out if she attacks him. But he doesn't want to use the gas. He just wants to try to talk her down. He ends up finding her in the back of an electronics store where she's watching one of those shows from her home country. So while Frenchie tries to talk her down, it seems to be working, but all of a sudden there's a noise and it spooks her, and she freaks out. So she runs out, and the group is back to square one, and this does not sit well with Mother's Milk, who ends up losing his shit on Frenchie. He says, nothing's changed with you, and when you don't follow orders, you literally cost people their lives. He says, the last time this happened, it cost our former boss and her grandchildren their lives when Lamplighter literally obliterated them. You were supposed to knock her out with the gas, but instead you tried to do things your way and talk her down. Apparently Lamplighter was let go just like this girl, 
And when he was let go, he ended up torching their boss's grandkids. This tip does end up ending with an amazing analogy from Billy about the Spice Girls. Basically, when they're all one, they're incredible, but when they're split up, they're complete garbage, so we should stick together. And Frenchie adds on to it saying, well, maybe this girl is one of the Spice Girls. We gotta go find her. The group ends up finding her on a train platform, and when she spots them, she runs off, but the A-Train catches her, and he's so fast that nobody even notices. So he starts beating her up a little bit, and Frenchie's pretty quick-witted and yells, hey, everybody, look, it's the A-Train. Now, the A-Train doesn't want to get caught smashing a girl's head into the wall, so he ends up leaving her alone and takes selfies with his fans. This allows the girl to escape, and it also allows Frenchie to have a take-two of talking her down. And it seems like it's going good until she attacks him, and that's when Billy chucks the gas and knocks her out. And then finally, there's a date between Huey and Starlight. They end up going bowling, and Starlight tells him that she's a pretty good bowler, but she sucks. Huey calls her on this and says, look, you're holding back. Show me what you got. No, she's, she's extremely good. It's embarrassing how good she is. She reveals that normally she doesn't like showing up guys that she likes, in this case Huey, because it backfired one time in high school when she beat up a bunch of guys that were razzing the dude that she liked, and the guy never talked to her again. They have more conversations about where she grew up in high school and life. Now, Huey does like this girl, which makes it all the more painful because he ends up wiretapping her phone when she goes to the bathroom. He's torn about it, but he ends up doing it. Also on the date, both of them see an ad for this Christian festival that Starlight will be appearing at along with Homelander. The festival is led by Ezekiel, and that's the guy who in episode one was in that skeezy nightclub jerking off dudes, even though he's very anti-gay when he's out in the public. Starlight tells him that she's going to donate all the money that she's making from that event to charity, which is once again proof that she is different. And this event's important because Mother's Milk has a buddy run the tests on Compound V and where it was coming from, and he finds out it was coming from Ezekiel and his organization. This episode starts out in Cuba, where Popclaw is hiding out, doing drugs. But the good news is the A-Train has shown up, and he tells her that Madeline Stilwell is willing to let their relationship go public. But before they do... He needs to know exactly who she told about Compound V, and she ends up caving. She tells him about Billy and the other four guys, but she doesn't really know anything about Billy or his name or anything. She just describes him. After she spills the beans, the A-Train whips her around the room and injects her with two doses of heroin. And this makes it look like she overdosed, even though it was actually a murder. Now, the A-Train didn't want to do this, but he's told to at the behest of Homelander. And when he gets back to the offices, he tells Homelander that the job is done, but now Homelander is worried that he is addicted to Compound V. The A-Train tells him not to worry, I quit cold turkey, but it's hard to figure out if that's true or if he's just broken up about what happened with Popclaw. He heads over to Popclaw's apartment and starts watching old sex tapes of him and her, and at the very end of one, he sees what happened with Popclaw and her landlord. But he ends up hearing Billy's voice, and he ends up seeing Frenchie's face. So he takes Frenchie's face to the IT guys at Vought and has them ID him. Frenchie is ID'd, but he's also ID'd with his 38 known addresses. So now at least the A-Train has a lead on who knows about the Compound V, and that's Frenchie. He starts looking for Frenchie, but Frenchie is taking care of the Asian girl that they have chained up. Frenchie is trying to play good cop. He's made her a really nice dinner. He's trying to talk to her, but it doesn't really work because she ends up trying to attack him anyway. Luckily, she's chained up and can't kill him. So unbeknownst to Frenchie, people are looking for him while his main concern is just trying to butter up this girl. Now, while that's going on, Billy, Mother's Milk, and Huey have gone to the Believe Expo where Homelander and Starlight are going to appear. Now, Starlight grew up going to these with her mother, and she thought it would kind of be a healing thing for her, get back to her roots a little bit because she knows everybody involved with this festival. And she's doing so with Huey right at her side. She's explaining to Huey how she grew up with these people, how her mother was taking her to all these different events, and how she feels really comfortable with these people and around these people. But she's still there to do publicity for the seven, so she gets taken away, and that frees up Huey to go talk to Billy and Mother's Milk. And while Huey was hanging out with Starlight, Mother's Milk and Billy were scoping the place out and realized it is heavily guarded. And they need to get to the main guy at this festival, the guy named Ezekiel, who was in that skeevy nightclub jerking dudes off. But it's going to be hard to get to him with such a security force. Luckily, though, they have Huey, and Huey knows Starlight, and Starlight can get him in. But Huey is very reluctant to ask Starlight to do this, because normally, to get in this VIP experience, it's $15,000, and he doesn't want to make it look like he's using her. They've only been on about a date and a half, and he thinks it's going to look suspicious if he goes up to her and says, hey, can you get me into this $15,000 event with your friends? But there's really no other choice. Huey asks them, what do you want me to say? Why exactly are you smuggling drugs? 
And Billy says, yeah, pretty much, because you're going to use this video of him jerking guys off as a ransom to get the information that you need. So Huey heads over to Starlight and asks her if she can get him in, and it goes about as well as you thought. She is definitely suspicious and definitely feels like she's being used, but she ends up doing it. We'll go back to Starlight and Howie in a little bit, because the other member of the Seven that is supposed to show up at this event is Homelander. But Homelander's busy doing a vigil for all the people who were lost in that plane crash where he obviously could have saved everybody. And he's doing it with Queen Maeve, who is still distraught about the fact that she could have done more. Queen Maeve is so mad that she actually leaves the vigil early and goes and gets drunk. Afterwards, she heads to an ex-girlfriend's house, but the ex-girlfriend doesn't want anything to do with her and says, why don't you go back to Homelander? So Queen Maeve, she's playing on both teams. Respect, girl. But at one point, Queen Maeve actually breaks down because of the fact that she could have saved people. And when her ex-girlfriend goes to console her, Queen Maeve tries to start something, but it's quickly ended by the ex. Now, the other half of that is Homelander, who after the vigil goes to the event and wants to talk about his talking points with Madeline Stilwell, but she's not there, the head of communications is. But he has no interest in talking about it with her. He wants to talk about it with Madeline Stilwell. So he flies off and finds her as she's walking her son into a doctor's appointment. He demands that they talk about the talking points, but Madeline Stilwell says, no, I've rescheduled this doctor's appointment three times already. I'm going in and doing this doctor's appointment. He doesn't like the fact that Madeline Stilwell wants him to be very conservative and toe the line because he says this crowd is edgy. They hate immigrants. They love America. They're very religious. We should be attacking their strengths. But Madeline doesn't want him to make that kind of speech. He wants him to toe the line. But he's pissed off that she's not going to be there and she can't do anything about it. So he's going to do the speech that he wants to do. So while Homelander riles up the conservatives of America, Starlight is having a problem because she's doing this youth group discussion and she's having an issue. The youth are asking her about premarital sex and she wants to give the actual answer, but she's getting pressured to give the correct answer, if you know what I mean. She's realizing that maybe this scene just isn't for me, but she's getting pressured by her mother to continue with this charade because her mother says she quote unquote worked so hard at this. She's got friends at home watching, even though Starlight wants nothing to do with this scene anymore. So she's pretty conflicted about the message she's sending, and on top of it, her kind of boyfriend might be using her to get to the head of the event. It's a tricky situation for Starlight. Now, while this event is going on, Billy gets a call from his ex-wife's sister, and he immediately leaves. You learn that his ex-wife vanished, and the family wants to put a gravestone up because they just want to go somewhere and mourn the loss of their family member. But Billy's thing is, she's still out there. We can't put a headstone up if she's out there, which she is. But Billy's having none of it, so he ends up going to the cemetery and destroying the headstone and then heading back to the Holy Roller event. So while Billy was off smashing headstones, Huey actually got into that meeting and he ends up meeting Homelander, who is very suspicious of Huey. He's aware of who Huey is and he ends up baptizing him, but he does it a little bit longer than everybody else in kind of a violent way, if you will. You can just tell he doesn't really trust Huey and Starlight's relationship. Now, after everybody gets baptized, now is Huey's chance to go after Ezekiel, the head of this whole thing. He's trying to get his attention, but Ezekiel is very busy and wants to walk away, and he's trying to show him the video. The problem is, when he got baptized by Homelander, his phone was destroyed, so he can't show him the video. But Huey's no fool, so he acts quickly and says, you slept with me, and in a way claims that he was one of those guys in the video. Now, initially, Ezekiel gets really pissed off and ends up choking him. But when Huey tells him he has a video, he backs off a little bit and asks, what do you want, money? But Huey doesn't want money. He wants to know about Compound V and where it comes from. Ezekiel says, I can't tell you about Compound V. They're going to destroy me. And even though he doesn't say who they are, we know it's Vaught. But Huey grows the set and says, look, you're going to tell me about Compound V or this video is going to go out and it's going to be trending on Twitter. And also, stop with the pray the gay away crap because you're, you're clearly gay and it's not a good message to send. And Ezekiel ends up caving. He tells them that they ship Compound V to hospitals all around the country, and the next shipment is going to be at a NICU unit. So when Billy and Mother's Milk cure this, they head right off to that NICU, and what they learn is that Vault is basically making superheroes. They have all these babies in the NICU that are getting ingested with Compound V and are becoming superheroes. They're not just touched by God. So after a little bit of a squirmish with security, Billy is able to get some of the Compound V and use it as proof. But back at the fair, enough is enough, and Starlight has reached a breaking point. She's supposed to give this speech, but she just stops midway through and says, I don't know if any of this is right. She almost puts the deep on blast because she says, what's immoral is the guy who shoved his dick in my face. 
everybody in the audience is taken aback by this. And after the speech, nobody claps except Huey. And Huey tracks her down and finds her afterwards and tells her that the speech was amazing, but she's pissed off at Huey for using her to get to meet Ezekiel. And that's when Huey uses his final trump card. He tells her that her, his girlfriend died and he needs to get some answers, but the only answers he got was on that stage when she was talking. So luckily, the happy couple has made up a little bit. But unfortunately for that group, Frenchie has been made, and he gets a phone call from his girlfriend that Black Noir and the A-Train were snooping around one of his houses. At least I think it's his girlfriend. It might just be like a girl that he talks to. You know, sometimes you're not exclusive. Anyway, he ends up calling Billy and tells him that I've been made, and Billy tells him to just leave, get out, leave the girl, but he can't do that. As soon as he lets the girl go, she runs out, and Frenchie starts creeping around back alleys to try to escape, but... He ends up running into Black Noir. Black Noir goes after Frenchie and is attacking him. And just as it looks like he's about to kill him, the Asian girl comes out of nowhere and starts going at it with Black Noir. And she puts up a pretty good fight. She, she's got him on the ropes a little bit, but Black Noir ends up getting the better of it and ends up killing her. Frenchie ends up coming back for her and putting his coat on her dead body, but that's when she pops back up. Because unbeknownst to everybody, one of her superpowers is regeneration. In episode 6, we get a lot of backstory on the superheroes thanks to a new reality show that's really nothing more than propaganda to get the bill passed. But it goes into the backstory of all the superheroes and what hardships they had and where they grew up. And everybody's recorded something for it except Starlight. And she's been laying low ever since the whole fiasco at the Believe Expo. And because of that fiasco, the PR girl has been fired because it was her plan originally to put Starlight in that event. Starlight learns about this firing as she's walking into Madeline Stillwell's office and sees the PR girl walking out. And the PR girl is pissed and blames Starlight for her getting fired. When she meets with Madeline Stillwell, Madeline tries to kind of bully her and calls her a perpetual child and she needs to wake up. But Starlight has the upper hand and says, no, nah, that's not going to happen. I'm not doing any red carpets. I'm not doing reality TV. I'm not doing commercials. And she demands her old uniform back. And Madeline Stillwell is kind of taken back and says, I don't think you should be a part of the seven. And that's when Starlight says, I don't think that would be such a good idea. I mean, what would happen to your stock price if you fired an employee who just admitted on national television that there was sexual harassment in the workplace? Now, Madeline Stillwell tries to act like she doesn't know what she's talking about or who it was. But Starlight tells her, yeah, I, you know, I think I think, you know. Madeline Stillwell tries one last desperation heave by telling her that when she was in Iowa, everything that she read and everything that she saw, Madeline Stillwell created and the propaganda machine created. And if you want to be a superhero, you got to get with the program. But with the newfound confidence that Starlight has, it's going to be kind of tough to bully her. As Starlight's leaving, she runs into Queen Maeve and Queen Maeve kind of gives her an attitude and says, wow, you're really milking this for all it's worth. And Starlight tells her, yeah, when I was a kid, I read your autobiography a bunch of times. And I really believed everything in there, but now I just realized it was none of it was true and it was all made up by the PR firm and walks out. Now, because of all the sexual harassment claims, Madeline Stillwell has to figure out what she's going to do with the deep. So she calls him into her office and says, all right, here's the plan. You're going to make a heartfelt apology and then you're going to take a hiatus from the seven. Now, initially he thinks it has to do with the dolphin, but she says, no, you idiot. It's going to do with starlight. He begs her to handle this, and she says, this is how we're handling it. You're going to make this heartfelt apology, you're going to take a hiatus, and then we're sending you off to Sandusky, Ohio. But while one member of the seven is getting ushered out, the rest of them are filming that reality show, and Homelander is at his childhood home, and it seems like he just grew up like a normal child, right? Great home, played baseball, and he's filming it, but then he freaks out when he sees a blue blanket. He ends up getting the guy who put it there fired and just loses his shit. Madeline Stillwell finds him and starts to apologize and he freaks out on her and says, how would you feel if you were brought to a home to look at pictures of people you don't know and told those are your parents and you have to react to it? Probably not great. And Madeline Stillwell starts comforting him and saying, I know it's not easy, but I need you to do the mother story. And then she starts seducing him because these two have a very weird relationship. And it works because Homelander gets out there in front of the cameras and tells everybody that his mother used to make him a baseball cake, puts on a good show, and as soon as the camera's cut, he storms off. You end up learning that the reason he freaked out upon seeing that blanket is because Homelander actually grew up in a lab. A lot like Eleven from Stranger Things, he had doctors around him waving at him, and he remembers that blue blanket from that time in his life. The other members of the Seven's backstories aren't as impressive. A-Train learned he had powers when he outran a bullet in a neighborhood shooting. And when Queen Maeve is filming hers, her ex-girlfriend shows up, and they get into a little bit of a tiff. When Queen Maeve says, did it ever occur to you that I was just looking for a hookup that night? And the ex-girlfriend says, no, you were scared then, and you're still scared now. Now and you're the same scared girl. But most of this episode has to do with Huey, Billy, Mother's Milk, Frenchie, and the Asian girl. Mother's Milk has learned that Vaught is sending Compound V to hospitals all around the country since the 60s, disguising them as polio vaccines, and they've basically been creating superheroes. 
And they now have all the information to blow the lid off this thing. So Huey and Billy head off. And now the issue is what to do with the Asian girl because she's still not talking. Mother's Milk has the idea to enlist a superhero named Mesmer to help them out. Now, Mesmer's superpower is if he touches you, he can read your mind. So he seems perfect. And on top of it, he absolutely hates Vought because he used to be in Vought and he got fired for insider trading. Mesmer was also on the TV show where A-Train met Popclaw, so he kind of knows all those people. Mother's Milk heads to basically like a poor man's Comic-Con, which features D-list actors and they like Tara Reid and Billy Zane and also the guy who the A-Train beat in the race. And he sees Mesmer doing an autograph line. When Mother's Milk meets Mesmer, he has Mesmer read his mind, and Mesmer's kind of blown away with the story that he's seeing. Mother's Milk tells him that if he helps them, Mother's Milk will help him have a meeting with his daughter. Mesmer hasn't seen his daughter in years, and the fact that Mother's Milk works with at-risk youth will help him facilitate that encounter. So Mesmer agrees, and for one hour a month, he'll be able to meet with his daughter Under supervision, all he has to do is help them out. So they go to meet with his daughter, and it's a very uncomfortable meeting. At the end of it, he gives his daughter a very awkward, uncomfortable hug, and then they go off to read Frenchie's Girl. Now, while that's going on, Huey and Billy have made their way to a meeting for a group called the Association for Collateral Damage Survivors. And basically, this group is a bunch of people who might have been injured or loved ones were injured by superheroes in the line of duty. One woman was saved, but her spine's all messed up. Another guy was having sex with a superhero, and his dick was broken off. And the whole point of Billy bringing Huey here is to show him that there are consequences for being friends with a soup and dating a soup. Billy says, what do you think is going to happen when a soup finds out she's getting played? Now, because they're talking in the meeting, the moderator asks Billy if he has anything to say, and he says no, but then takes it one step further and freaks out on these people. He says, you shouldn't be in a meeting having this pity party. You guys should be out there going after these people. The next stop on the tour leads Billy and Huey to the park bench of the woman that we saw in the surveillance video. And Billy does admit that, yes, this was my wife. But Billy says that she was actually raped by Homelander and sat on that bench for three straight hours until she finally got up and was never seen again. And either Homelander killed her or she killed herself, but it doesn't really matter because it's the same difference. And that is why Billy is going after Soups. And he tells Huey that no matter how attached you get to this girl, you can't get distracted from the mission at hand. You're doing this to avenge the death of Robin. So you can imagine how pissed off Billy is when he finds out that the rest of his team has teamed up with a superhero to help read this girl. He heads over to Mesmer's house where they're going to do the mind reading. And initially, Mesmer is able to read the girl's mind, but she panics and snaps his wrist in half. After some convincing, he uses his other wrist, and they realize that she is a part of a terrorist group overseas. She was taken as a child, though, and she was a child soldier, so it's not like this was her choice. And she wants to go back there and get her brother. But because she was working with a terrorist group, they now think that Vaught is also creating supervillains, who they bring over to the States, shoot up with Compound V, send them back, and have Homelander fly in and save the day. And now this is the final cherry on top for all the information they need. So Billy heads to the deputy director's office to try to blow the lid off of it. But it's not enough for Billy just to have Vought brought down. He wants some demands. He wants office space in the Flatiron building. He wants money for his group. He wants security clearance. And all of that's fine. But the one thing she can't give him that Billy demands is that Homelander be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And the fact that she can't give him leads Billy to actually walk out of the office. He heads back to the safe house and tells the group that she got cold feet and no deal. But you can tell Mother's Milk doesn't really buy that for a second. Billy says, don't worry about it. We'll take Vault down ourselves. And then Billy notices that Huey isn't there. And Huey isn't there because he's actually on a date with Starlight. And as they're sharing drinks in a local bar, talking about just running away with each other, Billy walks in and acts like he just happened to run into Huey. Eventually, Starlight gets up to go get more beer, and Billy just starts reaming in on Huey for once again being with a suit, even though he says, look, man, it's not what it looks like. Huey is pleading with Billy, telling him she's different, she can help us. And Billy says... What do you think she's going to do when she finds out that you killed Translucent? But they have a bigger issue at hand, because even though Mesmer absolutely hated Vaught for kicking him out, he desperately wants to get back in. And after he makes a phone call to the woman from Child Services telling her, basically, thanks but no thanks, my daughter doesn't want anything to do with me, I can tell this was a forced meeting, he meets up with Homelander at the top of a building, which is always the smartest place to meet up, and he gives him the information that Homelander was looking for. You're looking for a French guy, a black guy, a guy with a beard, here they are. He says, look man, I just want to get back in a vault, I want to be one of the good guys again, and that's when Homelander looks at the phone, looks at him, and just flies off. In episode 7, my man Huey seals that deal. He takes Starlight to a fancy hotel, and those two share some sexual intercourse. And afterwards, they're having a little pillow talk, 
And Starlight asks him, why are we at a hotel? Why aren't we at your place? And Huey says, it's my dad. It's embarrassing. And she goes, I need to know that this is a nice thing and not a red flag that we're at a hotel. And he goes, look, you can meet my dad, but it's going to be a bad time for you. And they laugh about it. And the next day, she is called into a meeting with the rest of the seven. So you've got Homelander, The Deep, Queen Maeve, Black Noir, and then she is the last one to arrive. Because Translucent's dead, and The Deep is in Sandusky, Ohio. And the whole point of this meeting being called is because Homelander has figured out exactly who was at Mesmer's house. He throws up a picture of Huey up on the board, and of course, then Miss Starlight kind of fall back in her chair, and she goes, why is Huey up there? And Homelander says, well, Huey is up there because Huey is using you to get back at the A-train for killing his girlfriend. Homelander also makes the claim that Huey killed Translucent, which we know to be true, but Starlight is not buying it. And Starlight also claims ignorance, saying, I had no idea this was going on, but Homelander is not believing her. And right before Homelander's about to snap, Queen Maeve, of all people, comes to Starlight's defense, and it causes Homelander to back off, and he tells Queen Maeve, don't ever say I didn't do anything for you. But this is leaving Starlight very confused and wondering exactly who Huey is. And this couldn't come at a worse time, because Huey arrives at their safe house and ends up telling the group that he no longer has interest in doing this anymore. But Billy goes after him, saying, well, the only reason you don't have interest in doing this anymore is because you're dating a soup. You're dating Starlight. This argument escalates until finally it kind of dies down, and right after it dies down, Huey gets a phone call from his dad's house, but it's not his dad. It's the A-Train. The A-Train demands that Huey show up at his dad's house without anybody else and says, if you bring anybody, I'm going to run through your dad like I ran through your girlfriend. So Huey does as constructed. He shows up alone and he sees his dad and his dad says, this guy's not acting right. He's hopped up on something, something's up. And all of a sudden, the A-Train shows up and says, wow, you really did come alone. I can't believe this. Always have a backup plan. And that's when Huey pulls out a syringe of compound V and says, this is my backup plan. Now, the A-Train tries to act like he doesn't know what it is, but as soon as Huey starts squirting it out, the A-Train loses it. Huey says, look, I have a whole backup of this, and I'll give it to you. Just let my dad go. So the A-Train lets his dad go, and now it's just Huey and the A-Train in a room alone together. And Huey says, this shit must be pretty good if it's worth running through a human being for. And the A-Train reiterates that, man, it was an accident. He also says, I lost somebody too, you know. I lost Popclaw, and she did have a name, and you killed her. Now, of course, Huey didn't kill her. It was the A-Train that killed her, but the A-Train is blaming his actions on the fact that she was made by the group. The A-Train's getting more and more animated, and he says, You used Popclaw, so what I did was an accident, but what you did, that was calculated. And that intentional act led to her death. And then out of nowhere, the Asian girl, whose name in the last episode we learned is Kimiko, comes out of nowhere and breaks the A-Train's leg. Now, after the phone call to Huey, the rest of them realize they've all been burned. So Mother's Milk goes and grabs his family. And along with Huey's dad, they all head to the safe house. So while everyone's family is trying to find a safe space, Homelander is meeting with Madeline Stilwell and just happens to ask, Hey, do you know what happened to this random PR girl? And the random PR girl is Billy's wife. Homelander recognizes Billy from his photos and remembers meeting him and his wife at a holiday party. That's a pretty random question, and Madeline Stilwell pretty quickly says, oh, I have no idea what happened to her. And Homelander says, that's really weird because she literally just disappeared without a trace, and I figured you would have some idea, and Madeline Stilwell says, no, no, I, I, no, no clue here. So Homelander's very suspicious about what happened to Billy's wife, and he ends up flying to the home of the doctor who kept him in that lab. And after very little small talk, the doctor finally cuts to the chase and says, Look, man, you're here because you want to know what happened to Becca Butcher, so why don't you just ask me? So you learn that at that Christmas party, Homelander asked Becca if she would run his social media account. But that wasn't the only thing he wanted her to run. The two meet up, and she was in his room for three hours, and when she comes out, it's pretty clear they were together. But Becca got pregnant, and that's not supposed to happen. No one knew that Homelander had that ability. But there she is, pregnant with Homelander's baby, and she had to sign an NDA and have the baby in an undisclosed location. She couldn't even tell Billy, and that's why she disappeared. And unfortunately for Becca, when she ends up having the baby, the baby literally claws its way out of her and kills her in the process, and then ended up drowning in a pool of its own blood. The baby didn't even last more than 10 seconds. So it's clear that Homelander didn't actually rape Becca Butcher, but the reason that Billy thinks he did is because a random woman from the CIA shows up at Billy's place and shows him the video of Becca leaving, and that's the last known thing that they have, and she has convinced Billy that she was raped. So Billy is not only out for vengeance on Homelander, but now he's out for vengeance on Mesmer, because they quickly realize that the guy who gave them up must be Mesmer. Billy ends up finding him in a train station trying to leave town and ends up hunting him down. And Mesmer claims that he can help him find his wife, but Billy just ends up killing him. And then he heads back to the safe house where everybody's family is, and then there's Huey, who is frantically calling Annie. But she's not answering. 
Mother's Milk walks up to Billy and says, look, it's obvious the deputy director was willing to make this deal. Just no Homelander. I have to protect my family. Can you please call her up and do this deal so that everybody is safe? And to Billy's credit, he does that. He calls up the deputy director and they strike a deal. So the CIA comes in, tells everybody their families are going to be all right, and Billy hands over the Compound V, and now the CIA has everything they need to take down Vaught. The CIA calls in Madeline Stilwell for a meeting and gives her all the reasons why she's screwed, but it doesn't seem like the CIA is really interested in taking Vought down. They're more interested in keeping the military to the military and not having it be privatized. They want Madeline Stilwell to pull the bill, which is going to go to the floor any day now, and it seems like she does have the votes to pass. Keep the military with the military, or else they're planning on going public with this information. And if it goes public, she's going to spend a lot of time in prison. But during this meeting, the deputy director gets a note from somebody, and she goes in a separate room where you're watching a video of a bunch of soldiers trying to take down a terrorist cell. And while they're trying to take down this terrorist cell, a super soldier shows shows up and ends up taking them all out. And now we've got a super terrorist. And this is the first time anyone in the CIA is ever seeing anything like this. And this goes back to the fact that Vault was building super villains so their superheroes could take them out. The episode ends with Huey and Starlight meeting up in the park, the same park bench where they met the first time. And Starlight says, I demand to know what is up. Now Huey is trying to explain himself, but he's doing a terrible job at it. And Starlight just keeps asking, did you kill Translucent? He says, it's complicated. Did you use me to try to get back an A-Train? He doesn't say anything. He tells her, look, this isn't about Translucent or the A-Train. This is about Compound V. And he tells her that they've been hopping up babies since the 60s and that they haven't been blessed by God. And she says, no, no, we, we have been. We've, we've been blessed by God, but it's obviously not the case. And out of nowhere, she is shot. And you look up and Billy Butcher is the one who shot her. And he yells at Huey, run. Huey initially goes back and just starts apologizing to Annie, but he does end up running away. It's worth noting, by the way, that it does look like Annie's alive, but she's still been shot. Episode 8 takes place six weeks after the end of Episode 7, and the government has allowed superheroes into the military. Now, the government is wondering how exactly terrorists ended up with Compound V, but it doesn't really matter because in the meantime, Vought superheroes will be battling them. Now, while that's great news for Vought, it's not great news for Billy and his group. They're held up in a hotel, and the deputy director shows up there and tells them that the DOJ has reneged on the deal. And not only that, but they're now labeling them as criminals for what they did to Translucent. So it kind of puts the group in a scramble mode. And Billy's frustrated because they're so close to taking them down. So he heads to his former boss's house. Now, this is the same boss that lost her grandkids to Lamplighter. And it's also the same woman that brought the video of Becca Butcher leaving Homelander's room to Billy, making it look like she was raped. Or at the very least, painting the picture. But because of the fact that she lost her grandkids once to one of these guys she's very reluctant to help billy but billy needs to figure out how to take these guys out specifically homelander and after some back and forth she finally says homelander doesn't really have a weakness per se but his weakness if anything is madeline stillwell so get to madeline stillwell and you might be able to find his weakness now while that meeting was going on a group of mercenaries busted through the door and took kimiko frenchie and mother's milk so when billy and huey head back billy notices there are differences in the hotel parking lot and he just keeps on driving. He tells Huey that they've probably been taken and there's probably a lot of guys there that were ready to wrap them up as well. So let's just keep moving. But Huey wants to go back. Huey wants to try to save these guys. But the only thing Billy is focused on is getting to Madeline Stillwell and in a way says they're on their own. They get into a fight and decide to go their separate ways with Billy heading off to try to get Madeline Stillwell and Huey heading back to the motel to try to save his friends. Now, Huey's first idea is to hit up Starlight. Credit to him, because it's a bold move to hit up the girl that you were dating, kind of, and your friend shot. And because of that, she's not really interested in helping him. Even after he pleads with her and says, you saved me once before, you saved me in that bowling alley, I was going down a dark path until you came around. Yeah, yeah, that charm doesn't work this time, and she's really not interested. And so it's on Huey to figure out a new plan, which we'll get to in a little bit, because one of the members of the Seven that we haven't talked about in a little bit is the A-Train who was having a tough go of it since Kamiko took out his leg. He's no longer the fastest man in the world. That's now Shockwave, the guy that he beat in that race. And no one really seems to recognize him, especially when he's just browsing in a store and a security guard racially profiles him. Even after the A-Train tells the security guard that he's the A-Train, the security guard doesn't buy it. Now, eventually, the security guard does realize that he actually is the A-Train and apologizes profusely, but this chance encounter forces the A-Train to try to rehab quicker, and he uses Compound V once again. His brother catches him training and wonders how the hell he healed so quickly and realized it was Compound V and starts chastising it for using it. He's saying, your organs are growing quicker than your body is. This stuff's really dangerous. You shouldn't be using it. I'm out of here. But the only thing that the A-Train is focused on is becoming the world's fastest man once again. 
even if this stuff is going to kill him. Now, let's get back to that plan that Huey had. It's actually pretty genius. He's going to intentionally get caught by the Black Ops guys, and they're going to throw him in a cell with Frenchie and Mother's Milk. Now, they searched him, but they didn't search the retainer he was wearing. And with Frenchie's skill set, they're able to use that retainer to break free. But now they need to find Kimiko, and after taking out some of the Black Ops guys, they do end up finding her, but... It results in Frenchie getting shot. He's not killed, but he is injured. And now it's just down to Mother's Milk and Huey because Kimiko's pretty banged up as well. Eventually, though, they end up getting rounded up because they run out of bullets, and it looks like it's curtains for him, but that's when Starlight ends up entering the picture. Now, she was at a Christmas party getting all tuned up, looking real good, mind you. And she ends up having a heart-to-heart with Queen Maeve. It says, look, you're a pain in the ass, but be that wholesome pain in the ass because we need that. And don't lose yourself in this job. Don't lose who you are. So she ends up using her clearance to find out exactly where the Black Ops site is and ends up finding them. And it's in the best time. She takes out the rest of the Black Ops guys and it looks like they're home free, but that's when the A-Train shows up because he's still got vengeance in his eyes for Huey. Now Starlight is trying to ward him off, but he's just too fast. The A-Train goes to Huey and says, you killed my girlfriend once again. Huey says, I didn't kill your girlfriend. And finally the A-Train admits, I know you didn't because I did. And unfortunately for the A-Train, all that compound V has finally taken its toll and he has a heart attack. Now, this would be the perfect time for Huey to get away, but he can't because he tries to revive the A-Train. He tells Starlight to call her a hospital, and she says, you know he's never going to stop coming after you. And he goes, I know, but I, I can't just leave him here. But Starlight knocks some sense into him and says, look, get out of here, because if they catch you, you're done, and I'll take it over from here. Now, at that same Christmas party that Starlight was getting tuned up in, you had a mix of the Vought people hobnobbing with military folks. And at this Christmas party, the head of Vought comes to Madeline Stilwell and implies that she's going to get a raise because of all the money that's being generated from this military deal. And she seems extremely excited about this. Eventually, Homelander shows up and sees Madeline Stilwell and says, don't you think it was a little ironic that this supervillain just showed up when we needed him most? And that's when he admits that he was having the A-Train run around the globe delivering Compound V to terrorists. And even though there was some trial and error with it, they ended up fine-tuning it and ended up working out for Vought. And this leads to a very uncomfortable sexual encounter with Homelander. They also discussed the Becca Butcher situation a little bit, but that wasn't pillow talk. That's that's before they started banging. After the party, Madeline Stilwell is dropped off at home and starts looking for the babysitter, but the babysitter isn't there. Billy Butcher is. He ends up strapping a bunch of C4 all over Madeline Stilwell waiting for Homelander, who does eventually show up. Homelander asks him, what do you want here? All right, you're, you're Becca's husband. Dude, she came on to me. It's the celebrity angle. You know, she was really into me. So well, what are you trying to get out of all this? And Billy just says, I just want to hurt you. And Homelander says, okay, that makes sense. Uh, I hurt something that you love, and now you want to hurt something that I love, which in this case is Madeline. And then he looks at Madeline and says, I thought you weren't going to lie to me. And she gives him a confused look, and he says, you know, you and the doctor's stories about Becca, that they were just, they were so close, but there was just little things that were off with it. They didn't quite match up. And that's when he grabs her face and uses those lasers to basically laser her face off. After he does this, he looks at Billy, and Billy's only option now is to pull the C4, which he does. The next scene is Billy waking up on a front yard, and he's staring at Homelander, and Homelander says, hey, man, you gotta get up. I, I-, I saved you, but you were probably knocked out there for eight or nine hours, but but you gotta get up, man, because you're really gonna love this. And that's when a little boy walks out and sees Homelander and goes, oh my god, you're Homelander, and he says, hey, bud, do you know who I am? And the kid goes, yeah, yeah, I know you are, you're Homelander, and Homelander says, oh, I guess your mom didn't tell you, because... I'm also your dad, and Becca Butcher is right behind the kid in shock. At the start of Season 2, the head of Vault, a guy named Stan Edgar, is going through the contract that they're proposed to the U.S. government to keep the soups in the Department of Defense. The soups will continue to battle the super terrorists, and one such terrorist is a guy named Nakeem. He's the terrorist that we saw at the end of Season 1, and Black Noir was sent on a mission to kill him, and he does so successfully. And Homelander makes this announcement to the world, at the translucent memorial slash funeral. The only two people from the seven that are there are him and Starlight. But the memorial service is a huge deal. It's sold out, there's merchandise, there's people outside. It is truly a worldwide event. So that's what the seven is up to. Now the group that includes Billy, Huey, Mother's Milk, Frenchie, and Kamiko, uh, they're in a little bit of a different situation. Billy is nowhere to be found. And the rest of that group is holding out in the basement of a Cash for Gold store that is also being used by a local gang to distribute guns, drugs, you name it. And they have to all lay low because they're wanted in connection with the murder of Madeline Stilwell. So they're really not supposed to leave the basement, but that doesn't stop Huey. He makes an excuse that he's going out to get supplies, but in reality, 
He's going to meet up with Annie slash Starlight. And the two meet up on the subway. And the first thing he asks her is, was she followed? Did she snap the SIM card from the burner cell phone? He is extremely paranoid, but for good reason. Although Annie doesn't think it's a good reason, she's concerned about his mental well-being at this point because he looks like shit. He hands her over a piece of paper of a guy that's going to help them take down Vaught. He works at Vaught Labs. The only issue is Annie actually knows him from her Capes for Christ days. And Huey asks, is that going to be an issue? And she says, well, I can't really make it an issue. The conversation then turns to Annie's dating life because she was spotted in an award show with a movie star. And Huey's inquiring as to if this was set up by the PR firm or if she's actually dating him. Because Huey still very much wants to get back with Annie, but Annie still feels betrayed about what Huey did to her. So right now, they only have a working relationship, and that is to take down Vaught. He then heads back to the basement where, unfortunately, they're still heavily wanted. I mean, they've gone all out. They even have Chris Hansen doing a story on it with a bad reenactment of Billy Butcher taking out Madeline Stilwell and giving an update that her baby was found 13 miles away. So unfortunately, laying low hasn't worked for the group and they want to run. But Huey says, no, we shouldn't run. We should continue to try to take down Vaught. All we need to do is get some Compound V, take it to the local news, and boom, they're done. The problem is they don't have Compound V. And Huey suggests that they get Starlight to help. And Mother's Milk freaks out at that suggestion. Because Huey getting in contact with Starlight could jeopardize everybody's lives. Mother's Milk makes the case that she's being heavily monitored right now, and you just texting her could have gotten us all killed. And Mother's Milk is just very stressed out because he's sick of living in a basement. He wants to see his family. Now, Annie has taken that piece of paper that was given to her by Huey and gone to the address on it. And she finds that soup that she knew from Bible Camp, who goes by the name Gecko. And he goes by the name Gecko because he can regenerate appendages. And with that little skill, he ends up selling himself as like a SNM hooker to people that want to chop off limbs. So Annie stands outside and takes a video of one such guy cutting off Gecko's arm. She then acts like she just happens to run into him at a diner afterwards, and the two start catching up about their Bible camp days. And he lets her know that he works at the labs in Vaught, and he obviously is well aware of who she is and how far she's come. And then she asks for a favor. She says, I need compound V. And he plays dumb, acting like he doesn't know what it is, but she says, here we go, another lie. He explains to her how difficult it's going to be for him to get Compound V because he's such a low man on a totem pole. He's really nothing more than a lab rat. But that's when she blackmails him with the video. And with no other choice, he's going to have to help. It's kind of sad, though. He says, I thought we were friends. And she says, no. We were nothing. Now, while Annie was blackmailing Gecko, the leader of the Seven, Homelander, has gone into Madeline's old office, which is being completely redone. And he has a really weird moment with her old breast milk. But he's interrupted by Ashley, who walks in. And she starts thanking him profusely for getting her this job. She then lets him know that she thinks she's found a perfect replacement for Translucent. And he's downstairs. She asks Homelander, do you want to meet him? And he excitedly says, yeah, absolutely. So they head downstairs to the gym, and there he is, a superhero by the name Blindspot. And he's called Blindspot because he's actually legally blind. Think Daredevil. He's extremely accurate with weapons and such, and he's excited to meet Homelander. And at first, Homelander acts like he's excited to meet him as well, saying that he's the real hero because of how much he's overcome. But he asks Ashley and Blindspot, just a quick question, what happens if I do this? And he bashes both of his eardrums in. And his blind spot is writhing in pain on the ground with blood pouring out of his head. And Ashley, who is mortified, Homelander looks at her and says, You really thought I would let a crippled into the seven? Have you lost your mind? The only reason you have this job is to be my eyes and ears for corporate. I'm the boss. I make the rules. You are nothing more than a mole to me. Do you understand that? And then he walks out, laying down the law. Now that night, back in the Cash for Gold basement, Group is just trying to kill time when all of a sudden one of the gangbangers comes in and his arm is completely jacked up. It's broken in every place. It is mangled. And Mother's Milk, who has kind of been the doctor for this group, says, there's nothing I can do. You gotta take him to the hospital. Gangbangers are reluctant to do that, obviously. And through loose translation, you find out what happened to him. Unbeknownst to Frenchie, the gangbangers weren't just smuggling in drugs and weapons. They were also smuggling in people, which pisses off Frenchie. But while they were doing this, one of the guys that was being smuggled in picked up the boat that they just arrived in and threw it on this other guy. So the group heads to the dock and sure enough, up. There's the boat just lying on the road. They look at the security camera footage and luckily it hasn't gotten to the cops yet, but it is really bad because they basically have a soup terrorist running amok in New York City. And Kamiko goes near the boat and she thinks she knows who it is because she's found an origami crane. And when they get back to the basement, she's trying to tell Frenchie this, but she's just learning English and Frenchie doesn't really understand. The only word she can type out is boy and she keeps pointing to it. Frenchie wants to call Billy, but 
Huey is totally against calling Billy. He thinks they can do it himself. And his bright suggestion is to get in touch with Reyna, the deputy director of the CIA, even though they're all wanted by the police. And with no real bright ideas, they try to get in touch with her. So while the group tries to get in touch with Reyna, Homelander and Queen Maeve have gone off to film a commercial that they're going to use to drum up public support to keep the soups in the Department of Defense. But while filming it, this other soup shows up named Stormfront, who is live streaming the entire thing. And Stormfront seems to not give a fuck. She's pointing out that they're not actually in the middle of a war zone. They're on a set. The one soldier was in NCIS Los Angeles. And Ashley doesn't know where the hell she came from. And while Queen Maeve has heard of her, both Queen Maeve and Homelander are like, what are you doing here? And that's when Stormfront reveals that she is the newest member of the Seven and the boys up top just wanted her to say hello. And Ashley immediately, seeing what happened a blind spot, looks at Homelander saying, I had no idea, and that's because it went over her head. This was done by Stan Edgar. And because it's being live streamed, Homelander can't exactly freak out at her. But the first thing he does when he's done filming that commercial is go and talk to Stan. And at first he tries to strong arm him, telling him that his contract is up at the end of the year and it's not going to look good to shareholders if a superhero company is without the most famous superhero in the world. Stan lets him know that we're not in the superhero business, we're in the pharmaceutical business. And Homelander isn't the most valuable asset to Vaught. The most valuable asset is Compound V. But then Homelander had to go act like a child, spreading Compound V to terrorists around the world, just to get his boys in that fat paycheck. But in doing so, he might have just cost the company everything. And now because of it, the FDA knows about Compound V, and it's only a matter of time before the public does too. So Homelander isn't really in a position to start making demands because everyone's trying to clean up his mess. And that includes who goes into the Seven and who doesn't. And Homelander is furious... He just walks out. He does end up flying to Becca Butcher's house, knocking on the door, and she's really shocked to see him, saying, what are you doing here? And he says, just came to visit my son. Now, back with the group, the good thing is they've been able to track down Raina, and they meet up with her, and she asks if they've heard from Billy, and the answer's no. She then asks, do you think Billy could have actually killed Madeline Stillwell? And Mother's Milk says, well, I would hope not, but I don't know, I wasn't there. Mother's Milk then asks for an update on his family, and she gives him one, and Huey asks, is there any way that Mother's Milk can see his family? And Raina says, well, let's check out this thing with this super terrorist, and then we'll go from there. So Mother's Milk gives a detailed description on the super terrorist that they saw in the security camera footage. And it's as if a light bulb just went off in Raina's head. Because she's been trying to figure out how to take down Vought for a while, figuring that it's an inside job, and she thinks she's figured it out now with this information. But all of a sudden, she gets a bloody nose, and her head explodes. And as soon as that happens, the group gets in the van and frantically drives off, freaking out at who just killed Raina. The group gets back to the Cash for Gold basement. They start cleaning themselves up, and Mother's Milk lets them know that that wasn't meant for them. Because if it was, none of them would have heads at the moment. He figures that somebody was around waiting for her to say the wrong thing, and if she did, they'd kill her. And while they don't know if it's Vaught, if it was, they just killed the deputy director of the CIA. Huey then gets a phone call from Starlight, who lets him know there's great news. He's good to get me Compound V in the next day or two. Then we just take it to the local news and we take him down. But now, since what happened with Reyna, Huey's worried for her. He wants her to be safe. So he tells her, ho, ho, slow down. Let's just take this thing slow. And she can't figure out why. And she wants to know if anything happened. And he says no, but she can tell that he's lying. And lying is a big thing for her, so she just hangs up. And as soon as she does... Someone gets thrown down the steps. Gangbangers come out with guns drawn, and then all of a sudden, down comes Billy Butcher. And Huey feels kind of betrayed because Frenchie called him, but Frenchie says this isn't a game anymore. We need an actual leader. And Billy looks at Huey and says, you know, he's right. We're the most wanted people in the world. Raina's head exploded, and we've got super terrorists, but don't worry, daddy's home. And then finally, a little update on the deep. He's still in Sandusky, Ohio in purgatory, and he is miserable. He's drinking a lot, he's getting arrested, he's being featured on TMZ. But after one such arrest, he gets bailed out by a guy named Eagle the Archer. And Eagle takes him back to his house and lets the Deep crash on his couch. And when the Deep wakes up, it's not just Eagle the Archer there, it's somebody else. A woman named Carol. And Eagle starts talking about when he hit rock bottom and how Carol helped him out of that. But the Deep doesn't think he's hit rock bottom. And the Deep gets up to leave, but Carol says, I think I can help you get back into the Seven. And that is something that the Deep is very interested in. And when he turns around, Carol is handing them this book... That says, Church of the Collective, the new science of self-renewal. In episode two, you find out what happened to Billy. After he saw Becca, he was dropped off in Fort Wayne, Indiana in a strip mall in front of a chain restaurant. And he goes in because he wants to write down everything he remembers from her place. But as he's doing so, he looks up on the television and it says he's wanted for the murder of Madeline Stilwell, so he needs to get out of there. And after Frenchie called, he showed up at the Cash for Gold place. 
And while Frenchie and Mother's Milk are thrilled to see him, Huey is not. He can't believe they're just ready to forgive Billy after what he did, leaving them for dead. But like it or not, he's here and he's here to help. He's going to go meet with a contact that he thinks that can help them find the soup terrorist. So as he goes off to meet that contact, his wife is dealing with an issue because Homelander is still at her house and he won't really leave. He's having a catch with his son and he can't figure out why his son isn't using his powers. And that's because Becca hasn't really told him he has powers. She feels like it's best if he lives as normal of a life as possible. But all Becca could focus on is why Homelander won't go away. So later that day, she drops Ryan off at piano lessons and tells him that she's going to go have coffee with somebody. But she races to the entrance, or it might even be the exit, of a compound that is heavily fortified. She gets out of the car and starts screaming at the guard to open the door. The guy tells her to get back in the car, but then she demands to talk to Dr. Park. And eventually Dr. Park ends up getting on the phone, and she yells at him saying, I was told I would never have to see him again. He would never know about me or Ryan. That was the deal. And Dr. Park lets her know that Homelander was pretty pissed off this information was kept from him. And corporate has made the decision not to antagonize him any further. And unfortunately, there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube. He tells her to keep calm and they figure eventually he'll get bored and go away. But Becca, who is crying at this point, says, you don't know that. And as she's on the phone with Dr. Park, she's watching Homelander in her house because it's under surveillance. So she goes, she picks up Ryan from music class, and that night, Homelander gives him a cell phone, which is his first cell phone. But he says, I don't really have anyone to call. And that's because he's lived such a sheltered life. He doesn't have friends. He really only knows his mother and a few other people. And he's definitely not living a normal life. Homelander then tells him how he didn't have a dad. And in fact, he didn't have a mom. And sometimes it's hard feeling that superior to everybody else on the planet. But God shouldn't feel that isolation. And then he looks Ryan dead in the eye and says, you and me, we're gods. And we can do anything we want. And that is a pretty amazing feeling. Ryan then tries to go to bed, and as Homelander's leaving, he says, All right, I love you. All right, Ryan, now you say it. And Ryan says it, but it's awkward as hell, and it really is nothing more than the words, because he barely knows this guy. As Homelander closes the door, Becca tells him, You have to leave. But Homelander ignores that statement, saying, What do you think's going to happen when Ryan finds out that he's been lied to his entire life? That you've basically been keeping him in this nice-looking prison. You think he's going to forgive you, or you think he's going to hate you? You were right. I'm not going anywhere. So feel free to tell Dr. Park to go fuck himself. And then he just heads downstairs to make Jiffy Pop. Now back with the rest of the seven, they're busy doing a press junket. Although it's really just the girls. Starlight, Queen Maeve, and Stormfront. Because this is the first time that there are three women in the seven. And it's a big deal. They're starting this new marketing campaign, Girls Get It Done. And they have a very busy day. But as Ashley is going over the itinerary, Queen Maeve gets a phone call because she's still listed as Elena's contact. And Elena has suffered a burst appendix. So Maeve says, I gotta go. I have a family emergency. Even though Ashley is begging her to stay, Maeve takes off. And when Maeve gets to the hospital, Elena isn't exactly thrilled to see her. She kind of pushes her to leave, saying, I'm sure you've got busier things to do, but Queen Maeve isn't going anywhere, saying, I'm going to wait for the doctor. And as they continue to talk, they get more and more comfortable with each other, and they kind of get back into their old habits. And eventually, as they wait for the doctor, Elena tells her that, I'm going to let you take me out to dinner. But when Queen Maeve doesn't say anything, Elena goes, why did you even bother coming if nothing's changed? And Queen Maeve tells her that it really has nothing to do with her. It has to do with Homelander. Because if Homelander ever finds out about her, it's putting her life in danger. And if Elena ever found out what Homelander has forced her to do, she'll hate her even more. And this is blowing Elena's mind that all this time she was actually being protected by Queen Maeve. It wasn't like she was embarrassed by her. Now back with the press junket, it's now just Starlight and Stormfront. And they're being asked a bunch of questions by a bunch of different media members, but they're pretty much all the same questions and they're getting tired of it. And one such question is, do you think women make better superheroes? To which Stormfront finally gets sick of it and says, what does it matter if you have a vagina or a dick? Chicks and dicks are in it together. And then her phone starts buzzing in her purse and she is getting death stares from Ashley. But she looks at Ashley and says, sorry. We don't have any pockets. You want to talk about a real issue? Let's get a girl some pockets. And Starlight is loving the honesty that is coming out of Stormfront because it's just so refreshing. When they get back on track, though, one of the interviewers asks Starlight about the A-Train. And the story that they're going with is that the A-Train is on a secret mission. And Starlight is saying how she prays for him every day and the world's so lucky to have a superhero like him. But then they surprise her because the A-Train is right behind her. And this is the first time that she is seeing the A-Train since he's woken up from his coma where they tried to revive him. So while she tries to play it off like she's happy to see him, she is worried. And after that part of the press junket, she goes and talks to the A-Train and it starts off pretty awkward. Hey, how you feeling? 
I prayed for you every day. But then they get to the crux of the issue, what he remembers. And she tells him, just to let you know, everyone thought it was a really good idea that you called me for backup. But he responds with, well, does everyone think it was a good idea that you let your traitor fucking boyfriend get away? Or did you not tell them that? And Annie nervously asks, well, who did you tell? But he just walks off. She then finds Stormfront, who's making a video denouncing her action figure, saying, don't buy it. And Starlight tells her, you know, I really like everything you're saying about Vaught, but Stormfront thinks that she's a spy, asking, are you wearing a wire or something? And Starlight says, no, I'm not wearing a wire. But Stormfront thinks she's a sellout, saying that she's the most Vaught of Vaught. And she used to be a fan, but she sold out. And Annie doesn't really have time to explain herself because Gecko's showing up with a Compound V. And Annie tells him, I can't just take this here. I have no pockets and I'm at a press junket. But Gecko says, you wanted the Compound V, here it is. And if you bother me again about it, I'm going to make sure everyone knows that you're the one who has it. So she starts to put it in her boot, but then the A-Train catches her doing so. She's able to sneak it into the purse of Stormfront. And when the A-Train pats her down, he doesn't find it. They're all then called away to do more press for the press junket. And when the day wraps up, Starlight walks up to Stormfront, needing an excuse to talk to her to try to get the Compound V back. And she tells her, hey, by the way, you don't know me. And maybe I want to say everything about Vought that you're saying. But even then, she's very hesitant to say anything bad about Vought. And Stormfront can't understand why, saying you're literally bulletproof. I mean, what are they going to do to you? Drop the mask every once in a while. It feels good. And Starlight didn't just get that great advice. She also was able to get the Compound V back. She heads to her room and is texting Huey saying, hey, I got it. I'm freaking out. Call me back. But then all of a sudden, the A-Train runs in, asks who she's texting, but also grabs the Compound V. And Starlight is nervously making an excuse, trying to get him not to open up the pouch, but he does so anyway, finding the Compound V. She tries to tell him, I can explain that, but he doesn't want to hear it. And as he starts to leave, he tells her, I just want you to think about me when you're getting the skin peeled off your face. But then Starlight remembers the advice that Stormfront gave him, and she says, you're not going to do shit, because you killed your girlfriend. That's what you told Huey, right? That you killed Popclaw? He nervously tells her, you can't prove that, but she says, well, I saw the autopsy report from Vaught. And the needles went into her arm so fast that it actually shattered the bone. Now, Vaught, they're more than happy to cover this up. But what about Sports Illustrated? I'm sure they'd be interested in the story. He says, well, if you do that, I'm going to take you down with me. And she looks at him and says, go ahead. I don't give a fuck. And as he looks in her eyes, he can tell she's being serious. She then takes back the compound V and he just walks off like a dog with his tail between his legs. So it was a busy day for everybody involved in the Seven, and it was also a busy day for Billy Butcher, who went to Rainer's funeral service, not just to pay his respects, but also to get in contact with Grace. And it takes a lot of convincing, but Grace eventually gives him the address for the people that smuggled the soup terrorist into the country. And if they catch the soup terrorist, She's agreed to wipe all their records clean. They can go home. So they head to the address, and it's a party supply store. And they slowly start making their way to the front of the store. And as they're doing so, Kamiko sees a guy in a back office who she recognizes, and she literally tears his head off. And at first, Frenchie is surprised, but then he realizes why she did it. He works for the Shining Light Militia, who kidnapped her and forced her to become a soup. She then takes off in the store and finds the soup terrorist. But instead of taking him out, she gives him a hug because it's her brother. That's what she was trying to tell Frenchie the entire time. And Huey and Frenchie are watching this go down, realizing why she's hugging him. And Frenchie's kind of kicking himself for not realizing what she was trying to say sooner. And while they're totally cool with letting her have her moment, Billy is not. And Billy crouches down and has the suit terrorist in his sights. And as he gets ready to shoot him, Huey knocks him out of the way. But it draws attention to the group. And the suit terrorist throws pretty much everything at the store at them and then runs off with Kamiko. When Frenchie, Mother's Milk, and Billy are dusting themselves off, Billy goes after Huey wanting to kick his ass. But Huey says, we couldn't just let you do that. I mean, what, they're going to throw him in a black site and she's never going to see him again? Billy then tries to get the group going again, saying, all right, let's go get him. But this time they side with Huey. And it's the surprise of just about everybody there. But Mother's Milk says, Kamiko is one of us, so you got to find another way. And that's when Billy comes clean. He tells him how he saw Becca. And it wasn't bullshit this time. He was brought there, he saw her kid who looked just like Homelander, and then he was dropped off in a parking lot. And Grace told him that if he gets the soup terrorist, then Grace will find out where Becca is. That's the deal he made. And he needs to protect her because Vaught has her stored away somewhere. And he needs their help to do so. And while he doesn't like asking for help, he's doing it anyway. So they go off and try to find the soup terrorist. And the soup terrorist is currently sitting on a swing with Kamiko, 
and they're both apologizing for not being there for one another. But the more and more they talk, the more Kimiko realizes that he's been radicalized by the shining light. After Homelander slaughtered their village, he's literally come to America to try to ruin it. And Kimiko is the exact opposite, seeing the shining light for who they truly are. But this disagreement forces the two to get into a fight where Kimiko eventually wins it by choking her brother out. At this point, Billy's group has found him, ties him up, and throws him in the back of the van with Kimiko. And as Huey is closing the door, he gets punched by Billy, who says, if you ever get in the way of me and my missus again, I'll fucking kill you. And instead of standing up for himself, Huey just gets in the van, pissed off. Oh, and then finally there's an update on the deep. He's taken that book that Carol gave him and he's filled it out. But Carol's having a tough time making sense of it all. Trying to get to the core issue of what makes the deep tick. But Eagle the Archer says not to worry. And he gives him this herbal tea that has him tripping out. He locks him in a bedroom and then all of a sudden, the deep's gills start talking to him. And his gills are really just trying to help him figure out why he is the way he is. In episode 3, the group has the soup terrorist, aka Kimiko's brother, on a boat and they're just waiting word from Grace. And Huey is still really pissed off at Billy, which causes Billy to actually do something he never does, go up and apologize. And instead of just accepting the apology, Huey ends up punching him back in the face. He's still pissed off. The two are then separated and Billy gets a phone call from Grace saying, sit tight, they're coming to get him. And then she asks if he's ever heard of an old soup called Liberty. He asks, what's that got to do with it? And she says, I'm not sure yet. The conversation then turns to Kimiko and the fact that the soup terrorist is her brother. And Grace asks, do you think that's going to compromise her? And Billy says, well, if it does, I'll neutralize her. And when he gets off the phone, he realizes that Frenchie overheard this conversation. And Frenchie wasn't the only one because so did Kimiko. And even though Kimiko's just learning English, it seemed like she knew what he was saying. Kimiko then heads downstairs to see her brother, and her brother wants to be let go, saying that the Americans are just going to torture him. But Kimiko says, I won't let them do that. I'll protect you. And his whole thing is, how are you going to do that? She hasn't really figured that out, and she just gets up and leaves. So while Billy and his group are awaiting the CIA to pick up the soup terrorist, the seven are busy listening to a pitch about their new movie. And the movie is going to be based on how they all came together. And when I say the seven, I mean everybody but obviously the Deep, who's in Sandusky, Ohio, and Homelander, because Homelander is still with Becca Butcher and Ryan. And he's trying to convince Ryan to use the powers that he has so he takes him up on the roof and is trying to get him to fly but ryan's scared saying i don't know how to do that gets to the point where he actually throws him off the roof thinking that instincts would kick in but they don't he just falls and becca runs out protecting her son and homelander says you're turning him into a pussy he grabs becca's arms and that's when ryan's instincts kick in using his powers and homelander is thrilled finally the kid is showing something but ryan and becca they're not and ryan yells at him i hate you i just want you to go away So as I said, the rest of the seven that includes Stormfront, Starlight, the A-Train, Queen Maeve, they're all listening to this movie pitch. And Stormfront has an issue with the way that the women are being portrayed. And Ashley steps in and says, Homelander really likes this script. And Stormfront says, that's great, where is he again? But she doesn't get an answer because Ashley gets a text message that leads her to bolt out of the room. She finds Edgar, she starts questioning him if it's true. And the it is the fact that the news has finally gotten the word that superheroes are not born, but yet made. And this is a huge story that Ashley's not getting answers on because Edgar Edgar and his team are going into a meeting to discuss how they're going to handle it. But word has gotten out globally, and that includes the Seven. Now, word has also gotten Huey on the boat, and he is pumped, thinking that Starlight and him have done it. The news is trying to get an answer from Vaught, also trying to get in touch with Jonah Vogelbaum, the former CSO, who has basically gone into seclusion, and he's not giving a comment. So Huey calls up Annie, tries to get her on the phone, but gets a voicemail and leaves her a message. And Huey's taking credit for it, but also saying Annie had a large part to do with it. And Mother's Milk gives him a massive hug. But when Billy comes in, all he says is, nice one. And even Mother's Milk says, that's all you got? You can't even give the kid props? He just did what we've been trying to do for years. But yeah, he's not ready to celebrate because he's got a soup terrorist below deck. And now the new mission is to get him to the CIA. Because things could go wrong at any moment. So with time to kill, Frenchie heads down below deck to talk to Kimiko's brother. Because he really wants to help her. He's also noticed that the language that they speak isn't like any form of sign language he's ever seen before. And you'll learn that Kimiko's brother actually knows English, but Kimiko stopped talking entirely when her parents were killed. And when they were in the village, they developed their own kind of language to help each other communicate and survive. And Frenchie asks if he can teach it to him, but he's tied up, he's about to get handed over, he's not really in the mood to help Frenchie, even though Frenchie's bought him chips and a drink. And little does Frenchie know that Kimiko's brother's been able to get one finger out of the duct tape binding that they've tied him up in. And that's all he needs. And he's able to use that finger slash his powers to crush up the soda can and saw his way out of the duct tape. And as he's busy sawing himself out, the group is joined by the NYPD because the boat that they're on has been reported stolen. And Billy is trying to lie his way out of it, but that's when Kimiko's brother comes up from below deck and uses his powers to literally throw the NYPD chopper into the ocean. And as Edgar sits in his ivory tower, 
tower trying to figure out what to do, he's gotten footage of what that soup terrorist just did, and he's got an idea. He's gonna try to use the seven to get out of this PR nightmare. So he calls them all in for a meeting that includes Homelander who just arrived, and he tells them that they're needed right now. And Homelander rallies the troops, getting them to go, but also telling him, piss off. That they're going to do it for each other and not for Vought. And whether this was all a stunt or he was being real, it works and the group heads off, try to find the soup terrorist. And another person who heads off is the Deep. Because back in Sandusky, Ohio, Carol has gotten word from Alistair, the guy who runs that kind of cult church that he's now in, that it's the Deep's time to get back into the Seven. So, unbeknownst to the rest of the Seven, the Deep is also going to meet them there. Now, of course, Billy and his group have no idea what's on the way, and they get a phone call from Grace saying, We're not coming to get you anymore. You have to go to a safe house. So, with no other choice, the group starts driving the boat to the safe house, but they start getting attacked by sharks. And as they get closer and closer to the shore, that's when the Deep appears, riding a whale. And he actually goes so far as to beach the whale, thinking that Billy would slow down, but Billy doesn't. Billy drives his boat right through this whale killing it and it leaves Huey once again covered in blood it throws the deep back and the entire group heads into the storm drains to try to find the safe house and that includes Huey after a lot of convincing from mother's milk they figured now that the deep's there it's only a matter of time before the rest of the seven show up so eventually the seven do arrive and to their surprise they find the deep there the deep explains what happened and one person that is not excited to see the deep is starlight he immediately apologizes for everything that he did to her saying that he's going to work his entire life to make it right but she doesn't want to hear that. And Stormfront says, oh my god, did you just join the Church of the Collective? You're an idiot. But Deep reminds her to be easy on the religious persecution. The group then gets their eye on the prize, and that is to get in the tunnels and find the soup terrorist. And Homelander says, if anyone sees him, he's mine. The Deep starts to walk in the tunnel, but Homelander says, no man, hang back a bit. Still have some work to do with the ladies, but you'll be back in the seven in no time, don't worry. So the group heads in the tunnels, they spread out, and the A-Train is still dealing with heart issues. Although, he's concealing it from everybody. And as Huey is walking aimlessly through the tunnel, he he sees a flashlight coming towards him, so he runs and hides, but then he realizes, oh my god, it's Starlight. And he excitedly comes out from behind the wall and says, you got my messages, because he's been blowing up her phone. But not quite, she knocks him down. And Homelander comes and finds Huey on the ground and says, you gotta be kidding me, this guy again? Starlight tries to plead the case that she didn't know he was there, and he says, uh, enough. Here's what I want you to do, I want you to kill him. And Annie starts making excuses, saying he's wanted, we should take him in. And Homelander says, no, we should, you're right. I want you to kill him. And Mother's Milk, Frenchie, Billy, Kamiko, they're all listening to this from behind a wall, hearing it go down. And it gets real when Homelander tells her, okay, here's the deal. Either you kill him or I kill both of you. And it looks like it's going to be curtains for Huey. But that is when Billy comes out from behind the shadows to distract Homelander. And the group uses their new secret weapon, Kamiko's brother. He brings the entire tunnel down on Homelander. He then uses the rocks to escape so he won't get caught by the CIA, and Kamiko goes running after him. In Mother's Milk, Huey and Billy get the hell out of there. Kamiko then gets caught up to her brother, and the two start having a conversation, but they get interrupted by Stormfront. And Stormfront starts throwing them around with her powers, taking out an entire residential apartment building. But Kamiko and her brother aren't the only ones she's taken out. She's taking out civilians as well. That is allowing Kamiko and her brother to get away, but Kamiko ends up getting stopped, and her and Stormfront get into a fight. And Stormfront is getting the better of Kamiko, which causes her brother to come back for her. Although Stormfront completely dismantles him, breaking his arms and snapping his neck. And Kamiko is hiding, but she's watching it all all go down. Homelander shows up seeing the body of the dead soup and tells Stormfront, I told you he was mine. And she looks at him and says, well, you snooze, you lose, and walks away. The seven then head off for a publicity appearance, handing out supplies to those who were left homeless from the destruction of Stormfront. And Edgar gives a statement that is read on the TV that it's an unfortunate day, but they're looking into the claims. And then he shifts gears to Stormfront, who is front and center on the TV, clapping it up for the, quote, real heroes. You know, the people she just left homeless. And Homelander is giving her a death stare, because usually that's him. And it seems like Stormfront has the ear of Stan Edgar. And Homelander isn't the only one who's given her a death stare because Kamiko, who has made it back to the Cash for Gold basement along with Huey, Mother's Milk, and Billy, has revenge in her eyes as she's watching this press conference. The terrorist attack is still a big deal in episode 4 and it's still making national news with Stormfront at the head of it. And she's gone on the offensive, calling out Vought, saying that they've done nothing to stop another attack, and she's calling for a protest the next day at Vought Square. And the more and more Homelander sees this coverage, the more he gets pissed off. So he goes to this cabin, where when he opens the door, there's Madeline Stillwell. Although, in reality, you find out that it's actually Doppelganger pretending to be Madeline Stillwell as sort of a therapy session, a very creepy therapy session. 
So while Homelander is going through this therapy session, Billy goes to meet up with Grace. And Billy apologizes for the whole way this soup terrorist thing played out. But she's really not interested in apologies at the moment. She hands him an envelope, and when Billy opens it up, there's the ad for Liberty, that superhero from the 70s that she had mentioned before in a phone call. Grace tells him that she was all over Susan's private server. There's an address on the back. So Grace tells him to have Mother's Milk head down to that address to talk to this Liberty and find out what she might know. And then she gives Billy the address of where they think they're holding Becca. Billy tells her we didn't get the job done, but Grace feels so bad about the fact that she tried to get Billy to stop searching for her that she gives him to him anyway, saying that she had no idea that Becca Butcher was still alive and they think that she's in a vault compound. So Billy heads off by himself to go to that address where they think they're holding Becca. And though Mother's Milk tries, there's no talking him out of it. Because Mother's Milk, of course, has been tasked with going to talk to Liberty. Now, Huey isn't in the basement when this conversation is going down. He's actually meeting with Starlight, which is a bold move by Starlight. Because earlier in the day, Homelander attacked her in an elevator, threatening to kill her for going back on their word and still being with Huey. Although she claims that she's not with Huey. He broke her heart. She would never actually work with him. And she's convincing enough where Homelander lets her go. But she's definitely taking her life into her own hands by coming to meet with Huey anyway. And Starlight feels really bad about how much she messed Huey up physically from attacking him. Although he just brushes it off. And Annie's pissed off because she feels like she made things worse. They tried to take down Vaught, but nothing really happened. And Huey says, don't worry, these things take time. Their conversation though is interrupted when Huey gets a phone call from Mother's Milk telling him about the trip to go meet up with Liberty. The thing is, that trip is going to take them to Raleigh, North Carolina. But Huey can sense there's something wrong with Starlight, and she reveals to him that she doesn't want to go back to the tower. He asks what happened, and she breaks down in his arms crying, saying, I can't do this anymore. So Huey doesn't really think he has a choice at this point, and he tries to bring Starlight with him. Although Mother's Milk is real hesitant to do that. But Annie tells him, I have a second cousin in North Carolina. Vaughn's just going to think that I'm visiting. And Huey makes the case that if we're going up against a soup, doesn't it make a lot of sense to have a soup of our own? So she's going on the trip with them. They stop off at a diner to grab food, and as they're leaving, there's a car accident. And Annie wants to jump in and help the car accident victims because she's a superhero. But Mother's Milk and Huey say, no, you can't do that. We're laying low. We're still wanted by the police. So against her better judgment, she's forced to leave. They stop off at a motel, and they have two rooms. Annie's going to stay in the one, and Mother's Milk and Huey stay in the other. But that night, Huey gets a text from Annie telling him kind of to meet her at the vending machine. And they start laughing about her awful taste in candy bars, although I do like Almond Joys. The rest of it was bad. And she brings up Mother's Milk's OCD, which Huey didn't notice before, but he's definitely got it. She then talks about the pressure that she feels being in the Seven and especially around Homelander, telling Huey that it feels like Homelander has a loaded gun pointed at her face, and he's around every corner waiting to kill her. And Huey asks, well, do you feel that way now? And she says no, and that's because the romance is back on. Huey and Starlight hook up that night. Now, that same night, Billy has made it into the compound somehow, probably just because he's Billy Butcher, but he is able to locate Becca. And he breaks into her car and makes it obvious that she's going to have to come out. And when she does, he asks, is there any place around here that doesn't have a million cameras? Because she's under heavy surveillance. And she lets him know of a location near a bridge and the two meet up there. And immediately they embrace in a hug. She lets him know that if Homelander catches him, he's going to kill him. The last time, the only reason why Homelander spared his life is because Becca told Homelander that she was going to kill herself in front of Ryan and she was going to blame Homelander for it. He tells her that he's there to break her out, and she says, how? And he says, over the fence, just the same way I came in. Problem is, she says, Ryan can't climb that fence, which is confusing to Billy because the kid's a soup. But then Becca tells him that she's not raising him like that. Yeah, he's got powers, but he's not really aware of them. And then she mentions that she can get snuck out by the garbage truck that passes by the house every day. And just like Huey and Starlight, the two end up having sex that night. Good for them. And during the pillow talk, you'll learn that she's been there since she's given birth. And after a while, you just kind of forget about reading the news or going to restaurants. But she's okay with it because her son is happy. She starts telling Billy how much she's going to like Ryan, but prefaces it by saying, I know you don't like kids. And he says, it's not that I don't like kids. I'm just not a good role model. And Billy feels really bad about the fact that she's been living there that entire time and he hasn't been able to save her. But Becca knew that if Billy found out about Homelander, he would just keep going after him, and it was dangerous for him. And speaking of Homelander, he had himself quite a day. He's getting more and more stressed out about this Stormfront situation, but he also made an executive change. He fired the A-Train from the 7, saying that he can't run anymore. He's probably the 20th fastest guy on the planet, and he knows that it has to do with his heart, and he's just concealing it. So they're going to bring in Shockwave. He then has an appearance with Queen Maeve on the Maria Menounos show, where she brings up the lack of diversity in Vault with Compound V, saying that most of the superheroes are white. All of a sudden, the interview turned into Frost Nixon, and Homelander wasn't prepared for that. So Homelander says, well, we have diversity. We have the A-Train. He's black. Of course, 
Maria doesn't know that he just got fired. And then Homelander says we have Black Noir, and he doesn't really identify with any race. And we even have a gay superhero. And this is news to Maria Menudos and everybody watching as he outs Queen Maeve, saying that Queen Maeve is a lesbian and proud of it, and has a girlfriend even. And as soon as they get off camera, Queen Maeve immediately says, where's Elena? What did you do with her? And Homelander says, Elena's fine. I just set her free. You guys were hiding in the shadows, and I brought you out in the light. Queen Maeve tries to say they're just friends, but Homelander did his homework and knows that ain't true. So it forces her to admit that, yeah, we had a relationship, but I ended it when I joined the Seven. I ended it when I met you, and Homelander snaps at her saying, stop lying to me. He's getting sick of everybody lying to him. And Queen Maeve admits, yeah, all right, we're together. And Homelander says, all right, well, best of luck to you both, which comes as a huge surprise to Queen Maeve, because even though he's saying it, she still doesn't believe that he's actually happy for her, probably because he's saying it with a very condescending tone. And as he's leaving the TV studio, he sees that Stormfront is live holding that rally for Vought, and she is mocking Homelander's Saving America campaign, which is really pissing Homelander off, because now she's making a mockery of him. Although Homelander isn't the only one with hatred in his eyes as he's watching Stormfront, because Kamiko has also made her way to the rally, and she wants revenge for her brother. And right before she's about to do something, Frenchie, who's been on a bender, grabs her arm and begs her to come with him, saying, it's not going to be worth it. You'll never get out alive. Now, the next day, the group of Starlight, Huey, and Mother's Milk make their way to that address, but they don't find Liberty there. They just find a woman named Valerie, and she does not want to talk about Liberty at all. And it takes a lot of convincing and a story about Mother's Milk's dad, but she finally lets them in. And the reason she didn't want them to come in initially was because she thought that they were from Vaught, but they proved to her that they're not. She tells the story of when she was a little girl, her brother was driving in the car one night with her in the back seat, and they got stopped by Liberty. And Liberty claimed that her brother had stolen the vehicle, although he didn't. And she started beating the shit out of her brother. All the while, Valerie's in the back watching it all go down, shocked. And her brother said, why are you doing this? Aren't you supposed to be a superhero? And Liberty says, I am a hero for killing a black piece of shit like you. And then she ends his life. Valerie wanted to go to the cops, but Valerie's parents said, what good would it do? So they took a buyout from Vaught of $2,000. But then she says, you have to promise me that you're not going to tell anybody what I told you. Because if she finds out that I opened my mouth, she's going to kill me. Huey tells her no one's heard from Liberty since the 70s. That woman's probably dead. But Valerie shakes her head saying, no. And then she grabs the newspaper, puts it down, and points to a picture of Stormfront and says, there, that's her. That's Liberty. So as the group is driving back from New York, they're trying to make sense of what they just heard. Huey's saying she was a little girl, it was raining, she could have been wrong, but Starlight is saying, ah, she seemed pretty certain, and we don't know what Compound V can do to the body. It could stop the aging process. So as the group is driving back to New York, Homelander is perusing the internet and seeing meme after meme just mocking him and praising Stormfront. So he goes into a dresser saying, who the hell do you think you are? I'm the leader of the seven. I still rate higher than you. And she tells him this constant need to be loved by everybody is kind of pathetic. You spent $270 million on this Saving America bullshit. I'm running circles around you with five guys in a laptop creating memes. You can't win the whole country anymore. No one can. You don't need 50 million people to love you. You need 5 million people pissed. Emotion sells. Anger sells. You have fans, but I have an army. She then caters to his ego, saying, I know you won't believe this, but I think you're the best of us. You just need a little help connecting with your audience. Change with the times. God knows I did, which is a good indication that she truly is Liberty. But Homelander doesn't take this advice too kindly, saying, I don't need to change with the times, and I don't need help connecting to my audience. And Homelander gets so upset that he goes to that happy place in the cabin with Doppelganger. But Doppelganger gets a little too creepy, and Homelander snaps, killing him. Now the next day is the day where Billy is going to escape with Becca, but when she shows up at the bridge, she's late and she doesn't have Ryan. And that's because she's not coming. She doesn't trust Billy whatsoever that he's not going to, quote, get rid of Ryan. Even though Billy says he's fine with Ryan being there, Becky can see it in his eyes. And after some more back and forth, you get the sense that she is right when he calls Ryan a little soup freak. And even though Becca wants to be with Billy, she's not willing to leave her child behind, which is something that Billy can't understand. So Becca gets in the car and leaves and says, you better get out of here too, because people are going to be here in about 60 seconds. And while one of those people isn't Black Noir, it's not Black Noir yet. Because Black Noir went to Vought's security team and quietly intimidated a girl to start checking security camera footages to find out where Billy Butcher is. And they found him flipping off a camera, because that's kind of his brand. And then finally, there's the Deep 
who headed back to Sandusky, Ohio, and is with Carol, and he's interviewing potential wives. And the one girl he really wants to marry because, well, she seems overly eager to please him. But Carol says, no, you're not marrying her. You're marrying this other girl. Right now, your desires don't matter. The public image matters. And if we're going to rehab your public image, it's vital that you have the right wife to do so. So the Deep continues to work his way back into the seven. In episode five, Frenchie is tailing Kimiko, and she heads into a bar where there's just a bunch of shady-looking gangster types, and she murders all of them. Frenchie then tails Kimiko to a church where she meets up with Cherry, because Kimiko has been taking jobs from Cherry, and this really pisses off Frenchie, who can't understand why she's going down this path. He tries to talk her out of doing these jobs, saying that you really shouldn't beat yourself up about what happened to your brother. It's not your fault. But she does, and she uses that made-up sign language to tell him this, to tell him that her brother was really the only person she cared about, and now he's gone because of her. The problem is, Frenchie doesn't know that made-up sign language, because she never bothered to teach him. And all of this boils over to Frenchie telling her, fuck you, go be the monster you want to be so badly. Now, Billy, meanwhile, gets a phone call from Huey, who lets him know what they found on Liberty slash Stormfront. He tells Billy that Starlight is currently looking into why exactly Liberty slash Stormfront will want to kill Rainer, and then he inquires as to what's going on with Becca. And Billy responds with, she's more beautiful than the day I met her which is not very Billy Butcher-ish, to the point where Huey says, where are you? And Billy lets him know that he's going to head off grid. And this kind of upsets Huey a little bit, and he tells him, well, you know, you could have said goodbye. And Billy says goodbye in his own way, but it freaks Huey out so much that he goes to Mother's Milk and says, I think something's wrong with Billy, because when I was on the phone with him, he was actually nice. And Mother's Milk says, tell me everything you heard on that phone call. And one of the things that Huey heard was a dog toy. And Mother's Milk knows that Billy keeps his dog at his Aunt Judy's place. And sure enough, that's where Billy went. So Mother's Milk and Huey head on over to Aunt Judy's place, and as soon as Billy sees him, he tries to kick him out. They headed there to get help with Stormfront, but they headed there more so because they're worried about Billy. Mother's Milk asks, where the hell's Becca? And Billy once again tries to kick him out of the house. But since they won't leave, Billy decides to leave. And when he gets in the car, he notices that in the rearview mirror, Black Noir is on the rooftop of a house across the street. So Billy heads back in immediately closing all the blinds and windows, apologizing to Aunt Judy for bringing this upon her, and letting the group know that Black Noir is there. He reveals to the group that Becca's not with him because she didn't want to leave, and Black Noir must have tailed him from Becca's place to his Aunt Judy's. But they need a plan, and to get a crowd going, Mother's Milk calls in a gas leak, which brings the fire department knocking on every door in the cul-de-sac. It buys them enough time to formulate a plan and make some pressure cooker bombs. But this is making Billy feel guilty because he knows that he's putting people's lives in danger. So he decides that he'll just go outside and give Black Noir what he wants. But Huey says, no, you can't do that. This causes a fight between Huey and Billy where insults are hurled at Huey's direction, but Huey's not moving. And when Billy says, am I going to have to make you move? Mother's Milk shows up behind him saying, you might be able to move him, but you're not going to be able to move me. So Billy Butcher's staying put. So the group sets the pressure cooker bombs around the house. They head down to the basement and they wait for Black Noir to show up. And while they're waiting for Black Noir to show up, Huey has a conversation with Aunt Judy. Because Aunt Judy compared him to someone named Lenny. And Huey wants to know, why exactly am I like Lenny? And you find out that Lenny is Billy's little brother that no one knew about. And Lenny was this nervous, skinny, nerdy-looking kid who used to get made fun of all the time. And Billy used to come to his defense. In one such instance, he was beating the shit out of a kid. No one can pull him off of him. And Lenny, who was bleeding from the face, calmly walked up to Billy and walked him away. Lenny was able to get Billy to be less Billy Butcher-like. He was like a calming influence on him. But unfortunately, Lenny isn't with us anymore. Although you don't find out exactly what happened to Lenny because one of the pressure cooker bombs goes off, interrupting Aunt Judy's story. And the pressure cooker bombs continue to go off, but Black Noir continues to walk forward. The group makes a run for it, and Billy tries to lock them out of the house, giving Black Noir what he wants. But right as Black Noir and Billy are about to go at each other, Mother's Milk makes his way back into the house, shooting at Black Noir, but doesn't affect Black Noir, and he just throws a knife at Mother's Milk, taking him out. Huey tries the same approach, shooting Black Noir to no luck. It does distract him enough for Billy to attack him, but not enough for Billy to do actual damage, and Black Noir throws him to the side. And as it looks like Black Noir is going to kill Huey, Billy steps forward saying, if you want to save your career, you're not going to touch any of us because I have pictures of Homelander's bastard child that you guys at Vought have been trying to keep quiet. And I don't think the world's going to like it when they find out that Homelander raped somebody and you guys have basically locked up the woman and child, trying to keep the story secret. And if you attack any of us, the pictures get uploaded to the cloud. But that's when Black Noir grabs Billy by the throat and jacks him up. Although he gets a phone call because Stan Egger is watching all of this via a body cam footage on Black Noir. And he has Black Noir hand Billy the phone, and he tells Billy that 
Those pictures can never see the light of day, so he's going to offer him a deal. Black Noir will walk away if those pictures never get uploaded. And Billy likes that deal, so Black Noir reluctantly has to put Billy down, and he walks away all pissed off that he didn't get to kill anybody. So Billy leaves his dog with Aunt Judy, and the group heads back. Now, the rest of the seven are busy filming the movie Dawn of the Seven, where they had to do some rewrites after Homelander outed Queen Maeve as being gay. And they're going heavy with that storyline in the movie. And this is something that Queen Maeve is not too thrilled about. She feels like Homelander is torturing her with this. And she goes to confront him about this, but Ashley runs up demanding to speak to Homelander privately because a video has leaked of Homelander going to a foreign country and killing a terrorist. But in the process, he killed a civilian as well. And because of this, there's a lot of public outrage about Homelander being a war criminal. To the point where there's a congresswoman who's been pretty anti vaught standing in Vought Square with an anti-Homelander protest. And Homelander doesn't really care about any of that, but what he does care about is his approval rating, which has tanked. He asks Ashley to schedule a press conference so he can clean it up himself, but that's not what Stan Egger wants to do. Vaught wants Homelander's comment to be a no comment at this time. And this infuriates Homelander. And what infuriates him even more is when Stormfront, who overheard this conversation, once again offers to help him, but he tells her, I don't need your help. And she responds with, well, it looks like you're doing a bang-up job by yourself. She then goes and films a scene with Queen Maeve and Starlight. And the director tells Starlight, hey, how about you act like you like Stormfront? Which Stormfront chuckles at, saying, of course you like me. You've been eye-fucking me all day. What's that about? And Starlight lies, saying, I just, I feel like you're a great actress. But Stormfront doesn't buy that at all. But after the scene, they break for lunch, and as Starlight is getting food, she notices her mother at a table talking to Stormfront. And she's been blowing off her mother, ignoring phone calls for weeks, not wanting to talk to her. So she's pretty curious of what her mother is doing there. And her mother apologizes, telling her she realizes now the damage that she did by injecting her with Compound V. And Stormfront tries to act like a mediator between the two, fixing the relationship. But Starlight doesn't want a relationship with her mother. Starlight looks at her mom and says, this is not the time or place to have this conversation. But Stormfront interjects, saying, look, we're all upset about Compound V. I mean, somebody was so upset that they actually leaked it to the press. I mean, could you imagine how angry that person is, whoever they are? And she stares right at Starlight. She then gets up saying, I'll let you two hash it out. But if it was me, I'd be grateful to have a mother like her. And walks away. But Starlight is not grateful to have a mother like her. And she doesn't really have any interest in hashing it out. And she tells her mom that she has to go work on another scene and walks away as well. Now, during that lunch break, Queen Maeve wasn't getting lunch. She was busy with Elena and Creative. Because they had this whole plan with Elena and Maeve being trailblazers for the gay community including having Elena dress kind of in boyish clothes. And Elena wants no part of this whatsoever. She doesn't want to be a made-up Ken doll for Vaught. And the fact that Maeve isn't defending her on this approach pisses off Elena even more to the point where she storms off saying, I'm not going to do this, I can't be bought. Maeve reassures both Ashley and Creative that she'll get Elena on board, and she runs after Elena telling her this is Homelander. And she warns Elena that if you go out there, I can't protect you, and there's nowhere that you go where he can't find you. And Elena asks, well, what are we going to do? And Maeve reassures her, we're going to take him down. And it's not like that statement was hollow because Maeve has a plan. And the plan involves the Deep. The Deep is continuing to go on his reclamation project, having married the girl that Carol wanted him to marry, taking the media rounds about how he's a changed man, and even making a commercial about how he's changed for the church, where he appears with the leader of the church, Alistair Adana. And Maeve finds him handing out books to the homeless as if they don't actually need food or anything. And she tells him, look, if you want any chance of getting in the seven, you're going to need a female to come out and say that you're not a complete piece of shit. And I can be that female as long as you help me out. Now, A-Train is also in this Dawn of the Seven movie, but he doesn't want to do the final scene where he leaves the seven. He wants to leave it more open-ended. And this causes a rift between him and the director where he's going to have to wait for Ashley's approval on this. And while he's doing so, he's talking to Stormfront about the Deep's reclamation project with the Church of the Collective and how she used to be a member of the church, but then they started letting anybody in. And the bigotry that was hinted at by that woman in South Carolina kind of shows itself because she's hinting at the fact that they started allowing black people in and they don't belong. And A-Train can sense that she's taking shots at him, but... Ashley shows up and the two walk off away from Stormfront and Ashley gives him an ultimatum. You can do the scene as scripted, leave the seven with your head held high and a nice severance package. Or you can fight this with no severance package where we let the world know that you injected yourself with compound V and gave yourself a heart attack. And that's not much of a choice. So in the new movie, The Dawn of the Seven, the A-Train announces that he is going home and leaving the Seven. And he does that scene with Homelander, and as soon as the scene is over, Homelander decides to take matters into his own hands about that protest, and heads to Vaught Square, 
shocking everybody, including the congresswoman. But it doesn't go as Homelander planned, because anything he says, the people in the square hear what they want to, and they flip it on him, to the point where they're all chanting at him, cursing him out. And Homelander has visions of just laser beaming all of them to death, but he can't do that, obviously. And it's at this moment that Homelander realizes that Stormfront might have been right. He's out of touch with his audience, and he needs help. So he reluctantly goes and visits Stormfront at her trailer, where she is on the phone with a nurse trying to convince him to do something to a 17-year-old kid, telling the nurse that, don't worry, he'll be a hero. And whatever the thing is, the nurse really doesn't want to do it. And Stormfront lets him know no one said this job was going to be easy, but no one's ever achieved anything without sacrifice. The two hang up, and that's when Homelander shows up knocking on the trailer door, needing help, and Stormfront gets her meme magicians to work, making a bunch of memes that are going to populate the internet, trying to get people back on Homelander's side. So while it seems like Homelander has kind of come around on Stormfront, Starlight has not, and she continues to dig on why Stormfront slash Liberty would want to kill Raynor. She sneaks into Stormfront's trailer, finds her laptop, figures out the password, and opens it up and finds a bunch of emails from a place called Sage Grove. And that is the same place that the nurse who was on the phone with Stormfront earlier was working at. She has to close the laptop pretty quickly because Stormfront comes back. And Stormfront goes, what are you doing in my trailer? And Starlight plays it off like she's there because she's so infuriated that Stormfront stepped into her personal life regarding her and her mother's relationship. She puts on a really good performance to which Stormfront even says, wow, Starlight, you don't suck. You can act. Look at you go. She then confronts her about leaking the information about Compound V to the press, asking, how do you think Vault's going to feel when I tell them that it was you who did that? And she responds with, well, how do you think the public's going to feel when they find out that you're actually Liberty? Stormfront kind of chuckles at this, saying, you know, I like you. You're going to be a big help to me, which is something that Starlight doesn't understand. But the two are interrupted by Homelander, and Starlight sees herself out, and Stormfront doesn't rat Starlight out about the whole Compound V thing. But Homelander is there to thank her because his approval rating is up. And he says, hey, I owe you one. And Stormfront decides to cash in on that, having this weird superhero sex thing where Homelander tries to laser off her tits, realizing that he really can't and she is incredibly powerful. But the two bang each other's brains out. In episode six, the relationship between Stormfront and Homelander is still going strong. They're doing press for the Dawn of the Seven and yucking it up. But when Homelander tries to get Stormfront in his trailer to, you know, do adult fun things, she says, no, I can't. I have to fly out to Vaught Tower for 20 minutes and meet with my PR team. But she reassures him that she'll be back, and when she does come back, they can, you know, do adult things. So he walks into the trailer where he had a surprise for her of a bouquet of flowers that he clearly got from 1-800-Flowers.com. Use promo code RECAPS. Just kidding, that won't work. But he just seems a little annoyed. Now, one person who is not on set that day for Dawn of the Seven is Starlight. And it's not an excused absence, but she's getting her chip removed by Frenchie. And after she does that in a painful, painful way, they head down to the Cash for Gold basement. And this is the first time she's seeing where Huey was living, and she's kind of disgusted by it. And this is the first time that she's seen Kimiko since their run-in when they freed Kimiko. And she's a little hesitant, not sure how Kimiko's going to respond, but Kimiko gives her a big hug to the surprise of just about everybody in the room. And while Kamiko is excited to see Starlight, Billy Butcher is not. Hurling a few insults her way and then asking Huey, why is she here? And she's arrived because she wants to give them the information she found out on Stormfront. That there were a bunch of emails from Stan Edgar in her inbox regarding this Sage Grove psychiatric facility. But she couldn't find out what they were about because Stormfront came in. So Billy says, all right, I guess we're heading to Looney Bin. And then invites Starlight to come along, which Huey's a little surprised about. But it's not out of the kindness of his heart. He's doing it because he figures that if they get caught by Vaught, Vaught's going to go after Starlight before they go after Billy Butcher and his team. Since Starlight has kind of become a traitor. So the group head on over to Sage Grove and dress up like orderlies. And Starlight busts a hole through the fence where Kimiko, Mother's Milk, and Frenchie head on in. Billy, Huey, and Starlight are on the outside keeping lookout. And Starlight gets sick of the way Billy Butcher is treating her. Even though Billy says he doesn't have a problem with her, he clearly does. And that's when she's had enough and goes off on him. Saying, you know how much I hate Vought, but it doesn't matter to you. And it's all because of something that's in my blood that I can't control. And under all of that swagger, you're just a bigot and a bully. And it reminds me of somebody I know who flies around with an American flag as a cape. Before Billy can even respond, though, they've got company. Because Stormfront flies over them and arrives at the entrance to Sage Grove. 
Huey is frantically trying to get a hold of Mother's Milk, but Mother's Milk, along with Kimiko and Frenchie, have made it into the control room. They trick the guard to opening up the door, shot him, and find themselves in front of the security camera screens, where they are absolutely perplexed as to what the hell is going on in this place. Because they basically have all of these soups locked up. And they all have different powers, but they also all look miserable. And that's when on one of the TV screens... They see Stormfront walk in with that orderly that she was talking to on the phone the other day. And right away, Frenchie goes, that guy looks really familiar. Does anybody know who he is? But nobody pays that comment much attention because Stormfront is checking up on one of the patients who has been able to levitate a ball. But the patient says, can I go home now? I mean, I want to see my family. And Stormfront tells him, no, you were put in here because you were a suicide risk. So the guy says, fine, well, I'm not going to do your little parlor tricks unless I get to talk to my sister. And Stormfront puts on a fake smirk and says, okay, I think we can arrange something, and leaves the room. And that's when Frenchie realizes who he is, because that orderly flips open a lighter and burns the kid. And Frenchie loses it, saying, holy shit, that's Lamplighter. And Frenchie has wanted revenge on Lamplighter for years now. But Mother's Milk stops him and says, whoa, 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 before we even think about that, we got to find out what the hell's going on here. So they grab all the hard drives, the security camera footage, and they wait for Huey to let them know that Stormfront has left. And when she does, they try to head out the front door the exact same way they came in. But they end up passing Lamplighter. And Frenchie just can't let it go. He makes eye contact with him and jumps out of the gurney, going to attack him. And Lamplighter does get fire off, but it ends up burning one of the doors that's keeping one of the locked up suits inside. And as the group are having a standoff, that soup steps out. And by Lamplighter's reaction, you can kind of tell she's not one to be messed with. Lamplighter is pleading with her, saying, you know, I like you. I gave you extra food the one time. Let's all be cool about this. And then she asks, who are your friends? To which Mother's Milk says, we're not his friends. But the problem is they're all dressed the same and she doesn't believe them. A security guard then comes from behind her and starts shooting her. But it doesn't affect her at all. And when she closes her fist, the guy explodes. And that's when you see why Lamplighter was so terrified of this girl and the group goes running. But instead of killing them all, she decides to open up everybody's cell door. Releasing all the soups to the room. And Lamplighter, along with the rest of the group, frantically make their way into a locked room. And Frenchie and him are about to go at it, but they then hear all of the commotion that's going on outside and realize there's probably a bigger issue at hand. So Mother Smoke tells Lamplighter, you can burn us, that's fine, but she she's a soup, and you're just going to piss her off. So how about we work together to get out of this because she can help you? But Lamplighter's not interested in that and says, you know what? I think I'll take my chances. And at that very moment, one of the soups that was locked up bursts through the door, mounts Lamplighter, and starts throwing up on him because his superpower is his throw-up is acid. He narrowly misses Lamplighter's face, and when the guy goes to throw up again, that's when Kimiko grabs him and kicks him in the stomach forcing all that acid throw up to go up in the air and land on his face and kill him. And that's when Lamplighter decides, all right, I guess you guys can come with me. Huey, meanwhile, is on the outside watching all of this go down via his binoculars, wondering what the hell is happening. And that's when the group is approached by one of those kids who got out. And the kid is telling Billy and Starlight, I don't want them to hurt me anymore. And Billy is telling him no one's going to hurt you, everything's okay. But his superpower is being able to force a sonic boom that throws everybody back, including their van. Billy gets up and shoots the kid to death, but they end up rushing over to the van to see if Huey's okay. And initially, he seems like he is, but then he collapses because Huey has been punctured in the stomach by something that was in his van, and he's in bad shape. And unfortunately, whatever that kid did when he used the sonic boom to throw the van affected the electrical circuits in it, and Starlight can't use the energy from the van to cauterize Huey's wound. So they realize they need to get Huey to a hospital ASAP, pick him up, and start walking to a road saying, you know what, the other group, they're on their own. And the other group has made it into the room of all of the medical supplies, which really excites Frenchie. But then Lamplighter starts antagonizing him, saying, hey, I saw you the night that I burned those kids. Why didn't you stop me? And Frenchie loses his shit and has to be restrained. And that's because you get a good look at Frenchie's backstory. Eight years ago, Frenchie, along with Cherry and his best friend Jay, robbed a bank, but they got caught. And Frenchie had been incredible at taking out soups. But the way he would do it was unique. For instance, there was one soup that had rage. So he created a bomb of a bunch of muscle relaxers and took that rage away. When he gets caught, though, he's approached by Mallory. And she says, you're looking at about 25 years or you could come work for me. And Frenchie tells her to piss off, saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. But then she tells him that his two friends are locked up in a really tough prison. And the only way to get them to go free is by taking her offer and a work for her. So Frenchie feels like he doesn't have a choice and he takes the deal. He gets teamed up with Billy and Mother's Milk. And about three years after that first encounter... They finally get their first in with the Seven, when Mallory has gotten some kind of dirt on Lamplighter. And she calls Lamplighter a private meeting where she shows him what she has on him and says, all right, from now on, you're going to tell us everything that happens in the tower. 
And Billy speaks up saying, especially with Homelander. She gives Lamplighter her card saying, don't act like you have a choice, and he storms off. As soon as he leaves, though, Mallory says, I don't like this. I don't like putting an animal in a corner. But Billy says, screw him. We own the guy now. She then instructs Frenchie to tail him. And Frenchie does that, following him to a party. But then he gets a phone call from Cherry telling him that Jay is overdosed and they need him ASAP. So when Lamplighter walks into the party, Frenchie left. And he's able to revive Jay, but he can't stay with him. He has to leave. And that really upset Cherry and Jay. And when he got back, Lamplighter was gone. He'd lost his trail. And that's when Lamplighter burned Mallory's grandchildren, killing them. So that's the backstory with Frenchie. And it's one of the reasons why he gets so upset when this topic is brought up. But after cooler heads prevail, he tells the group his plan to take all of these meds and make a knockout bomb, even for soups. But something's been bugging him for years. Why are they still alive? Because after that night, they went underground for months, expecting the Seven to retaliate because they always retaliate. But they never came. And Lamplighter tells him, you're nobody. You're not worth it. But then Frenchie looks at him and says, you didn't tell him, did you? I figured you'd boast about it to Homelander. It must have been thrilling for you. And Lamplighter takes exception, saying, I'm not an animal. But Frenchie goes, only an animal would do what you did. You burned innocent children as they screamed for their mother. And Lamplighter is continuing to tell him to shut up until finally he gets pissed off screaming at him, I didn't know. It was supposed to be your boss. I didn't know they were going to be in that bed. I didn't know it was them until they started screaming, but by then it was too late. So after this airing of grievances, Lamplighter reveals what they're actually doing at Sage Grove. And it's that Vaught is trying to stabilize Compound V. Babies take to it best, and adults, it's a crapshoot. But what Vaught is trying to do is get it so if an adult is injected with Compound V, they get a stable suit, stable powers. And while that doesn't make much sense because it would kill Vaught's entire thing with movies and action figures and all that, Lamplighter doesn't really know why they're doing it. He's just told to burn the evidence. They then hear something outside, though, and this, like, fleshy arm comes bursting through the window and is choking mother's milk. Kamiko takes it out, and you find out that that's not a fleshy arm. It's something you'd find on the darkest recesses of Pornhub.com. But it did open the door and give them an out. So they start making their way through the facility trying to find a way out. But they almost run into the girl with the ability to just close her fist and kill people. So they gingerly make their way into a separate room. And Frenchie throws that knockout bomb. And it starts to go off but she closes her hand and kind of crushes the bomb. And as she makes their way closer and closer to the group, Stormfront arrives. Taking her out. And then screaming for Lamplighter. And the group kind of gestures to Lamplighter not to go, but he does so anyway. And she says, what the hell happened? I just killed six test subjects outside. But instead of ratting them out, he says that the head doctor got the dosage wrong. A couple of them got out, and the doctor got killed in the process. She tells him to clean up the mess, and she's going to go see if anybody else got out. And they're not the only ones who got out, because the girl with that incredible power, she also got out, and she ends up hitchhiking down the road. The group then steals an ambulance, heads into the woods and hunkers down, and waits for Mallory to arrive. And while they're waiting for her to arrive, Frenchie apologizes to Kamiko for trying to fix her because he realized that she never asked to be fixed. But Mallory arrives and immediately she wants vengeance on Lamplighter. She can't figure out why he's not arrested or dead. And it's because he actually wanted to come. He's begging her to do it. Put him out of his misery. Shoot him. But Frenchie begs for his forgiveness, telling Mallory that he wanted him dead almost as much as Mallory did. But he's begging for his life because to kill him would be to put him out of his misery. All she'd be doing is ending his torment. She can never be able to punish him as much as he already punishes himself. And she then asks, all right, well then what are you proposing we do with him? But you don't get an answer to that. You do get an answer to what happened to Huey. Because Starlight and Billy had made their way to a road and Starlight had flagged down a car. And Billy told the guy that he worked for the FBI. But when the guy dare ask for identification... Billy didn't want to give it to him because he didn't have any. And the guy says, I'll drive your buddy to the hospital, but I'm not giving you my car. We're in the middle of nowhere. And when Billy says, fine, have it your way, the guy pulls a gun on him. And you can tell this guy is nervous, probably had never used a gun before in his life, trying to stand up to Billy Butcher. And Starlight is trying to de-escalate the situation, but it's not working. Until finally, she has to throw the guy back with her powers. And unfortunately, the guy dies, and Billy grabs the car keys, and the group heads off. And while in the car, Billy thanks Starlight for doing what she did back there, but Starlight does not want to be friends with this guy. They then arrive at the hospital, admit Huey, and find out that it's going to be about three days in there, but he's going to make a full recovery. And that's when you finally get a breakthrough between Starlight and Billy Butcher, because they bond over the fact of their love of Huey, his adorable little quirks, but the fact that he won't give up on people. Now, when Stormfront made it back to set that day, what she found was a burnt up set, because Homelander got so pissed off, that he ended up burning his trailer along with a couple other pieces on the set. And she asks Homelander, is everything okay? But he says, well, I went to Vaught Tower and you weren't there. And she kind of gets pissed off, saying, are you checking up on me? But he chokes her, saying, why would I have to check up on you? 
And later that night, she heads to his place where he's still pissed off. And she says, you're right. I'm sorry I lied to you. I won't do it again. And I'll start telling you the truth, starting with this. She walks over to a chest and opens it up and has a bunch of stuff in there, including her Liberty outfit. And she pulls out a bunch of pictures. She shows him one of her with an old woman. And he says, who is this, your mother? And she says, no, it's my daughter. She died of Alzheimer's a couple years ago. And Homelander says, how old are you? Realizing that he's been having sex with a senior citizen. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And she tells him that she was born in 1919 Berlin. She grew up during the Nazi regime and hung out with some pretty powerful people, including Frederick Vaught, the founder of Vaught. Because Stormfront was literally the first superhero. She ended up falling in love with him and marrying him, but she attributes Frederick Vaught's success to everything she has in life. And Homelander starts to walk away, processing all of this information, and she yells at him that we're in a war for the culture. The other races are grinding us down, and they're taking what is rightfully ours. But we can fight back with an army of supermen in the millions, because that is Vaught's true destiny. But that group needs a leader, and that leader could be Homelander. She tells Homelander that Homelander is everything that her and Frederick Vaught dreamed of. And that's why she loves him with all of her heart. Everybody else that she loved is in the ground. He's really the only one left. And since power is an aphrodisiac, he starts making out with her. Now, I do want to give you guys an update on what happened with Queen Maeve, the Deep A-Train. And as Queen Maeve was waiting to shoot a scene, the Deep came into her trailer and gave her what she requested from him. He used his friends in the ocean to find a tape of the plane crash where Homelander refused to save anybody on board. And he gives it to Maeve, and Maeve says, if you want to be in the Seven, you won't speak a word of this. But later that night as she's taking a shower, Elena finds the video and starts watching it, and she's horrified. And Queen Maeve comes out of the shower and finds her watching it and says... I'm going to show it to Homelander, and he's either going to leave us alone or I'm going to put it on CNN. And she starts to kind of explain herself in that situation, saying how she should have done more, but she was scared. But she's also mortified at the look that she is getting from Elena. Now, the Deep had run into A-Train as he was leaving set that day. And he tells A-Train how he feels bad for him, because if anybody knows what it's like to get kicked out of the 7, it's him. But A-Train plays it off like, no, it's fine. My reps are talking to Nike and Under Armour. It could end up being a really good thing for me. So the Deep says, oh, okay, well, I guess you don't need his help then, and he starts walking away. But Curiosity gets the best of A-Train, and he says, whose help? And that's when the Deep pulls out a fresca, because he was talking about the Church of the Collective, and he invites him to lunch with Alistair Adana. And while the church isn't really something he's into, I mean, a guy's got to eat, so free food and free fresca, right? But when Alistair asks what's on the Deep's mind, the Deep starts telling him out. He's always kind of resented A-Train because A-Train looked down on him, and this takes A-Train completely by surprise. And A-Train gets up and says, oh, no, I'm not into this shit. I've seen the documentaries on you guys. I'm out. But Alistair says, for a man in seven-figure debt, a heart condition, and that's going through heavy withdrawal, do you think you had the luxury of walking away? And the A-Train is shocked that Alistair knows this, demanding to know who told him that. But Alistair says, well, the church knows all. But don't worry, the church also knows how to be discreet for its members. He then tells them how they're going to give Shockwave his uniform, because the name A-Train is a trademark that's owned by Vaught, and he is just a kid from Chicago who's broke at the moment. But Alistair tells him that he can help him get back into the Seven, just like he's going to help Deep get back into the Seven. Deep's approval numbers have already gone up since he joined the Church of the Collective. But until he starts to help him, he's going to have to sit there and listen to Deep, quote, tell him his truths. In Episode 7, Lampletter has agreed to testify in front of Congress, And because of that, Mallory has kind of agreed to bury the hatchet with him, which Billy can't understand. But they bring Lamplighter to meet with Congresswoman Newman, who has been a staunch proponent of Vaught, and is attempting to take them down for the Compound V stuff. But after talking with Lamplighter, Newman lets Mallory know, in front of Billy, by the way, that while Lamplighter will make a good witness, it's not enough, because they can just spin the narrative that he's a disgruntled ex-soup. So while it's a good start, they need more, and what they need is to find out exactly why they were doing what they were doing at Sage Grove. She says, if we're going to take a shot at the king, we can't miss. So the meeting ends, and Grace tells Frenchie to tailor, making sure that the congresswoman is okay, and telling Frenchie, this time, do not leave your post. Now, Huey, after getting patched up, lets everybody know that he's good to go. He can come with them. But Billy says, no, we have a more important task for you. And that job is to watch porn with Lamplighter. Make sure that nothing happens to him. And while Huey isn't really in the mood to watch porn with another guy, he doesn't seem to have a choice in the matter. Now, Billy was planning on heading out with Mother's Milk and Mallory, but he gets a phone call and answers it. And his mother's on the other line telling him that she's in New York and his dad is dead. So Billy heads off to meet with his mom, and as soon as she opens the door, she says, please don't hate me, because his dad isn't actually dead. She just wanted to arrange a meeting because his dad really is not doing well, and she knew that Billy was never going to meet with him unless it was extreme, extreme circumstances. 
Even then, he wants to leave, but at the behest of his mom, he stays. And the conversation does not go well because his dad is a douchebag. You kind of see where Billy Butcher got that rough exterior. And you do find out that his brother ended up committing suicide. And his dad actually blames his brother for it, saying that he wasn't as tough as Billy. And that's why he offed himself. And Billy snaps, choking his frail father, but finally giving up and walking away. The sad part is his father actually credits himself with making Billy as tough as he is. Now, Mallory and Mother's Milk headed off to Dr. Vogelbaum's house because they want him to testify in front of Congress. I mean, he was in charge of Vaught for a long time. He had to know what was going on, but he plays dumb when they bring up the Sage Grove project, telling him that he's not going to help because at this point, there's no real reason to help them. He's got his family now, and that's the most important thing. And as they're leaving, Mallory tells Mother's Milk, you know he's right. Get your family and get out of here. I can put you on a plane to Nicaragua. But Mother's Milk says, yeah, no, we'll do that when this is finished. And she says, no, you don't understand. It's never going to be finished, ever. And at the end of it, Vaught's still going to be standing. And all you're going to have is your family. So get out while you can. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he calls Billy to give him an update on how the meeting with Vogelbaum went. And obviously, it didn't go that great. So Billy says, all right, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And he does. He ends up going to Vogelbaum's place and guilt tripping him for the fact that he hid away Becca Butcher as long as he did, but then also threatening him with his family if he doesn't help him. And Vogelbaum feels like he doesn't have a choice, so he reluctantly agrees to testify in front of Congress. Now, one person missing from this mission is Starlight, because she has met up with her mom, and her mom is apologizing for everything that happened, and Starlight is explaining her side of things, when all of a sudden the cafe that they're in is attacked. And it's attacked by Black Noir who ends up knocking Starlight out and throwing her in a cell in Vaught Tower that is soup-proof. And unfortunately, she can't use any of the electricity in the room to bust out, so she's just trapped. And this news about Starlight makes national news, as both Homelander and Stormfront are addressing a large crowd of pro Vaught people, and they're trying to drum up support for more soups, more Compound V, continuing the fear-mongering tactics. But then Homelander says, well, I do need to tell you guys, we did have a mole in the Seven. It was Starlight, and she's been apprehended so she can't hurt anyone anymore. But as soon as the meeting is over, Homelander tells Stormfront that he doesn't like this. He thinks that they just should have killed Starlight. He underestimated her before, and it was a mistake. But Stormfront says, don't worry. Stormfront is trending. Pro-Compound V people are trending. Having a common enemy is a good thing. But then something in the crowd catches Stormfront's eye, and it's a little baby. And Homelander notices it, and she says, that was my daughter about 80 years ago. She looked just like it. And Homelander feels like this is a really good time to take their relationship to the next step and introduce Stormfront to his kid. So they fly off to meet up with Ryan, and Rebecca is not happy at all that they just showed up uninterrupted. And when she voices this, Stormfront of all people actually snaps back. That's his son. He has a right to see him whenever he wants to. So they go in and they see what Ryan likes to do, which is recreate his mom's favorite movies with Legos. And Stormfront says, don't you like anything that normal kids like? 2K, PewDiePie? What about your dad's movies? But Ryan had no idea his dad was even in movies. And Ryan asks his mom, can I watch them? But she says, ah, when you're a little bit older. But once again, Stormfront oversteps her bounds and says, Ah, he's old enough now. And that's when Rebecca has had enough and demands to talk to Homelander in private outside. And she starts to kind of try to explain her parenting tactics, but Homelander says, I was that kid. I was sheltered. And you know what's going to happen when he gets out in the real world? He's going to be shocked. He needs to know the truth. But she pleads with him that he needs to stay with her. And it seems like they're in agreement. So she goes inside and makes lasagna. But when she comes out, she finds that Ryan is pissed off at her. Because Homelander and Stormfront took him up in the sky and showed him that he has been trapped in a compound. His own little Ryan Truman show. And he's pissed at his mom for lying to him. She tries to tell him that they can talk about it later, but Ryan yells at her, I hate you, and Homelander says, I think he just needs some space. Rebecca says, no, I think he needs his mother, and Stormfront says, don't worry, he'll still have a mom. I mean, the gall of this woman. Ryan ends up running into Homelander's arms, and they take off, leaving Becca just crying. But back with the group, as I said, that news about Starlight has made national news, and Huey finally gets the remote from Lamplighter and ends up changing the channel from porn to the news and sees it and immediately freaks out, trying to get in contact with Billy, but Billy's not answering. And Lamplighter thinks he knows where they're holding Starlight, if she's even alive, but saying the whole time, yeah man, she's probably dead. Huey, though, makes an impassioned plea for Lamplighter to come help him get her out of there, saying, they screwed you over and they're screwing her over the same way. 
You wanted to do some good. This is probably your final chance to actually do that. So Lamplighter and Huey take off the Vought Tower, and Lamplighter shows them a place where they used to sneak in girls back in the day. And luckily for the two of them, Lamplighter's handprint still works, so he's able to access all of the tunnels in Vault Tower. He takes them to the area of Vault Tower where he thinks they're holding Starlight, but when he opens the door, Huey goes, this is the conference room, what are we doing here? And Lamplighter is really upset that they replaced his statue, saying, I wanted to do this in front of my statue. I really just wanted to make my dad proud. And Huey looks at him saying, what are you talking about? And that's when Lamplighter commits suicide by lighting himself on fire. Huey is shocked and disturbed. But when Lamplighter did that, it set off the fire alarm, which set off a series of lights in the building that Starlight was able to use the power from to bust out of her cell. And as she's cautiously making her way through Vault Tower trying to find her mom, Black Noir shows up once again and the two get into a fight. Starlight tries to hold him off, but Black Noir gets the best of her and is choking her out. And she does end up blacking out, but she comes to to find that Queen Maeve has shown up and has Black Noir in a headlock. She then unwraps an Almond Joy and sticks it in his mouth because Black Noir has a tree nut allergy. So it turns out that Starlight's favorite candy bar just saved her life. And as Starlight and Queen Maeve make their way out of the conference room, Starlight begs her to come with her, but she says no. And that's because Queen Maeve has had quite a day. She showed up at her apartment to find that Elena is leaving her. Elena just can't get the visual of that little girl on the plane being left for dead. And she knows it's not Queen Maeve's fault, but she just can't do this anymore. So Queen Maeve went off and had a threesome with two dudes. And when Ashley found her, she wasn't happy because it's not very lesbian to have sex with two dudes. Apparently. I don't know, it's 2020, I think it should be open to everybody, but whatever. And Ashley was trying to do damage control, but finally Queen Maeve said, Ashley, can you just be a fucking human for once? And to her credit, Ashley does apologize for what Queen Maeve is going through. But even after all that, Queen Maeve isn't willing to just turn her back on Vought. So Queen Maeve and Starlight go their separate ways. And Starlight runs into Huey, who has freed Starlight's mom, mind you, using Lamplighter's hand that he cut off. And immediately she is shocked that Huey is in front of her, saying, what are you doing here? But Huey kind of gives that look like, uh, I'm here to save you and she's all about that so everybody kind of gets back together and Mother's Milk is reaming Huey out for allowing Lamplitter to commit suicide and Mallory's kind of freaking out because that was their star witness when she calls Billy Billy says don't worry I've got it covered and it's a good thing because the next day is the hearing in front of Congress and right before the hearing starts Homelander looks at Ashley and says have we heard anything about Starlight? But Ashley says, no, she's off the grid. So the hearing starts, and Congresswoman Newman calls her surprise witness, Dr. Vogelbaum, and he starts to swear that he's going to tell the truth, but all of a sudden, the head of the hearing's head explodes, to the surprise of literally everybody. And then one by one, heads in the room just start popping off, just like Rainer's. And the Congresswoman is frozen still in shock, and Mallory is able to finally get her out of there, head intact. But really, the only people that don't seem all that surprised about what's going on and are just kind of taking it all in are Homelander and Stormfront. But with just about everybody in the room dead, including Soups, mind you, Billy Butcher's group, who is watching it back in the Cash for Gold basement, is left amazed and shocked and wondering what the hell they're going to do now. Now, one group that we haven't talked about is the Deep and the A-Train, who showed up at Alistair Adana's birthday party, and they're having a ball. I mean, there's a band. There's Fresca flowing. There's a photo booth. And Alistair comes up to the both of them and thanks them for coming and lets them know that plans are in place to get both of them back in the seven because he's having a meeting this week with Stan Edgar. And while it's not a done deal, with the mole of Starlight, they need people they can trust. So he tells them to pack their bags. He then asks what their thoughts are on Eagle the Archer. And the Deep starts praising him, saying he's like a brother. He was there for him when he was at his weakest point. But Alistair lets him know that he has a cancer and they cannot talk to him anymore. And what you find out is that this cult wanted Eagle the Archer to stop talking to his mom. And when he refused to do that, they leaked this really embarrassing video of him. So he came out against the church. The church came out against him. And the Deep actually thinks he's in the wrong for this, which A-Train says, you just said he was your friend, but this is what happens when you get brainwashed. In the season finale, the event on Capitol Hill has left the nation pretty frightened. And because of it, the president is about to announce that he's going to release Compound V to the public with military members and first responders getting it. So Mallory, along with Congresswoman Newman, go to the Secretary of Defense and try to plead with him that they shouldn't be doing this. And Newman makes the point that this has to be vaught. It has to be a coup. Even though they killed their own people, they're doing this because it ups their stock price. I mean, the U.S. government has ordered tons of Compound V because of this initiative. And while the Secretary of Defense believes her and agrees with both of them, the problem is 
neither of them have proof. And without concrete proof, and I'm talking concrete proof, there's nothing he can do. He has to go along with the president's order. Now, I mentioned how everybody was scared, and that doesn't exclude Billy and his group. Starlight sends her mother away from the cash for gold basement, and then heads down to find Huey, who is trying to plead with the group not to just go after the soups and kill all of them to actually do this the right way. But they've tried that, and they're sick of that approach. So they're loading up to kill Stormfront, Homelander, the whole gang. And Starlight says, well, what if I testify? The issue with that is she's still a wanted fugitive, but she thinks she knows somebody who would be willing to testify. So she tells them, give us the day, grabs Huey, and heads off with him. And as they're driving to this place, she finally confronts Huey about the fact that he's not a 52-year-old man, but he listens to a ton of Billy Joel. Why is that? And it takes him coercing, but he reveals that his mother used to listen to Billy Joel with him all the time. And his mother left him when he was six years old. Just got up and decided, you know what, I'm done with these people. So by listening to Billy Joel, it's kind of the one connection that he still has with his mother. They finally arrive at the person's place that Starlight thinks will testify, and that person is Queen Maeve. And Queen Maeve has continued to go on her bender after Elena has left her and she's not in a great mood to talk. She immediately starts kind of insulting Huey out of the blue, but Starlight lets it go, saying, we need you to testify on the record against Vought, Homelander, everything. And unfortunately, she's their last chance, but she says no. And it's not because it's a suicide mission, it's because she's tired. She's tired of trying because it's not going to matter in the end. And Starlight continues to try to get her to go along with this mission, but she curses them out and forces them to leave. So that didn't work. And as Billy and his team just sat in the Castro Gold basement waiting for word from Huey and Starlight, they get an unexpected visitor in Becca Butcher. Becca escaped the Vaught compound, and she remembers Billy saying that he lived in a cash for gold basement, and she was able to locate it. And she's kind of come hat in hand, praying that Billy would be willing to help her get Ryan back. So they escort her down to the basement, where Mother's Milk and Frenchie are treating her like gold, because they've heard so many stories about her, but they've never met her. But Billy kind of shoos them away and reassures her that he will find Ryan, and he's going to make some calls. And the call he makes is to Stan Edgar, who just got out of a lunch with Alistair Adana, and they were talking about the Seven. And Alistair brings up letting the Deep back into the Seven, telling Stan Edgar about all the great work they've done and how his Q rating is through the roof. And Stan actually seems open to that. But then Alistair brings up the A-Train, and Stan says, no, letting back one guy, that's one thing. Letting back two, it seems desperate. And also, there's the Stormfront situation, because she doesn't like A-Train. And Alistair asks why she doesn't like A-Train, but Stan kind of chuckles to himself, saying... You know why. She was one of your grandfather's worst followers in this church, which means you have a file on her, which means that you know why she has a problem with A-Train. I shouldn't have to tell you. But instead of acknowledging that comment, Alistair just says, all right, well, the deep is still a win. And they get up, shake hands, and agree that Alistair's office will contact Edgar's office, and they go their separate ways. But unbeknownst to the both of them, A-Train was in the closet listening to this the whole time, and he is pissed off. But as Stan Edgar is leaving that lunch, he gets a call from his secretary telling him that Billy Butcher is on the phone, and it's a life or death matter. And it all has to do with Ryan, who is in Vaught Tower, and he spent the entire day with Ashley, kind of bored out of his mind a little bit. Ashley had to babysit him because Homelander was still trying to figure out this whole terrorist situation that has people's heads popping off. And the issue that he's trying to wrap his brain around is the fact that it wasn't him and he knows it wasn't Stormfront. So who is it? And the name he's come up with is it has to be Stan Edgar. And Stormfront makes a racial comment saying, well, maybe, I mean, he is pretty smart, even for his kind. But Stormfront doesn't really care about this, saying to Homelander that this situation is a win. They're going to release Compound V to the public and they're going to get what they want, an army of soups. And they're going to make sure that the good people get Compound V. But Homelander says, what, you just think a billion people are going to stand by and let that happen? But she reassures him, don't worry, Frederick had an answer for everything. They also get some unfortunate news on Black Noir that he's basically brain dead after his little allergic reaction. So that's why Homelander couldn't really spend a lot of quality time with Ryan. And when they find him, Ryan's kind of sad and asks if he can call his mom. And Stormfront sits down next to him and says, you know, I think it's time for a field trip. And both Stormfront and Homelander take him to this cheesy restaurant called Planet Vaught. And when they walk through the door, they're immediately besieged upon people wanting autographs and selfies. And since they're in the public, they're more than happy to take them. The issue is Ryan is a little overwhelmed by this and is feeling very claustrophobic. And when Homelander notices that, he picks up Ryan, takes him out, and flies off. Homelander takes him to that cabin where he used to hang out with Doppelganger at and lets him cool off for a bit. But when Stormfront shows up, the two head in there and talk to Ryan, and he apologizes for how he acted at the restaurant, 
but just says it was a lot for him. And Homelander sits down next to him and tells him that, yeah, when he was a kid and he got brought out in the public, he was terrified. But maybe one day they can fly off together. And Ryan looks at him and says, I know you want me to be like you, but I'm not. And Homelander tells Ryan, I didn't just come out and start flying one day. I had to teach myself how to do it. But luckily for you, you have me who can help teach you. So they start trying to work on his powers. And while Ryan is training, Huey and Starlight are planning on their next move. When all of a sudden the A-Train popped into their car. And they're a little freaked out, immediately pull over and ask how the hell he found them. But he reminds them, he's the fastest guy in the world. It took him about 20 minutes. He just ran around the city. And the reason he showed up is because he gives them a file. The same file that Stan Edgar was talking about to Alistair Adana that was in the Church of the Collective's archives on Stormfront. And it reveals everything that we already know about her, about the fact that she's a Nazi. And Huey asks, why did you do this? And he did it for one simple reason, to get back in the Seven. If she's out, he feels like it's his opportunity to get back in. But he tells them, I didn't give this to you. You found this on your own. And then he runs off. So while they've been just handed this bombshell information, they head back to the cash for gold place to show it to Billy. But Billy is meeting with Stan Edgar. And it all has to do with where Ryan is. Vault's very interested in Ryan because he's their safety net for Homelander. And both Billy and Stan Edgar strike a deal that Billy will get Ryan back. And when he does that, he's going to call Vaught and they're going to send soldiers pinging his location on his cell phone. They're then going to pick up Ryan and take him away. And Billy's going to get his wife back. But Edgar says, wait, hold a second. The whole point of this was so he's raised by his mother. I mean, what are you going to do when she's banging on my door wanting to be reunited with her son? And Billy tells him, well, in that case, you'll tell her that it's the only way to keep him safe from Homelander. And then they shake on it. Billy heads back to the Cash for Gold place where Huey and Starlight show him the file on Stormfront. And it's huge. And they then prepare to send it off to the media. But with Stan Edgar's help, they've got the location of where Ryan is. And Billy tells the group, look, this is my thing. You don't have to come if you don't want to. But they all agree they're going to go and help. And that includes Becca Butcher, who used to be in the army and is a pretty good shot. But Billy doesn't want her to go, but it's her kid. She's going to go. And she makes Billy swear on his dead brother that Billy will get Ryan back to her no matter what because Ryan cannot grow up like Homelander did he's a good kid he deserves better and Billy swears so the group goes off to the cabin and starts going through the steps of their plan to get Ryan back and Ryan is busy with both Homelander and Stormfront trying to use his powers unsuccessfully and Stormfront tells him that they're gonna need him because they're at war there are people that hate them just because of the color of their skin and it's a white genocide and that comment kind of raises Homelander's eyebrows a bit, but then all of a sudden Stormfront's phone starts going berserk, and that's because news has gotten out that she is a Nazi. And not just that she's a Nazi, but that she was Frederick Vaught's wife, and she's like a hundred years old. So she races back to Vaught Tower, and that was step one, getting Stormfront away from Ryan. Step two is getting Homelander away from Ryan, and they do that by luring him out when they set off this terrible frequency with a bunch of speakers that hurt Homelander's ears, hurt Ryan's ears, and Homelander takes off to investigate where this sound is coming from and to stop it. And when he does that, the group jumps into action. Billy and Becca run into the cabin and Becca grabs Ryan. And Ryan is thrilled to see Becca. But then he notices Billy and says, whoa, who's that guy? And Becca lets him know that's my husband. They then get in the car and head off, but they stop and Billy tells Mother's Milk to take Becca and Ryan and go. But That wasn't part of the plan. And Becca certainly doesn't want to leave without Billy. But Billy lets her know that he had made a deal with Stan Edgar to just leave Ryan there. But when it came time to actually go through with it, he couldn't do it. And there's a bunch of Vought soldiers heading their way. So because of that, they're running out of time and she doesn't have a choice. He instructs Mother's Milk to take her and Ryan, meet up with Mallory, and get them both to safety. He then instructs Becca to just raise him right. And as Mother's Milk is driving both Ryan and Becca to safety, Stormfront reappears, throwing their car off the road. And when that happens, Billy races over to the car to make sure everybody's okay. And luckily for Billy, he's not even on Stormfront's radar because she's noticed that Starlight is with them and says, I'm assuming it was you who sent all those lies to the media. But Starlight reminds her, they're not lies. And Storm Stormfront says, well, people love what I have to say. They believe in it. They just don't like the word Nazi, which literally just proved that the pictures were in fact real. I don't know why she bothered lying about it. Now, this conversation is distracting Stormfront from the car, and Billy has gotten Mother's Milk, Becca, and Ryan out, and Mother's Milk tells Billy, go, get out of here. We'll take care of Stormfront. And Billy, Becca, and Ryan head off into the woods. So Mother's Milk heads back and joins the group who is arguing with Stormfront, where during the conversation, Kamiko just starts laughing. And Stormfront says, what are you laughing about? 
and Kamiko signs to Frenchie that she's going to kick her ass. And both Stormfront and Kamiko go and attack Stormfront. And at first, they're doing a pretty good job, but eventually Stormfront is just too powerful for them both. She snaps Kamiko's neck, throws Starlight back, and is about to kill just about everybody when Queen Maeve shows up and punches her in the face. Starlight then goes to join the front, and Kamiko has unsnapped her neck, and the three women start beating the shit out of Stormfront. Because in the end, girls do it better. And Stormfront's getting her ass kicked so badly that she actually flees off into the sky. But she doesn't fly to Vaught Tower, she flies and cuts off Billy, Ryan, and Becca. And she immediately throws Billy to the side and tells Ryan to come with her. But as she inches closer and closer to Ryan and Becca, Becca pulls out a knife and stabs her in the eye. And when that happens, she rips the knife out of her eye and then starts choking Becca to death. Telling her something that we heard before, I like to see the lights go out. Ryan is begging her to stop, and Billy tries to attack her, but to no avail. And this is when we see Ryan finally use his powers. He's not just able to take Stormfront out, he's able to obliterate her. She's got no arms, no legs, she's fried, and she's just mumbling German to herself. The issue is, he doesn't know how to harness his powers, and when he took Stormfront out, he also blew a hole in his mom's artery in her neck. And Billy sees Becca bleeding profusely and goes to be with her, telling her to hold on, it'll be alright. But with her last dying word, she tells Billy, remind Ryan that this is not his fault. Keep him safe. Promise me that. But then Becca ends up passing away. And Billy looks over at Ryan and he's apologizing profusely and Billy gets really, really pissed off. But then they both are joined by Homelander who slaughtered all of those soldiers that Vaught were sent to pick up Ryan to find the location of his son. And he asks Ryan if he's the one who killed Stormfront and Ryan says, I didn't mean to. He then gestures to Ryan for him to come with him but Ryan surprisingly doesn't go with Homelander instead choosing Billy. And right before Homelander is about to kill Billy, Queen Maeve shows up right behind him saying that you're going to let him go you're going to leave me alone. You're going to leave everybody alone. And then shows him the reason why he's going to do all this. Showing him the videotape of Homelander leaving all of those people to die on the plane. Homelander tells her, I'm just going to attack you and everybody you love. And she says, you know what, that's fine. Because when this video gets out, nobody will ever love you ever again. And everybody will know what a monster you really are. And since Homelander's public perception means the world to him, he reluctantly lets Billy and Ryan walk away. Now, Queen Maeve, Homelander, and Stormfront head back to Vault Tower where Stan Edgar is holding a press conference. And much like earlier when he pinned all of the blame on Madeline Stilwell, he's doing that once again, putting all of the blame on the heads popping off on Capitol Hill to Stormfront, saying she was rogue. He also mentions that they will not be releasing Compound V to the public. And then he moves aside and gives the podium to Homelander, who mentions how Stormfront has been neutralized and taken to a secure location. He then publicly apologizes to Starlight and welcomes her back into the seven and then he just goes through the motions of a speech after this press conference starlight goes and meets huey in a park and huey asks her do you even feel safe going back into vault tower and she goes not really but if you jump ship and you let the asshole steer then you're part of the problem so she's gonna hang in there just like huey taught her she then kisses him and huey finds this to be a really weird time to tell her that he's not gonna be as clingy anymore to people trying to hold on to a relationship only because he's scared that they're gonna leave and she takes this as oh okay he wants to be just friends but he says no 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 I'm still going to cling to you. I'm not going to be an idiot. It's just other people I'm not going to cling to. And she asks him, well, who are you talking about? And while we don't get an answer, we're going to assume it's Billy Butcher, who is also in a park with Ryan. And Ryan is just feeling down and depressed because his mom just died. And Billy takes off a necklace and gives it to him, telling Ryan that Becca gave it to Billy. And the necklace is of St. Christopher. And St. Christopher was always supposed to keep Billy safe. And he did a pretty good job of it. And Billy then puts the necklace around Ryan's neck. But Ryan's ride just arrived. As Mallory gets out with a few other CI agents and both Billy and Ryan head to the SUVs right before Billy puts Ryan in the SUV he says don't forget what I told you and Ryan said don't be a cunt never change Billy Butcher Ryan then gets in the car and they close the door and Billy tells Mallory Vault's just not gonna let him go but Mallory says don't worry about Vault I'll take care of them Mallory then tells him that all the charges for him and his team have been dropped even for the crimes they actually did commit she also tells him that the White House is opening an office for soup affairs and Congresswoman Newman is going to be in charge of it. And Newman has put some money off the books for Mallory to set up a task force to kind of keep the soups in check. And she asked Billy if he'd be interested in it. But the only thing Billy heard was, the charges are dropped and you're free to go. And Billy just walks off and lets his team know. And this allows Mother's Milk to finally get back to his family. And Kamiko and Frenchie 
to finally get out of the Cash for Gold basement. Now, back with the Church of the Collective, Alistair Adana calls a meeting with both A-Train and The Deep, and he tells both of them that the news about Stormfront came from their archives because somebody stole the file, and the weird thing is, the security camera footage didn't see anybody, and everybody in the room knows that it's the A-Train, and the A-Train says, whoa, let me explain. But to his surprise, he doesn't have to explain because Alistair Adana is thrilled about this. Stormfront had been very critical of the church for years, and it's always good to take down a Nazi. And because of that, A-Train is back in the seven. And A-Train is pumped, and the Deep is pumped for him, but when the Deep asks, well, I I'm in two, right? Alistair says, no, unfortunately not. You see, letting back one reclamation project, that's good. Letting back two, ah, that's desperate. But we'll continue to work with you, and you can continue to take some classes. But the Deep is sick of taking classes, sick of wasting money, curses out Alistair and Donna, and tells him that Fresca sucks, which really hits home. And after the Deep storms out, Alistair calls up Congresswoman Newman, congratulating her and saying it's about time the U.S. government set up something to keep these soups in check. Congresswoman Newman ends up thanking him, saying, I know that the information on Stormfront came from your group, so... Thanks for that. And he says, don't worry about it. We have tons of dirt on a lot of soups. And it really could be a death blow to Stan Edgar. But that is, of course, if you're into expediting the church's tax exempt. And she says, yeah, that's a small price to pay. Call my office. We'll set it up. And Alistair's feeling pretty good about himself and cracks open a fresca. But when he does that, his head explodes. And that's because Victoria Newman was standing outside of the Church of the Collective. And she was the one who was exploding heads because she is, in fact, a soup. She then heads off to her office where, to her surprise, Huey is sitting there waiting for her. And she thanks Huey for all he did, saying, how can I help? And Huey says, well, you can help by getting me a job. I just never felt like I fit in with that group, and I feel like it's time for me to start my own path. And Victoria Newman says, all right, sounds good. When can you start? Season 3 kicks off one year after the events of Season 2. In fact, the events of Season 2 and everything that happened with Stormfront are written into the new movie Dawn of the Seven. Some people are doing great, like Huey, who is with Starlight and the two are official. And he continues to work with Victoria Newman at the Federal Bureau of Superhuman Affairs, where he's kind of looked at as a superhero himself because he's known as the guy that took down Stormfront. The A-Train is also doing better because he's back in the seven, although he hasn't raced in over a year and questions are starting to come up about when he will race again. He makes a ton of excuses, but you get the feeling that he's not really interested in racing. Then there's Homelander. He's not doing so great because after a year, he's still answering questions about how he was duped by Stormfront. And he gives the same answer as always. He was a man who fell for the wrong woman. He's been doing a lot of soul searching and he's really excited for everybody to meet the quote real him. Although the real him is getting really tired of answering that same question. Billy, Kamiko, and Frenchie aren't doing so bad. They're sort of working for the Federal Bureau of Superhuman Affairs or FBSA for short. He sort of searches out all the scummy superheroes that really should be locked up and in jail. And he's gotten a lead on one that they've been searching for, a superhero named Termite. One of his sources has indicated that Termite is having a party that night, and he wants to get the green light from Huey to go in and take this guy down. Huey tells Billy, I'll talk to Victoria. But Billy ends up bullying him into saying, okay, you've got the green light, just don't kill him or murder him or any of that. So that night, Kamiko, Billy, and Frenchie all head up to this penthouse apartment where, yeah, they're partying all right. I mean, they're doing blow. They're drinking. And then they see the person they're after, Termite. Termite's superhero ability is he's able to shrink down and then quickly get back up to normal size. But when he shrinks down, he continues to have normal strength. This dude is just out of control. And at this party, he's really nothing more than a parlor trick. He transforms back up to normal size, and he heads into a bedroom with a guy that he's going to hook up with. After doing a lot of blow, the rando tells Termite, I want you inside me. Now, this isn't just normal sex we're talking about here. Termite climbs into a very sensitive area of this guy's body. He starts walking around. Everything's going great, but Coke Nose gets the best of him. He sneezes, and when he does that, he transforms back to normal size. Well, since he was in this guy's body... That guy dies pretty quickly. Frenchie walks in and sees this guy's body just torn up. Frenchie tells him, I saw nothing. I'm going to get out of here. But Termite says, wait. And then he transforms down to little size where Frenchie can't see him. And he starts beating Frenchie up. Luckily for Frenchie, Kamiko and Billy end up showing up and saving him. Trapping little Termite, putting him in a bag of cocaine. And it leads to Termite having an overdose. So that's going to be one less scumbag you'd figure the FBSA has to deal with. When Huey gets into the office in the morning, Victoria asks him how the surveillance went with Termite, and Huey hasn't heard anything from Billy, but he says, I'm sure it's fine. Victoria doesn't think so, though. 
after a year of having Billy on the books, she's noticed a trend, and that trend is always having to apologize for Billy Butcher's actions. Huey, being Billy's friend, tries to stick up for him. And the way that Victoria looks at it is, Billy Butcher is somebody you absolutely want to go to war with. The problem is, right now they're in peacetime. Huey ends up leaving the meeting with Victoria, and as he's walking through the office, he sees somebody he recognizes. It's a guy from the Dawn of Seven... Ah! It's a guy that he saw at the Dawn of Seven premiere who was trying to get Victoria Newman's attention, but he was calling her Nadia. Stewie finds it super odd that this guy showed up in the office, and the guy tells him, I'm not leaving until I talk to Nadia. He explains that her name isn't Nadia, but the nervous guy says, we're best friends. She'll remember me. Security escorts him out, but right before he leaves, he says to Huey, tell her it's Tony, she'll know. Later in the day, Huey has to meet back up with Victoria, but he never brings up Tony in the meeting. She tells him that she's heard from Vaught, and the bad news is Termite is off the table. Vaught closed a huge endorsement with him for Terminex. And after Butcher ended up force-feeding him a bunch of cocaine, Victoria didn't have much leverage in the issue. So Termite is going to the Global Wellness Retreat in Malibu. In return, the FBSA is getting a bunch of C-listers. Now, all of these guys are bad news, but Huey wanted to catch the big fish, and the big fish was Termite, a guy they've been chasing for months. So he's not exactly happy about this, but Victoria tries to pitch it to him anyway. After talking with Victoria, he has to go give the bad news to Billy. And Billy is even more pissed off than Huey, although Huey puts on a face like he's all for this move. He tries to sell it to Billy like Victoria tried to sell it to him. Billy ends up screaming at him, Huey, you're working for Vaught. Huey yells back, we're actually winning. And Billy points out locking up a couple of nobodies isn't winning. They get into a pretty big screaming match, and what Huey figures it boils down to is the fact that he left. But Huey doesn't think he's the only one that Billy's pissed at. He figures that Billy's also pissed because Mother's Milk left as well. He also knows that Billy is going through a lot after Becca died. But he also thinks that Billy needs to get over it. And it's hard to try to get over it when Billy still has Ryan to think about. Since his mother's death, Ryan is living with Grace, and he's protected by a bunch of federal agents. Billy does go to visit him, but, but Billy also doesn't want to get too attached to Ryan. Now, Ryan's dad, Homelander, would love to see him, but he's not allowed. He's also been on that 12-month PR tour after hooking up with a Nazi. As he's heading to one such interview, he meets up with an old friend. The Deep. And even The Deep is doing better. He wrote a book about leaving the church, which he calls a cult, and the book is a bestseller. He's also married to a woman named Cassandra. His numbers are going back up. Even Malcolm Gladwell wrote about him. But when Homelander sees The Deep, all he can think of is, how did you get the slot on this show before me? And The Deep doesn't really know how to answer that. The intimidation factor is still very real. And it leads to the deep telling Homelander, I'm, I'm st- I don't know, I mean, I'm still just like a nobody compared to you. Homelander then heads to the interview and they ask him the same question that everybody else does. As Homelander is answering that question, Stan Edgar is having a meeting with presidential candidate Bob Singer. Vaught has created a dose of temporary V. It'll give anyone who takes it superpowers for 24 hours. And Edgar wants to sell it to the Department of Defense. But Bob Singer realizes that that's going to be a lot of money. Over the course of a month-long operation, we're talking $60 million per soldier. He's not really interested in doing that. But Edgar sort of points out that Vaught recently contributed a lot of money to Singer's campaign for presidency. He's kind of running on this platform that he's this cowboy, and there's nothing more cowboy than giving the soldiers of the United States superpowers. While Bob appreciates the contributions and he sort of agrees with the line of thinking, he's already seen that soups in the army are a disaster. And Edgar kind of sighs and says, you're right. You know, the problem was making the super into heroes. I mean, we made them figures to be worshipped. The fame, the movies, it ruined them. He admits to Singer that in five years, he wants to be out of the superhero business entirely. He says, Vault should be a serious company, a defense and pharmaceutical company. Not a daycare for these prima donnas. But the thing is, you won't have to worry about the prima donna nature because your soldiers will only be super. And they'll only be super temporarily. But Singer has another issue. Calling it Compound V is a problem because all people can think of is Nazis. This after Vaught had a Nazi selling it. He says to Edgar, this isn't going to fly in Congress. But Edgar points out that he still has a few strings to pull in Congress. After meeting with Singer, Edgar calls a meeting with both Homelander and Starlight. But 
He never mentions to Homelander initially that he's going to be meeting with the both of them. So when Homelander shows up and he sees Starlight, he's pretty confused. He tries to kick her out of the meeting, but Edgar says, no, I called you both here. And then he tells them that he wants Starlight to be co-captain of the Seven. This is shocking to both Starlight and Homelander, but to Edgar, it makes perfect sense. Starlight's numbers have never been higher. In fact, she's the highest Q rating the Seven has ever seen. Homelander, on the other hand, has been doing damage control for a year and none of it's working. Starlight doesn't really want it, and it seems like she doesn't want it because she knows that Homelander will hate her for it, and Homelander certainly will hate her for it. And then it's Homelander who ends up getting kicked out of that meeting by Stan. Stan Edgar understands the hesitation from Starlight, but he also tells her, Homelander is under control and we both know why. He then pitches her on this idea, saying that she will decide what the Seven do, what causes they support. She's basically going to have full authority to fill the team's empty slots. And that idea is very enticing. And Starlight is already in the works to try to replace at least one member of the Seven. Vaught has set her up as a judge on this reality show to find the missing member. But one of the members that has made it all the way to the finals is her old boyfriend. He used to be known as Drummer Boy, and he was in this hit boy band back in the day. Since growing up, though, he has changed his name to Supersonic, and he's looking to get into the Seven. The TV show really highlights the fact that Starlight and Supersonic used to be a thing, but a lot of it is scripted. The truth is, they did used to date, but they were also super religious, and while they lost their virginity to each other, they just appear to be friends now. Don't tell that to Huey. He shows up at one of the tapings, and he sees Starlight getting super chummy with Supersonic, and you can tell it just makes him uncomfortable. While he tells Starlight that it's great, they're just super close, Starlight can tell that he's nervous, and she says, you have nothing to worry about. They then head to her trailer, and Starlight tells Huey about the big news, the co-captaincy. And this would make Starlight the first female co-captain of any super team. She feels like with this new role, she could be a role model, but she could also do real good. And Huey's worried that Homelander will get so pissed off, he'll just murder her. They end up getting into a little bit of a fight when Huey brings up Supersonic, and it costs Huey a night of adult fun with Starlight. With his night suddenly freed up, Huey heads back to the office, but as he's leaving, he sees Victoria, and he sees that she's being followed by that guy from the office and from the movie premiere, so he decides to tail him. They head to an alley, and it turns out Victoria does know the guy. She tells the guy, who's named Tony, that she no longer goes by Nadia. He tells her that she has a platform, so she should tell everybody what happened to them at Red River. She explains it's not that easy, but Tony continues to beg until finally she says, All right, I will. But then Tony notices that his nose is bleeding, and he knows that Victoria's doing it. Turns out Tony's a soup, so he pushes her pretty far, and the two end up fighting. Victoria is defending herself, but she ends up killing Tony. All of this is being seen and overheard by Huey, who is hiding behind a dumpster. Victoria has no idea that he's there. And with Tony's dead body just lying in this alley, Huey overhears her pick up the phone, call somebody, and say, I'm in trouble. I need a team, and then she gives this person the address and heads home. While Huey was finishing up his day, Starlight headed back up to Stan's office and tells him that she accepts. And it doesn't take long for Starlight and Homelander to start doing a photo shoot for the new press release. But all of this, the bad PR for 12 months, having to answer the same question, the fact that he can't see his kid, and now the fact that his captaincy is being ripped from him, has Homelander reaching a boiling point, and he takes it out on the A-train. While walking through the hallways, he sees the A-Train drinking a milkshake, and he just rips into him. Because he's noticed that the A-Train has just been stuffing his face full of carbs. The A-Train tries to act like he needs it for running, but Homelander, along with everybody else, knows that he doesn't run anymore. When the A-Train tries to whisper, man, screw you, Homelander ends up grabbing him and bullying the crap out of him. He then stomps up to his penthouse apartment, and he vents to Stormfront, or at least what's left of her. I mean, she's in rough shape. Her body is super burned up, looks like she's missing some of her legs, but that doesn't stop her from helping out her man and, you know, rubbing him off a little bit. While he starts talking about how these people will worship him again one day, she brings up how he's going to lead an army of Aryan brothers, and he stops and says, wait, no, we don't need a master race. I am the master race. While Homelander appears to be still in love with Stormfront, he's just so sick of her talking about this master race BS. But that little temper tantrum that he had in the hallway was seen by Queen Maeve. 
She texts Billy, we need to meet, because it turns out that Queen Maeve is Billy's source. The first question she asks is, what the hell happened with Termite? My info was good. And Billy just says, don't ask. But she didn't come there for Termite. She brought with her a file about an old superhero named Soldier Boy who died in the 80s. Soldier Boy was the lead of a superhero group called Payback. And before the seven, Payback was the number one superhero group. The female lead in Payback was named Crimson Countess, who coincidentally was in a relationship with Soldier Boy. And Soldier Boy's sidekick was this guy named Gunpowder. It's worth mentioning, by the way, that Black Noir was in Payback. He then joined the Seven. But according to the news, Soldier Boy died. He was trying to stop a nuclear meltdown in Ohio, and he got buried beneath the reactor. Billy always thought it was fishy, and Queen Maeve says, you're right. If you read the file, he died from something called BCL Red. And Soldier Boy was nearly as strong as Homelander. So whatever this HCL Red stuff is, Queen Maeve wants to get it because she wants to take Homelander down. She tells Billy that if anybody knows what truly happened to Soldier Boy, it's going to be Gunpowder or Crimson Countess. She then digs into her pocket and pulls out the Temp V. She gives it to Billy, and Billy doesn't want to take it. He doesn't have any interest in ever becoming a soup. But Maeve knows he's going to need it because Payback, while they might be a bunch of D-bags, they're really powerful. And if Billy's going to go up against them, he's going to need to be a soup. Maeve then heads out the door, and Billy is looking at the Temp V, but he sees somebody standing on his balcony, and it's Homelander. No idea if Homelander heard what Queen Maeve was talking about, but he showed up because he wants to know where Ryan is, and Billy's not about to give the location. They then start insulting each other back and forth, and Billy finally asks him, dude, what are you doing here? And Homelander is just sick of Vaught and the Bureau. He thinks that what they're doing to him, and Billy for that matter, is just treating them like chess pieces. So while he's enemies with Billy, it's like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and he asks Butcher, what if you and I share a common destiny, sort of a scorched earth, shock and awe, and then in the end, only one of us will be left standing? Billy says that what he wants in the end is for only one of them to be left standing, but he doesn't fully agree to go into business with Homelander. The last person we haven't talked about is Mother's Milk, who, just like Huey, left Billy, and he's turned into a real family man. He heads to his daughter Janine's birthday party, but he is having trouble because his ex, Monique, is now with a new guy, Todd, so he's kind of co-parenting. While Todd seems like a nice guy, Mother's Milk definitely would like to be with Monique. He's really been trying to do a good job of rehabilitating the relationship and his image for her. But even though to them it looks like he left that superhero hunting in the past, after he tucks Janine in, he heads to a closet where he has a bunch of news clippings and information on where to find soups. And one of the news clippings is about how Soldier Boy was cleared of the wrongdoings in the death of a Queen's family. In fact, most of the clippings have to do with payback. In episode two, Billy wakes up to a FaceTime from Ryan. And Ryan's just trying to make chit-chat, but Billy is going through so much stress that he kind of snaps at him. Ryan made a movie that he wants Billy to watch, and Billy just snaps, yeah, I'll get to it later. Billy ends up checking himself when Ryan asks, are you mad at me? And Billy realizes just what a douchebag he's being. After apologizing to Ryan and getting off of FaceTime, Billy needs to get to work. He sends Kimiko and Frenchie to handle Crimson Countess. He himself is going to take on gunpowder, but he's definitely going to need help with finding out what happened to Soldier Boy. And for that, he's going to need Mother's Milk. So he pays him a visit. Not great timing, though. Mother's Milk has Janine over that weekend. Not like Billy really cares, though. Billy tells Mother's Milk that he doesn't believe that Soldier Boy died the way they said. And if there's a weapon out there that killed him, it can definitely kill Homelander. Mother's Milk doesn't really have any interest in helping Billy out, but Billy does bring up what happened to his family. And that's when Mother's Milk snaps at him. Billy's about to leave, but Mother's Milk stops him and says, I might have something that could help you out in my files. And it's a paper on gunpowder. But after Billy leaves, all Mother's Milk can think about is Soldier Boy and what happened to his family. And it's got him on edge. When he drops Janine off at Monique's, he explains to Monique that he tried. I mean, he gave it 12 months, but it's all he can think about. And Monique gives him her blessing to go do what he has to do. Billy, meanwhile, went to go find Gunpowder, and he finds him at a gun convention. And even though Bob Singer has Vought's blessing, he does not have Gunpowder's blessing. Gunpowder is preaching to a choir that if Bob Singer is elected, there goes the Second Amendment. Billy listens to all of this, but bides his time and waits for Gunpowder to head to the bathroom. 
When he does, Billy tells him, hey, man, I'm your biggest fan. But then he starts insulting him, pointing out it must have been really tough to be Soldier Boy's sidekick. And then hinting at the fact that Soldier Boy might have sexually abused Gunpowder back in the day because Gunpowder was so young. Gunpowder tries to brush it off by telling him he doesn't know what he's talking about, but Billy, in fact, does. Because the piece of paper that Mother's Milk gave to him was a memo from Vaught that they buried. And it was a complaint that Gunpowder filed to Vaught begging them to take him off of payback. And the reason was Soldier Boy's habitual abuse. Butcher threatens to blackmail Gunpowder if he doesn't give him the information he needs on what exactly happened with Soldier Boy. And if Gunpowder is thinking about killing him, well, that memo can reach the internet in about an hour. But Gunpowder just kind of shakes his head and says, I don't really care. Soldier Boy never touched me like that. But what Billy said really irked Gunpowder, even though he didn't show it in the bathroom. When Billy goes to his car, he starts getting shot at. Gunpowder is able to hit him in the leg and also graze his face, but Billy wisely uses a distraction with the car alarms and is able to get away. Frenchie and Kamiko, meanwhile, were out there looking for Crimson Countess, and they find her at a Vaught amusement park. She does a daily show there all about Soldier Boy, about what a hero he is, about the fact that he's from the greatest city in America, Philadelphia, the birthplace of this country. And for a little bit of money, you can pay to actually meet her, although she's a shell of her former self. Frenchie and Kimiko do that, and this is tough for Kimiko because she's actually a really big fan of her, but Frenchie lets her know that they're there to do a job. So Kimiko, using her super strength, is able to jack Crimson Countess up against a wall, and they ask the same question that Billy asked to Gunpowder. What happened to Soldier Boy? Crimson Countess sticks to the story that Soldier Boy died a hero, and luckily for her, she's saved when the next group of autograph seekers comes in. Crimson Countess is able to push Kimiko and Frenchie back, Escape into the park where she makes a pretty big scene by killing a guy by accident. Now, Huey is on to his own search mission to find out what exactly happened with Victoria and what Red River is. Through their connections, Huey and Starlight were able to figure out that Red River is a group home that is owned by Vault subsidiaries. They figured that must be where Vicky grew up. Huey starts cursing himself. He feels like an idiot who should have seen this earlier, that he was working for a soup the entire time. He also knows that he can't just leave. She's going to know something's up. He has to go into work. He definitely doesn't want to tell Billy. He doesn't want to hear the end of it. He figures Starlight and him can just do the job themselves. But Starlight has to go off to do a sound check because that day is Homelander's big birthday spectacular. So she tells him, don't do anything while I'm gone. He doesn't listen. He decides to head to Red River himself, posing as a possible adoptive parent. And Red River is a group home for soups. As he's talking to the head of the house, though, behind her on the television screen is Starlight and himself. And he tries to get out of there, but one of the kids points to the TV, and the woman recognizes him. She knows Huey is not only dating Starlight, but she knows that Huey is working for the feds. And she thinks this is really weird. So, acting quickly, he tells her that he's sterile. Him and Starlight are thinking about adopting, and she didn't want to make news by showing up, so she secretly sent him. This works. They head to the woman's office and start looking at potential children. But while doing that, he sneaks in a flash drive and steals all of the files on hand. When he gets back to his car, he starts looking the ones up from Victoria Newman. Sure enough, her name used to be Nadia. And she murdered a lot of people using her powers before she could truly understand them. She never was adopted, technically, but she was taken in by Stan Edgar. Stan Edgar was like a father figure to her. After getting this information, Huey had to head back to the office. And the first person he just happens to run into is Victoria Newman. She starts questioning where he's been, what he's been up to. She's definitely suspicious of something. But Huey ends up getting saved when Starlight shows up out of the blue and says that Huey was with her and they just recently got into a fight. They put on a great acting display, making it pretty awkward for Victoria until eventually she leaves. Huey then takes Starlight to his car to show her exactly what he found in that group home. And she's just as shocked as he was. Huey, though, is on edge. And he reveals to Starlight that he's just really frustrated. He felt like everything was starting to break his way. I mean, Victoria was truly a friend, or at least he thought. It turns out he was just a puppet. He then tells her that he may have signed them up to adopt a child. That's the last thing she needs. Starlight has also had quite a day. She headed to the sound check for this ridiculous birthday spectacular There, she introduces Supersonic to Homelander, and Supersonic is a huge fan of Homelander, but he quickly finds out exactly the kind of person Homelander is when 
Homelander insults him because of the previous relationship with Starlight. They then get down to the actual rehearsal, and Homelander has made a few changes that Starlight does not like, because Homelander is trying to paint his co-captain as really nothing more than a sex object, and she's not into that. She definitely does not want to sing Happy Birthday like Marilyn Monroe did. And when Homelander tries to make her, Stan Edgar jumps in and says she doesn't have to if she doesn't want to. Her numbers are trending way better than yours. People are actually tuning in for her. People might DVR it for you. So right now, she's calling the shots. So now she's got Huey telling her she might be a mom, and Homelander is definitely pissed off at her. But Homelander has to get going because he has to do his annual birthday save. There's a woman about to commit suicide on a rooftop, and there are cameras all over the place waiting for Homelander to save her, but Homelander's heart just isn't into it. He nicely asks her to step back from the ledge because he knows that it's a foregone conclusion that even if she jumps, he's going to catch her. But then his mood completely changes when he looks up at a TV screen that's overhead, and he sees that Stormfront committed suicide that morning. She just couldn't bear being a charred-up potato. And when Homelander sees that, his entire mood changes to, please step back from the ledge to, why don't you just jump? He basically forces the woman to jump. He mourns for a little bit, but he has to head off to his birthday show. And he is in quite a mood. A-Train is the one to introduce him, and A-Train is wearing a new outfit that was not approved by Ashley. A-Train has been trying to redo his image with African roots because he no longer runs and doesn't want to tell anybody that. And this new outfit is pretty cringeworthy. It's not even really acknowledged on the show, though. He introduces both Starlight and Homelander, and Homelander just comments on his weight still. While Starlight starts talking about one of the foundations that's close to her heart, which is the Starlight House, it's a nonprofit dedicated to helping homeless and at-risk youth, somebody from the stands yells that Homelander's Nazi died, and it's pretty audible, but he keeps a straight face even though he is seething inside. Starlight tries to surprise him by telling the audience that he has agreed to dedicate $10 million to the Starlight House, but he just says, nope, no, not at all, and he goes completely off script. He basically tells the audience that they need him. They don't need this crybaby that he's made out to be. He's being controlled by Vought, and they're controlling just about everybody. If you don't think you're being controlled by Vought, you are. He's done being controlled because at the end of the day, he's the real hero. Now, Billy Butcher did not see this on live television because... When he got home, he was patching his wounds and he finally opens up his computer to watch that video that Ryan sent him. It's a stop motion video using Legos and an old voicemail from Becca. And it does cheer Billy up quite a bit. He decides to call a friend, Huey. He tells Huey that he was right. Things are good. Ryan's good. He really should just leave it well enough alone. And then out of nowhere, Huey decides to be honest with him and tell him that Newman's a soup. And if they're going to take Vaught down, they're going to have to do whatever it takes. And whatever it takes is the Billy Butcher way. This wakes up Billy quite a bit. He ends up taking the Temp V, going and visiting Gunpowder one final time. And when Gunpowder shoots Billy, he realizes that bullets no longer affect him. Billy beats the crap out of Gunpowder until Gunpowder tells him the truth. He was never sexually abused by Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy never Superman that hoe. It was really just hazing gone too far. As for what happened to him, yeah, he didn't die in that accident. But Gunpowder has no idea how he died. He tells Billy that they were in Nicaragua in 84. And if he wants the truth, he should ask the CIA. That's who they were working for. When Billy asks, who was your CIA officer? Gunpowder says, it was Grace Mallory. And that's a pretty big surprise to Billy. But even though Gunpowder just told him everything, Billy's not about to let him walk. At the end of the day, Gunpowder is a piece of crap. So he kills him and finishes him off by using Homelander's lasers that come out of his eyes. Now, we'll start off episode three with A-Train. He's leaving the hospital after a doctor's appointment, and when he gets outside, he sees a familiar face, his brother. His brother knows that something's up, and A-Train admits, yeah, I mean, I used to run here, now I have to get driven here. Doctors basically say that it's a coin flip. If I run again, my heart could explode. If I don't, you know, obviously I stay alive. But the question is, is that a risk I'm willing to take? His brother takes him back to his place where he can get reacquainted with the entire family. He's wearing that ridiculous Africa outfit, and he gets roasted for that. But then his brother shows him a video of a local man who was killed by a superhero. The story that they tell on the news isn't exactly what happened. Nathan wants him to do something, speak out, because he's a part of the Seven. But A-Train tells him it's really not that easy. As for the leader of the Seven, after that little outburst that he had, 
Ashley goes and tells him that his numbers are through the roof, especially in the Rust Belt. He's up 21 points, and it looks like Homelander's honesty has Homelander back. She also tells him that him and Starlight as a team have a Q rating of 98%, and no one has ever been that high. After leaving Homelander very stiff, Ashley goes and has a meeting with Starlight about who is going to be selected as the winners of the reality show that picks the next two members of the seven. Supersonic is the obvious choice, although Starlight says, I want to talk to him first. But then they get to choice two, and Starlight differs with the creative team. She wants to pick a superhero that wears a hajib, and they don't think that's going to trend well. But at the end of the day, she has final say. And while Ashley tries to convince her out of it, Starlight throws it on the table and says, there's nothing you can do about it. After leaving the meeting, she grabs Supersonic and secretly tells him that he's going to be in the seven, but what he should do is turn it down. She says, there's something wrong with Homelander. He's broken. He's threatened to murder me more than once. He's murdered other people, and it's only getting worse. If you join the Seven, it's going to be a disaster, not only for you, but for your family as well. So when they offer it to you, you have to leave and never look back. But this is a lot for him to process, so he needs a moment. Now, Annie's boyfriend, Huey, headed to the Flatiron Building, because that's where Billy Butcher and his team have their office. But he's not the only member who's returning. Mother's Milk has also returned. As soon as Huey walks in the room, Billy starts giving him crap for working with a soup for over a year. And when the jokes finally stop, Huey tells Billy, we need to get Ryan somewhere safe. Vicky knows where he is. And that means Stan Edgar knows where he is. But that's something Billy's already thought of. He's already moved Ryan. And he's also planned to go visit Ryan along with the rest of the gang. The only thing is Frenchie can't go. He gets a text message and he's got another matter he's got to deal with. So it looks like it's only going to be Billy, Huey, Mother's Milk, and Kamiko heading up to visit Ryan and Mallory. But before they leave, Huey's going to have to get out of work. He knows that Victoria will know if he's faking a sickness, so he wants Kamiko to break his arm. And she does, and it's painful, but it will give him the alibi that he needs. The group then heads up to go visit Ryan, and Frenchie goes to deal with his matter. And Frenchie's situation has to involve Cherry. When Frenchie meets up with her, she tells him, I'm in a situation. I went back to work with little Nina. I was moving drugs for her, and a bunch of guys took it from me. They were wearing masks. I don't know who they were. Cherry looks at Frenchie and says, come with me. Because at the end of the day, she knows that little Nina is not somebody you want to be indebted to, or somebody who you want looking for you. Frenchie can't, though. He gives her some fake passports and heads on his way. As he's walking back to the Flatiron building, one of little Nina's guys comes and picks him up. And little Nina and Frenchie have a history. Frenchie used to work for her. And while she doesn't look like it, she is pretty intimidating. She brought him there because she wants to know where Cherry is after Cherry stole her drugs. Little Nina tells him she never got mugged. She just took them. But Frenchie plays dumb. She doesn't really believe him, and she tells him, I can make it worth your while, but Frenchie says, I don't do drugs anymore. And the fact that we're working for the CIA means that I can go. So he heads back to the office. Billy and his group, meanwhile, have arrived up to visit Ryan and Mallory. Ryan is thrilled to see Billy, and the group is very confused about Billy's reaction because it's fatherly. They leave Ryan outside with Kimiko, and Billy, Mother's Milk, and Huey head inside to talk to Mallory. And when they tell Mallory about Newman, she has the same reaction that Huey had. She can't believe that she was duped. She asks them, what's the plan to eliminate her? And Billy says, that depends on what you can tell us about Nicaragua. Because a little birdie told me you were Payback's case officer down there. It was a classified job that Soldier Boy never came back from. She plays dumb, but Billy is able to get her to tell them the truth. She headed down to Nicaragua in the 80s to do some secret classified CIA missions. This after Oliver North just really screwed the pooch. And they were funding it by taking the cocaine from Nicaragua and funneling it into urban areas, which doesn't make Mother's Milk too happy. But one day, all of a sudden, the CIA decided to give the troops a little bit of a pick-me-up, so they sent payback down there, which didn't sit well with Mallory at all. You had the whole group, the TNT twins, Crimson Countess, Mindstorm, Swato, Black Noir, Gunpowder, and of course, the worst of them all, Soldier Boy. Grace Mallory was sort of the fun police. Grace then gets approached by a Vought associate, a guy named Stan Edgar. He tells him that this is a trial run, but the plan is to have payback, embed themselves, and fight alongside the Contra rebels. The way that Grace sees it, though, 
they don't belong in the military. And Stan reminds her, well, Soldier Boy was in the military and he's a damn hero. And unfortunately for Grace, there was nothing she could do. There were orders from above. Later on, as she's walking through the camp, she overhears a conversation between Stan and Black Noir. And believe it or not, Black Noir didn't want to wear the mask. He tells Stan that he's sick of it. But that all changes when the group is attacked. Their camp is bombarded, shot up, Swato is killed, Black Noir's face is so charred up that he's reaching for the mask, and Soldier Boy was taken by the Russians. Crimson Countin said that the Russians killed Soldier Boy, they had some kind of weapon or something, and they took his body back with them. At the end of it, she lost 116 men, and Vought got full immunity. That was the day that she decided to make Vought pay. Unfortunately, though, a trail went cold behind the Iron Curtain. They have no idea what happened to Soldier Boy, what happened to the weapon, any of it. That story, though, doesn't sit well with Billy or Mother's Milk. Mother's Milk tells her, you know what Soldier Boy did to my family and you never thought I'd want to hear about this? She then kicks out Marvin and Huey because she wants to talk to Billy alone. And Billy's pissed off, too. He thinks that if she would have divulged this information earlier, it could have saved Becca's life. Because he would have been able to eliminate Homelander, which is something that she promised him when he came aboard. So he is pissed off. But as he's chatting with Mallory, Huey gets a phone call from Starlight. She's freaking out a little bit. She was called to a meeting with Homelander and Ashley. And Homelander had a great idea for the television show. A real twist ending. Instead of bringing on the superhero that wears the hijab, they're going to bring back the Deep. The Deep, along with his wife Cassandra, walk in. And Starlight wants nothing to do with him. Even after the Deep apologizes, Starlight can't really forgive him for that whole, you know, like, sexual misconduct. She asks for a meeting alone with Homelander and the two get into a pissing contest where Homelander tells her that his numbers are trending up and whoever has the better numbers has the power. She tries to play her final trump card, the video, and releasing it, which would make Homelander look terrible, but Homelander says, release it. If you do... I might take my wrath out on everybody. So unfortunately for Starlight, she's not going to get her way this time. She calls up Huey, freaking out about what to do. She starts talking about leaving, but Huey says, I I know I should agree with you on this, but you got to stick it out. I'm back with Butcher, and we're on to something that can kill Homelander. So I I need you to buy us some time and just keep your eyes on him. And Starlight can't really believe what Huey's asking her to do. He's basically asking her to cozy up next to Homelander as he grows more unstable by the hour. The whole time hoping that he doesn't kill her or worse. Huey tells her, I'm sorry, but yeah, if that's what it takes. Unfortunately, the high road isn't working. We have to be as mean as they are. Butcher then comes storming out of the house and Ryan's the first one to see him and yells, where are you going? But Billy says, to the city. And when Ryan asks, when will I see you again? Billy just says, you won't. This really hurts Ryan. Because Billy told him he'd always look out for him, and now he's abandoning him. And Billy tells him, maybe I don't want to look at you after what you did to Becca. Do you ever think about that? That hits Ryan at the core. He yells at Billy, I hate you, and then he runs back in the house. That didn't sit well with any of them. When they get back to the office, Kamiko's the first one in, and she sees Frenchie and asks him, how do you work for that guy? She then poses the same question that Cherry posed to Frenchie. Let's just get out of here. But Frenchie isn't willing to leave. Billy asks Frenchie, where were you? And Frenchie fills him in that he was with little Nina. But that's when Billy realizes that this little Nina fiasco can actually help him out because Nina is Russian. So he tells Frenchie, set up a meeting between me, you, and little Nina. Because if they're gonna find that weapon, they're gonna have to head to Russia, and little Nina might be able to help him with that. That night, everybody takes off, and it's really just Huey and Billy. And Billy had some time to think about what he did, and he realizes just what a monster he was to Ryan. Huey starts trying to make him feel better about it, but then all of a sudden, Billy pukes all over him because Billy's been throwing up all day from that 10th V. No word on if either of them watched the finale of American Hero, but the taping was that night. Beforehand, Supersonic had told Starlight that he was planning on telling the producers he didn't want to do it, but she's always been loyal to him, so he's not about to leave her with this psychopath. So when they announced the newest members of the Seven, he's one of them. Then they announced the Deep. And this move wasn't out of the goodness of his heart. In fact, before the taping, Homelander, Ashley, The Deep, and Cassandra all had dinner. Homelander took the liberty of ordering for everybody, and he just happened to order seafood, knowing how uncomfortable that was going to make The Deep. He then made The Deep eat his friend, Timothy, who was a squid. 
And even Cassandra told him to do it because they can't hear Timothy begging for his life. But in order to get back in the seven, the deep does it. And when they announce the newest member, he walks through the door. Homelander starts giving a speech about how this was actually Starlight's idea. Forgiveness is key. But then he turns to the deep and says, just stay away from her because she's my girl now. And this is very confusing to Starlight. Homelander says, I I just can't keep it a secret anymore. It's time we let the world know. Starlight and I are in love. Hashtag Homelight. Ashley and the rest of the creative team love it. But when they give Starlight the chance to go back on it, she doesn't. She says, yeah, let's go again. Because she remembers what Huey told her. So when they go again, she takes it one step further and she kisses Homelander. But the whole time, she is gritting her teeth. She hates it. In episode 4, after Billy puked into Huey's mouth, Huey realized that he must have been on Compound V. Billy tells him it's just Temp V and he's supposed to keep his mouth shut. The next day, Frenchie is able to facilitate that meeting between Billy and Nina. Billy slaps down a duffel bag full of cash and says that he needs information into Russia. And in return for that information, he's going to pay off Cherry's debt and he threw a few hundred thousand dollars in there for Nina's troubles as well. But Nina doesn't want just money. She wants Cherry. Frenchie starts freaking out about it, and Billy has to dismiss him. After Frenchie leaves, he turns to Nina and says, there's got to be something we could do, and indeed there is. When the group gets over to Russia, she's got a job for him. Now, one person that wasn't in this meeting was Huey. Huey headed to Vaught Tower to meet with Starlight, and Starlight explained what was going to happen on that night's finale of American Hero, the whole Homelight thing. Huey can't believe that she's going through with it, but she told him, Huey, it's like you said, by any means necessary. This just better work. Their conversation, though, gets interrupted when Homelander walks in the room, and right away, Starlight is worried that Homelander might have overheard their conversation. It gets a little awkward. He tells Starlight, we gotta go to a photo shoot, but then he just starts being a dick to Huey. When he makes a pretty rude comment that no boyfriend would want to hear about their girlfriend, Huey wants to stand up to Homelander, but he knows he can't. And it forces Starlight to flash those eyes and say, if you hurt him, or if you hurt anybody that he cares about, I walk. Homelander can't let that happen, so the two head to their photo shoot. Huey then heads off to go meet with Billy and the team. They've secured an airplane, but he does have to call out of work. Victoria finds it a little bit fishy, but she's got her own problems to deal with. That morning, Stan Edgar came to her, and he needs a favor. Homelander is spouting off to the media a big anti vaught rhetoric, and he needs Victoria to make a statement about it. After all, Homelander did curse on TV. Victoria is just concerned about the repercussions if she does that, Homelander's not going to be happy. And on top of it, she has Zoe to think about, her daughter. But Stan tells her, don't worry about him. His bark is worse than his bite. He's not going to do anything, and he's still scared of me. So when Huey calls up Victoria to call out of work, she's all right with it, but she doesn't tell Huey any of this information. Huey, Billy, Frenchie, Mother's Milk, and Kamiko then get on the plane and head over to Russia. Now, when Huey's girlfriend returns from that photo shoot, she realizes she needs to cover her tracks and put a plan in place. The first person she heads to is Queen Maeve, and she's surprised to find Queen Maeve training because the story is that Queen Maeve hasn't trained in years and she's kind of a drunken slob, but Maeve tells her, that's what I want people to think. Starlight then asks Queen Maeve if she has any idea what BCL Red is, and Maeve says, yeah, that's the weapon that we can use to kill Homelander. Who do you think tipped them off about BCL Red? Why do you think I'm training? Why do you think I haven't had a drink in four months? Starlight thinks this is great. The only problem is they haven't found the BCL Red. And if they're going to take down Homelander, they're going to need a team to do so. They're going to need more than just Starlight and Queen Maeve. But the more she talks about getting a team together, the more Starlight realizes that Queen Maeve might be okay with dying. The next person she visits is Supersonic. And Supersonic is all on board with helping Starlight out. But they need to run because they have a team meeting to get to. It's the first team meeting with the all-new Seven. Homelander tries to end it pretty abruptly, But the A-Train pipes up, because he's got an issue. He tried to talk to Ashley about it at a very Kendall Jenner, Pepsi, cringeworthy commercial, but Ashley brushed it aside. The A-Train's issue is exactly what his brother brought to the table. The superhero Blue Hawk, who is over-patrolling black neighborhoods. Starlight thinks that's terrible, and the A-Train really appreciates her support on this. But while the A-Train is making this speech about how they really should just bench Blue Hawk for a little bit, it could help with their numbers in the African-American community... The Deep gets a text message from Cassandra, and he just regurgitates everything. Basically, what Cassandra told him was, these neighborhoods need more superheroes, not less. And on top of it, Homelander's target demo is the same as Blue Hawk, so 
by sitting him out, Homelander could end up hurting his brand. That makes a lot of sense to Homelander. So he says, yeah, A-Train, no go. He then dismisses everybody from the room because he wants to have a private conversation with Ashley. Ashley tells him that Victoria Newman is planning on having a press conference. It has to do with him, but it's probably no biggie. And he yells at her, you need to find out exactly what she's going to talk about. Do your job. When he leaves the room, he finds a fight going on between the A-Train and the D. The A-Train did not take kindly to the fact that the D decided to completely ruin his plan on sitting Nighthawk out. But Homelander ends up siding with his boy, the Deep, and it leaves the A-Train in an elevator with the new guy, Supersonic. And as the A-Train is ranting and raving about how much he's done for Homelander and how unappreciative he is, Supersonic decides to make his pitch on joining Starlight and her team. A few hours later, A-Train, Queen Maeve, Supersonic, Starlight, and Homelander get together to watch this Victoria Newman presser. Right before she does, she gets a quick pep talk from Stan Edgar about how this is the right thing to do. And then Victoria takes the podium. But instead of slapping Homelander on the wrist, she actually praises Homelander for shining a light on how corrupt Vought is and their CEO, Stan Edgar. She completely stabs him in the back and it takes him by surprise, as well as the members of the Seven. Because they're sitting there looking at Homelander with a crap-eating grin on his face, and they know full well that he must have had something to do with this. As Stan is being taken out in cuffs, he asks Victoria, why? And she says, I had to keep Zoe safe. When she gets home that night, she gets reminded of the fact that she made the right decision because Homelander is standing in her bedroom. Although, he came to do his end of the bargain. As he snooped through Stan Edgar's files, he found out that Stan Edgar was ready to stab Victoria in the back as well. But he also found out that Victoria was a soup. So they decide to make a trade. He gives her Compound V that she injects into her daughter. And then he takes off. When he gets back to Vault Tower, he's surprised because Stan Edgar's standing there. Stan's on a leave of absence. But Homelander is in his glory. He's reveling in this. And Stan says, that's fine. You have the company now. No one's there to stand in your way. But nobody's there to also clean up your mess. And eventually, America's going to find out who you truly are and what a failure you are. And that does hit Homelander right in the feels. But that night, as I said, is the season finale of American Hero. This is the big Homelight episode. So Starlight and Homelander have to do something for the press. They walk out of Vaught Tower. They're getting their picture taken. And Homelander tells Starlight that he wants to show her something. So he flies her away. They get to a rooftop. And the thing that Homelander wanted to show her is the fact that he killed Supersonic. He tells her that this is actually her fault. He found out about her little coup when the A-Train told her. So here's the deal. No more coups. She is just going to be a loyal servant to him. That's it. And if she so much thinks about betraying him, Huey is going to end up just like Supersonic. And all Starlight can do is just nod and say, I understand. Now, Huey and the group have made it safely to Russia, and they do have the location of the lab, but they do need to do that job for Nina first. It's not all of them, though. It's just Kamiko. And Kamiko has no interest in it. She doesn't want to be Butcher's hired gun, and Frenchie doesn't want to be doing jobs for Nina. But Billy lays down the hammer, saying that's exactly what Kamiko is. And she will do the job. And Kamiko and Frenchie have no other options. Kamiko is going to pose as a prostitute and kill the mark. So those two head out. But the way that Billy's been treating people hasn't gone unnoticed, especially by Mother's Milk. He kind of yells at Billy for treating both Ryan and Kamiko like crap, and Billy tells him that one of the reasons he's there is to keep the team together. Billy's going to play bad cop, Mother's Milk will play good cop. A few hours later, Kamiko returns, and she has indeed killed the mark. But she's done with Billy Butcher. She wants out. And she tells Frenchie, Let's go away. Get out of here. And for the first time, Frenchie is fine with leaving Billy. But he's not okay with leaving Huey and Mother's Milk. So he says to her, we do this one last job and then we'll leave. The group gets ready to take off to the lab, but Billy needs to cover his ass by souping up. He injects himself with Temp V, but he's caught by Huey. And Huey right away wants some. He's sick of being treated like a bitch, and he hates the fact that Starlight had to save him from Homelander. But even though he pleads, Billy won't give him any. So Huey just waits for Billy to leave, and he ends up taking it himself. Everybody then heads over to the lab, and they're able to easily get inside. But as they're standing in front of what probably is the tank holding Soldier Boy, a bunch of members from the Russian military burst on in. The group is bogged down, getting shot at, and that is when Billy Butcher shows everybody that he's a soup, saving everybody. But there is one member of the Russian military who has a gun pointed at Mother's Milk. And that's when Huey jumps into action, showing everybody that Huey is also taking Temp V. 
with everybody now dead, Huey and Billy have some explaining to do. They tell the group it's only temporary, but Billy is pissed off at Huey. Huey thought that Billy would be okay with it after just saving mother's milk, but Billy's not. He just walks over to the tank and rips the door off. And sure enough, there is Soldier Boy, standing there, alive. Soldier Boy takes all the wires out of his arm, he walks out of the tank, but then he unleashes a burst of energy from his chest. It's directed right at Frenchie, and Kamiko throws Frenchie out of the way and takes the full brunt of the force. Soldier Boy then just casually walks outside, and Frenchie goes to check on Kamiko. She's pretty banged up, but what's really disturbing is she's not healing, and Frenchie starts freaking out a little bit. The group can't even go after Soldier Boy because they have to rush Kamiko to a hospital. Faith in Billy Butcher is non-existent, and Kamiko is clinging to life. In episode 5, Kamiko seems to be okay, at least for now. They're definitely going to have to get her to a real doctor, which means getting her back to the States. In the meantime, Mother's Milk starts watching security camera footage from the testing process of Soldier Boy, trying to find out exactly what the Russians did to him and why exactly he's so powerful, because he wasn't this powerful before. But he also has an issue with Billy. He doesn't like the fact that he became a soup. Their whole mission is to get rid of soups. Billy, though, doesn't really care. In his mind, everything he did was necessary. He then goes to check on Huey, and Huey is hungover just like he was the first time he took Temp V. The group then gets on a private jet, heads home, and as soon as they touch down, Mother's Milk and Frenchie take Kamiko to a hospital. That leaves just the Temp V twins, Billy and Huey. But for the time being, they're just going to both kind of head home. And while they were gone, a lot changed at Vaught. With Stan Edgar out, Ashley stepped in as CEO. But really, she's nothing more than a puppet for Homelander. Homelander's really running the show. And he has really surrounded himself with yes people. One of those people is The Deep. So he puts him in charge of crime analytics, a job that he is clearly not suited for. And while we don't know who's in charge of Vault PR, they do a pretty good job spinning the supersonic story. The story that everybody gets is that he died of a drug overdose. When Huey gets to his apartment, he's watching the news coverage. And the painting that's being pictured is that the stress of joining the Seven just got too much for him and he relapsed. Huey then gets a knock at the door and it's Annie and he, and he starts to kind of console her, try to make her feel better. But that's when she reveals that all of that is a lie. It was Homelander who killed Supersonic. And to make it worse, Starlight's blaming herself. One thing that could make her feel a lot better about the situation is if they found a weapon to take out Homelander. And he has to tell her, no, nah, it was a dud. And then he goes and gets her a white claw because everything that happened in Russia is a lot to process. And he tells her everything. And she doesn't know what she's more mad at. The fact that Soldier Boy is alive and running free in the world now or the fact that her boyfriend took Temp V. She's mad at him for taking an untested drug from Vought because it really could have killed him. And he tells her, well, we don't have any more anyway. And even if we did, I'm not taking it. That stuff's awful. But she knows he's lying. And it doesn't take much for him to admit, oh my God, no, I loved it so much. For the first time in my life, I was actually powerful. I wasn't scared. Starlight doesn't care how great he felt. As she tells him, that was stupid, and I can't lose you too. So what do we do now? And Huey doesn't have any plans. But he tells her, whatever it is, we'll figure it out together. Starlight wasn't the only one, though, from the Seven that was wondering if they got the weapon. So was Queen Maeve. She heads over to Billy's house to find out, no, they didn't get it. But she also finds a very inebriated Billy Butcher. Billy offers her some alcohol, and Queen Maeve doesn't want to take it because she's four months sober, but the reality that Homelander is out of control and their one chance of possibly getting rid of him just went down the drain, it pushes her to drink. doesn't take long for both of them to get drunk, and they start talking about what their next move is going to be. She also brought him a lot more of Temp V, which she does find ironic because she knows that Billy hates soups, and yet here he is wanting to become one. And the way he looks at it, it's just more proficient for getting his job done. It used to take months to get rid of a soup. He was able to get rid of gunpowder in a second. He tells Maeve, we're all just people, but that V, it amps up the stuff that's already inside you. Somehow this conversation leads to them hooking up. Sexually. While Billy had just arrived back from Russia, the world finds out that he wasn't the only one. Because Soldier Boy also hitched a ride back. He arrives in the States, he just kind of looks like a homeless person, but he starts hearing Russian music coming from a speaker in a truck, and it triggers him. Triggers him to basically explode, causing a massive explosion in the heart of New York City. Mother's Milk finds out when he goes and picks up Janine. He's not a big fan of the fact that 
Todd is having Janine watch pro Homelander propaganda, but he ends up canceling his visit with Janine when he sees the explosion and he knows that it must have been Soldier Boy. He's not the only one concerned, though. The figureheads at Vought, i.e. Homelander, Starlight, Ashley, they're also very concerned. But Homelander wants to play it off to the media like it's no big deal. Starlight really wants to get ahead of it. Find this guy, take care of it, right away. So Homelander tasks her with doing that while he runs the media blitz. When she gets out of the meeting, she calls up Huey and says, please tell me this isn't who I think it is. And Huey says, yeah, it's probably exactly who you think it is. Huey asks Starlight to look into the crime analytics department, see if they can find him, because Huey and Billy are already on the case. But when Starlight heads down to the crime analytics department, she finds three employees. And the amount of work that it's going to take, it's going to take way more than three employees. She ends up asking the one girl, where is everybody? And she tells Starlight, the deep fired everybody. If you're not solely loyal to Homelander, you got axed. And this is the rest of our department. So Starlight definitely has her work cut out for her. But so does Huey and Billy. They arrive at the scene, and it's way worse than they could have imagined. It's also even worse for Huey because he runs into a coworker named Ivy who knows that he had a broken arm. And since taking the temp V, Huey's broken arm is suddenly healed. So he has to explain that to her so she doesn't go back and tell Victoria Newman that he was just skipping out of work the whole time. He quickly makes an excuse and gets out of the conversation. As they're surveying the damage, they see that Mother's Milk has also arrived. And he is pissed. Mother's Milk is so disgusted by Billy, he says, you know what, screw you guys. I'll go find him myself. But Billy says, what are you going to do when you find him? The reality is, you need help, and that means you need us. Let me help you with this, and then you don't have to see me anymore. Mother's Milk knows that he does need some help. He also tells Billy that he's got a lead. It's a guy that goes by the name The Legend. He was the head of Vaught before Madeline Stilwell. And he had a really close connection with Soldier Boy. Mother Smoke has a really good relationship with the legend, although the legend doesn't really like Billy Butcher too much. But Mother Smoke is convinced that Soldier Boy stopped by to see the legend. Conversation gets a little bit contentious, but eventually the legend admits, yeah, he stopped by. He wanted his suit. I held on to it. He also came for his girlfriend's address, so there's a really good chance that he's going to see Crimson Countess next. The trio then heads out to the car, and Billy shows them all the temp V that he has. He feels like they should take it. But Mother's Milk thinks that they should draw the line. Huey ends up agreeing with Billy. He wants to take the temp V as well. So in the end, Huey and Billy end up taking it. Mother's Milk sits this one out. They wait till that night to head over to Crimson Countess's place. As Billy and the gang was trying to track down Soldier Boy, over at Vaught Tower, Homelander has a private meeting with Queen Maeve. He can literally smell Billy Butcher all over her, and he feels like the only reason she hooked up with Billy was to hurt him. But he does have a theory. He doesn't think it's just about the physical stuff. They might have a plan going. And he thinks there's a possibility that they smuggled Soldier Boy in. She denies that there's anything going on between her and Billy. And then the conversation moves to the relationship between her and Homelander. Homelander really was in love with her. But she tells Homelander, From the start, I hated you. But what's more is I pitied you. He can't let Queen Maeve do whatever she wants. So he has Black Noir basically kidnap her. And then they throw Queen Maeve in, quote, rehab. When Starlight finds out what happened to Queen Maeve, she knows it's fishy and she knows that Homelander had something to do with it. So she storms into Ashley's office and demands to know what's up. But Ashley toes the company line saying that Queen Maeve is just getting help for her addiction. Starlight looks at Ashley and says, yesterday was supersonic and today is Maeve and tomorrow could be me or you. Look, the reality is you know he's out of control right now. Starlight begs Ashley, where is Maeve? And it seems like Ashley is coming aboard to Starlight's line of thinking that she does need to help out until all of a sudden she says, I am CEO and next time you need to make an appointment. And she kicks Starlight out. Annie leaves the office, but she gets a phone call from Mother's Milk telling her about the meetup at Crimson Countess's place. So Annie heads over. She's running late though. And when Billy and Mother's Milk and Huey burst on in, they catch Crimson Countess camming. And she's making a whole lot of money. We're talking some guy is paying $20 a minute. But in the end, you know, he got what he came for, if you know what I mean. Billy and Mother's Milk end up tying Crimson Countess up and telling her, Soldier Boy, he's coming here tonight. She asks, how did he escape from Russia? And they find it really interesting that she knew the whole time that the Russians had him. 
She starts begging them to let her go, saying he's going to kill me and all of us. But they don't because they're going to use her as bait. They walk outside because this is just step one of their plan. After watching that video back in Russia, Mother Smoke has an idea on how to knock Soldier Boy out. But as they're discussing it, Starlight shows up to the surprise of Billy and Huey. And neither are too happy when she tells them that Mother's Milk called her. Mother's Milk just figured that they might need backup. And Huey feels like it's too dangerous for her, but she says, wait, it's too dangerous for me? I, I mean, what about you? So Huey and Starlight end up taking the conversation to the side. And that's when Huey shows her that he's souped up with Temp V. They start kind of getting into a little bit of an argument about who's supposed to save who and what's the safest route to do this. Huey feeling like he needs to save Starlight, but she says, I don't need you to save me, Huey. I just need you. As those two are discussing all of this, Mother's Milk starts feeling pretty crappy, and that's because he was drugged by Billy. Billy cannot let Mother's Milk attack Soldier Boy. So as Billy puts it, you left me no choice. I had to take you out of this equation. And that's because Billy wants to work with Soldier Boy. When Soldier Boy shows up, he recognizes Billy, Billy tells Soldier Boy, Crimson Countess, she's in there. And I felt like it would be a peace offering. Because what I think we should do is team up. Seems like Soldier Boy's on board because he enters the trailer and sees Crimson Countess. And she starts telling him, this wasn't my idea, I swear. But he asks her, how much did the Russians pay you? And she says, they didn't. And you see a very similar situation happen with these two that happened with Homelander and Queen Maeve. Soldier Boy really was in love with Crimson Countess, but Crimson Countess tells him, we all hated you. And that's when Soldier Boy does what he came there to do. He cranks that, killing her. It's such a powerful blast that Huey and Starlight get hit by a wind gust, and they know something happened. They rush over to the trailer to see Billy carrying Mother's Milk's body back to the car, and Starlight is real pissed off when she finds out that Mother's Milk was roofied. She gets even more angry when she sees Soldier Boy walk out from the wreckage. It looks like she's about to attack Soldier Boy, but Huey stands in the way and says, Look, Annie, we wanted a weapon. Soldier Boy's going to be that weapon. She can't believe that he's about to team up with Soldier Boy, and he says, This is the only way that I can save you from Homelander. Please, join us. But she in turn begs him not to go. And in the end, he leaves her behind. Frenchie obviously wasn't a part of this meeting. He was busy with Kamiko in the hospital. The good news is Kamiko is going to make a full recovery, and she is thrilled when she realizes she has completely lost her powers. While she doesn't get any visitors, Frenchie does. Little Nina was not happy with the job that was done, and she feels like Frenchie still owes her. Frenchie tries to pawn that off on Billy, but Little Nina says, You introduced me to Billy. This is on you. She hands him an envelope with a father and a daughter that he's supposed to kill, but he has no interest in that whatsoever. He just wants to stay in the hospital with Kamiko watching movies. Nina calls him up later that night to see if the job's done, but he sends it to voicemail. And Kamiko decides that'd be a good night to kiss Frenchie for the first time. He's very into it, but a little nervous, so he says, I'm going to go get a coffee. When he does that, little Nina grabs him. But unfortunately for Kamiko, it leaves her all alone in the hospital thinking that maybe by kissing him, she did something wrong. Also in the hospital is the A-Train. But it's not for a doctor's appointment. Nathan is in really rough shape. He's probably never going to walk again. Earlier in the day when the A-Train showed up at Vaught Tower, he ran into Starlight, who let him know that what he did ended up getting Supersonic killed. She just can't understand the loyalty to Homelander, but he ends up getting rewarded for it because Homelander grants his wish. He has a one-on-one with Blue Hawk. It's pretty awkward, but... A-Train demands for an apology because he's patrolling Trenton a little too hard. And Blue Hawk agrees, yeah, all right, fine, whatever you want. So they head to the community center where Nathan and a bunch of the residents were hanging out. And then in walks Blue Hawk with a TV crew. Nathan is pretty appalled, but A-Train tells him, look, man, you get your apology and Vaught gets some good PR. This all works out. The apology, though, from Blue Hawk is pretty half-assed. He does agree to donate $10,000 to the community center, but the residents don't just let him off the hook. They start questioning why he killed people, why he did what he did. And while A-Train tries to wrap it up, maybe it's because he was inspired by Homelander's anti-cancel culture, but Blue Hawk starts going at the residents, screaming at them, calling ungrateful, amongst other pretty rude things. And then it gets pretty hostile, with Blue Hawk literally throwing residents around the center. And unfortunately, 
One of the residents that got really, really hurt was Nathan. As A-Train is standing in the hospital, he has to see Blue Hawk on TV talk about how he stood up to Antifa thugs, which is a complete lie. And he is really questioning his decision. In episode 6, Kamiko feels like she did something wrong. As she's just eating some ice cream, trying to text Frenchie, she gets taken by one of little Nina's guys. She wakes up in an abandoned building, chained, and right next to her is Cherry. Frenchie then gets brought in and it's clear that he's been tortured. He's also naked and he gets chained to a pole. And while little Nina is emasculating him, Kamiko takes matters into her own hands. She's able to break free of the chains and kills one of the guys with a popsicle stick. Cherry is also able to bust out of her restraints. And at the end of it, all of Nina's guys are dead, thanks to Kamiko. Little Nina is long gone, and Frenchie is saved. Frenchie takes both Cherry and Kamiko back to a place to patch Kamiko up, because she's banged up pretty good. And they both are just kind of feeling sorry for themselves. Frenchie makes a comment that no matter how hard they try, they just can't outrun their past lives. But at the end of it, at least they have each other. That is a blip on the radar, though, compared to what's going on at Vaught Tower. Homelander, The Deep, Ashley, and Black Noir have gotten video of Crimson Countess's chimp sanctuary just going up in flames. And when they zoom in, they see a very familiar face, even though they don't believe it. It's Soldier Boy. They realize they need to do some kind of crisis management, so Homelander says, All right, don't worry, I'll find him and I'll kill him. Well, he pulls Black Noir to the side because Soldier Boy was Black Noir's team leader, and he starts asking him his take on it. Black Noir might give Homelander an answer, we honestly don't know, but as soon as Homelander walks away and Black Noir gets on an elevator, he carves out the tracking beacon in his arm and he flees, getting the hell out of there. Because with Soldier Boy back, he doesn't want to be anywhere near the facility. A couple hours later, the Deet notices that Black Noir cut out his tracking chip. He goes and tells Daddy, I mean Homelander, about it. Homelander is in absolute disbelief, but both Cassandra and the Deep tell Homelander that they feel like Black Noir ran because Crimson Countess was just the start. And if he's going after his whole team, that includes Noir. But the good news is they figure they know where he's going next, and that's the TNT twins. They live up in Vermont. That's the closest spot. Homelander tells Deep, go up there, and if Soldier Boy does show up, you call me. But there is no question that Homelander is sweating this situation. But the Deep is not the only person with that theory. Mother's Milk has the same exact theory, that Soldier Boy is going after his own team. Mother's Milk is sitting in his apartment, gearing up for an absolute war, and telling his theory to Starlight. The good news is, Mother's Milk also has the address for the TNT twins, and he doesn't think Billy has it. But, at the same time, he knows that it's not going to take long for Billy to get that address. He's going to have to wait, though, because Starlight gets a phone call from Ashley telling her that she's needed at Vaught Tower. So Starlight's going to have to leave. But right before she does, she tells Mother's Milk, don't do anything stupid, because right now, it's just on us. Starlight then heads over to Vault Tower because she has a TV hit to do with Homelander. It's propaganda just to say that they have the whole situation completely under control, there's nothing to worry about. But she can tell that Homelander is shook. She gets a little frazzled herself when Victoria Newman shows up to do the hit on TV. Luckily for her, the cameras start rolling shortly after Victoria shows up, and they're able to just lie to the public saying, yeah, we're pretty close to catching this guy. But during the interview, the questions aren't really to Homelander's liking, so he calls the interviewer a hack and storms off. With the cameras off, Victoria asks for a couple minutes with Starlight, and while she doesn't want to give her that couple minutes, she reluctantly agrees. They head up to an office, and Victoria asks, where's Huey? And Starlight covers for him, saying, oh, he's fishing with his dad. And Victoria says, oh, okay, I was worried that he was scared I was going to pop his head. And that stops Starlight right in her tracks. Starlight starts flashing her eyes at Victoria, but Victoria says, Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you or Huey or your families. I actually want to help you. Annie, the fact is you need me. You're all alone. I mean, that hashtag Homelight stuff looks like a hostage video. And now you have to play nice with the deep. And Maeve, I mean, they say she's in rehab, but really, who knows? I mean, reality is she's probably dead. But you're America's sweetheart. You have 193 million Instagram followers. So lend me your influence and I'll lend you mine. I can protect you from Homelander. You'll finally be team captain for real. And in return, you'll help me boost up my numbers. I'll finally be able to get my education reform bill passed. And while it's a very enticing offer, Starlight stands up and says, No, I'm so sick of people telling me that I have to be a crappy person in order to win. All this whatever it takes crap, I'm done with it. 
she basically tells Victoria Newman to either pop her head or kick rocks because she's not doing it. And Victoria doesn't pop her head, just telling her, I hope we can keep this between us. Be really tough to take out America's sweetheart, but it's not impossible. And just to prove it, she leaves Annie with a nosebleed. But this is going to come as a surprise to a lot of people. Huey was not fishing with his dad. All the theories that everybody had about what Soldier Boy is up to is dead on accurate. Huey and Billy were able to convince Soldier Boy that he needs them. And in return, all they ask is that he kill Homelander. Billy goes off to try to track down the address of the TNT twins, which leaves just Huey and Soldier Boy alone in the hotel room. And Huey asks Soldier Boy, what happened in Midtown? But he tells him, I don't know. I blacked out for about 10 minutes. When I came to, the damage was done. I didn't mean to hurt those people. I'm not a bad guy. Huey asks him, that won't happen again, right? And Soldier Boy just tells him, only if they've got it coming. The awkwardness then gets interrupted because Billy has returned and he has the address for the TNT twins. So the trio heads up to Vermont. But before they do, they have to shoot up with Temp V. But while they're heading up there, Mother's Milk and Starlight are way ahead of them. During the drive, Mother's Milk tells Starlight exactly why he's got beef with Soldier Boy. When he was a little boy, he looked out the window and he saw Soldier Boy pull up on a bunch of kids that were trying to steal a Mercedes Benz and he ran to wake up his grandfather and tell him, hey, Soldier Boy's outside. But then all of a sudden, Soldier Boy threw that Benz through their house. It killed his grandfather. Narrowly missed him, but ever since, he's been terrified that Soldier Boy's going to come back and finish the job. So at this point, he just needs to kill Soldier Boy to get him out of his head. It's obviously going to be a lot easier said than done. They then arrive at the TNT twins' house, and they realize there's a party going on. Or, more like, an orgy. It's Herogasm 2022. It's exactly as it sounds. It's an orgy with superheroes. And while they weren't invited, Starlight's a big enough name to get her and Mother's Milk through the door. Let me just say, most of the images I cannot show, or my entire channel is getting demonetized. While Mother's Milk and Starlight showed up just to warn the TNT twins, they realized, though, that they have a much bigger issue because if Soldier Boy shows up, all of these people are in danger. So they gotta warn these people to get them out. The first superhero that she recognizes that she sees is Blue Hawk. And she tries to warn Blue Hawk to get out of there, but Blue Hawk doesn't feel like there's any danger, especially after what Homelander said. He even pulls the, do your research, to Starlight of all people. The second superhero she runs into is The Deep. The Deep went there on Homelander's orders, but Herogasm waits for no man, and the TNT twins had a fish tank. You can see where this is going. It's awkward, but The Deep does fill Annie in on Homelander's plans. And that really boosts Annie's concerns even more, because if Homelander does show up, and Soldier Boy shows up, and these two start fighting, then it's not going to end well for anybody in that house. And to make matters worse for Annie, she's completely unaware of the fact that Soldier Boy has shown up. Soldier Boy... Billy, Huey, they're outside of the house surveying the situation. And the only reason Soldier Boy hasn't shown up yet is because Huey convinced him to give him three minutes, find out exactly where the TNT twins are, so nobody else does get hurt. So while Annie's trying to warn people to get out of there, Huey is naked walking through the house and trying to locate the TNT twins. He does, and as he goes to leave, he runs into a familiar face, the A-Train. Although the A-Train is not there for the orgy. The A-Train went to Ashley earlier in the day looking for answers on what they plan to do about Blue Hawk. But Ashley, who is so stressed out, freaked out at A-Train telling him that he's got a lot of revisionist history. He's only concerned about this because it happened to him. What about the three murders that he caused that Ashley had to clean up? It's a lot for A-Train to think about, but it's clear that Ashley isn't going to do anything about Blue Hawk, so he tried to track Blue Hawk down himself. And he tracked him down to the orgy. When Huey and A-Train run into each other, A-Train starts kind of making fun of Huey for even being there, which Huey reminds him, hey, but you're here too. But then Huey remembers that he's a soup now. So he puts on a robe and says, hey, by the way, you never apologize for Robin. Totally getting ready to beat the crap out of A-Train. But to his surprise, the A-Train does apologize. Because after what Ashley said, he has had time to reflect. And he realizes that those murders really did have an effect on other people. Just like what happened with his brother is having an effect on him. He's finally starting to see the light. But even though he apologized, it wasn't what Huey was thinking and it's not as satisfying as he wanted to. So he ends up punching A-Train in the face. And the strength of Huey shocks A-Train. But that's when Annie sees the two fighting. 
She gets in the middle of it and breaks it up. Starlight grabs Huey, pulls him to the side, and says, we gotta clear this house now. But as Huey tries to convince Starlight that Soldier Boy is not gonna come in there and kill everybody, Soldier Boy shows up. Huey doesn't want anything to happen to Starlight, so he teleports her out of there, and the two start getting into a fight about Huey, quote, saving Starlight, and Starlight feeling like Huey doesn't need to save her. It all boils down to Huey's insecurity. While he told Starlight originally that her being more powerful didn't bother him, it kind of does. But while those two argue safely away from the house, back inside the house, Mother Smoke gets eyes on Soldier Boy, and he throws a canister that he thinks is going to knock him out, but it doesn't. Mother's Milk then tells Soldier Boy, you killed my family, and he gets ready for a fight, a fight that he clearly would lose, and while he doesn't think it, Mother's Milk is lucky because Billy shows up and tells Soldier Boy, hey, we're not killing him. Twins are upstairs. As Soldier Boy goes up to take care of the twins, Mother's Milk is still trying to get at him, and Billy has to literally hold him back. Mother's Milk's so pissed off, he starts attacking Billy, but because Billy is all hopped up on Temp V, it doesn't really affect him. Upstairs, though, Soldier Boy has located the twins, and they start telling him that they had nothing to do with it, and it was actually all Black Noir's doing. But Soldier Boy doesn't even believe that, because Black Noir, out of all of them, was the biggest Vought puppet. They swear that it's true, and then all of a sudden, Soldier Boy gets really distracted by a radio that is playing a Russian song. As he's distracted by it, the TNT twins decide, you know what, let's try to get rid of them with our powers, but they're so rusty it doesn't work. And the exact same thing that happened in Midtown happens in the house. Soldier Boy just explodes, killing the twins and injuring a whole lot of people while destroying the house. Luckily for Billy and Mother's Milk, they were in the basement, so they're not as banged up, but Mother's Milk is hurt. In the distance, both Annie and Huey hear what's going on, so they rush back to the house. And what they find is a slew of superheroes who are coming out of the wreckage really injured, a lot of them dead. Two guys who seem to be perfectly fine are Blue Hawk and the A-Train. And as Blue Hawk is trying to leave, the A-Train goes up to him, and he's finally ready to get justice. He grabs him by the neck, throws him down on the ground, and then grabs his foot and runs as fast as he can, dragging him behind him, killing him as his body just gets ripped apart on the pavement. But the warning that his doctor gave him rears its ugly head, because eventually the A-Train has to stop. His heart is giving out, and he just collapses to the ground. Back at the house... Soldier Boy comes downstairs and sees Billy and asks him what happened, having no idea that he was what happened. But then another person comes down the steps, and it's Homelander. He's not surprised at all to see Billy Butcher behind this. And then he and Soldier Boy start trading insults back and forth, with them both getting into a ridiculous pissing contest. But then they zip up their flies, and they start to fight. As they're fighting, Annie comes rushing in and grabs Mother's Milk before he makes a terrible decision, telling him that there are people outside that need his help. So Annie and Mother's Milk go and try to help out the victims. But while Soldier Boy seems to be rusty and not really a match by himself for Homelander, Huey and Billy also get involved, and it's three versus one. It looks like it's about to be curtains for Homelander, but he ends up muscling out and flying off. When he gets back to Vault Tower, though, he is concerned because it's the first real test he actually has faced. The trio then make their way out of the house, and as they're leaving, they see Annie and Mother's Milk, and both Annie and Mother's Milk give them a death stare. That night, though, Annie decides to do something about it. She has Mother's Milk film her on Instagram Live saying that there are 12 heroes and civilians dead. A whole lot more are wounded, and Homelander and Vought are going to tell you that it was a supervillain and they have it under control, but they don't, because the supervillain that they're talking about is actually Soldier Boy. He's alive. And the reality is Soldier Boy doesn't care about protecting Americans, and he probably never has, because most heroes don't care about anybody. Most heroes only care about their image. And Homelander is the worst of all of them. He's hurt people. He's done something to Maeve. And truthfully, I don't know what they're going to do to me for telling the truth, but I'm going to keep doing it, and I should have done it sooner. And also, I'm no longer Starlight. My name is Annie January, and I quit. In Episode 7, the Vought PR campaign went to work after Starlight's shocking walkout. They claim that she's making all of it up, Soldier Boy isn't real, Maeve is in rehab, And, to just put icing on the cake, they say that Starlight is working with a known terrorist whose specialty is human trafficking. That known terrorist is Kamiko. In reality, though, Maeve isn't actually in rehab, but she also isn't dead. She's in the basement of Vought in what might as well be a prison cell because she can't get out. 
She gets a visit from Homelander, who demands to know where Butcher and Soldier Boy are. He figures that Maeve must know. But that's when Maeve realizes that he's wearing cover-up, because he's covering up a bruise. It's the first time that she has seen Homelander actually worried, and she is reveling in it. But then Homelander starts talking about their relationship. How one day he really thought that they would have kids and it would be the most powerful kid ever born. Homelander's powers and Maeve's powers combined. And she warns him that if you try to stick anything inside of me, I'm going to shatter it. And Homelander gets really turned off by that notion that he would even do something like that. Because he won it. He did, however, harvest her eggs. Just in case she ends up dying, her legacy can live on with him. As he's leaving, he tells her, I'm not letting you live. I'm keeping you alive. But while Homelander was talking to Maeve, he probably should be talking to the legend because that's where Huey, Butcher, and Soldier Boy are. It's not like the legend wants them there. It doesn't seem like he has a choice, though. As Soldier Boy gets his rocks off with two chicks at the same time, the legend tells Huey that Soldier Boy's mystique was mainly made up. Yeah, he stormed the beaches of Normandy, but he did it two weeks after D-Day. He's also not a great guy because he was with the Birmingham riots back in the 50s. And there was a little mix-up at Kent State where he got trigger-happy. Yet, he's not a good human being. But America needed a hero at that point, so Vaught just swept it all under the rug. Billy then walks in the room, and he's got a problem. He can't find Mindstorm, one of the members of Payback. Soldier Boy gave Billy a bunch of Mindstorm's last known locations, but they're all coming up empty. And Soldier Boy tells Billy and Huey that Mindstorm bought up a bunch of different cottages. He's paranoid. So you really just got to check them out one by one. And the legend says he's not paranoid, he's bipolar. And that's when Huey gets the idea that if he's bipolar and he's taking medication, they might be able to whittle down where Mindstorm is just by checking local pharmacies. So they get to work and they find a location that fits that narrative. It's in the middle of the woods and they start walking around. Huey and Billy shoot themselves up full of temp V and they start walking through the forest to try to find Mindstorm. While doing so, Huey notices that there's something coming out of Billy's ear. He's never seen it before, it's pretty gross, and Billy doesn't think much of it. He just kind of swats whatever it is away. But then there's an explosion, because Soldier Boy triggered a booby trap that was set there by Mindstorm. And as Billy is a little bit disoriented, Mindstorm shows up and looks him in the eye, and that's his superpower. He's able to control your mind and put you in a prison where you just die off. That's what he does with Billy, putting him in a prison where he has to relive his horrible childhood with his brother we loved, but his super abusive father. As quickly as Mindstorm showed up, he's gone. Huey tries to get Butcher to wake up, but Soldier Boy says, you're wasting your time, he's gone. He's trapped in an endless nightmare. He's going to end up dying of terminal dehydration. Huey asks Soldier Boy if there's a way to wake him up, and Soldier Boy says, yeah. I mean, Mindstorm, he put him into this, he can snap him out of it. But all Soldier Boy's thinking about is killing Mindstorm, not having him wake up Butcher. He's not attached to Butcher. He just looks at Butcher as a guy who sacrificed himself for the betterment of the cause, which is killing Payback and getting to Homelander. But Huey looks at Butcher as a guy who saved him, so he's super loyal to him. And even though Soldier Boy isn't interested in helping him, Huey's not giving up hope. But in the meantime, he has to go with Soldier Boy, continuing through the woods to catch up to Mindstorm before he's gone. They end up locating where Mindstorm is camped out at. But before Soldier Boy can kill him, Huey uses his powers to teleport Mindstorm back to Billy. He tells Mindstorm, look man, I just need you to help out my friend. If you do that... I'll teleport you anywhere. I'll get you away from Soldier Boy. So Mindstorm does it. And when Billy comes to, he is very apologetic to Huey. He regrets a lot of the things he did in his youth with his brother that he feels like cost his brother his life. So when he wakes up, he immediately starts apologizing to Huey, but Huey can't figure out what he's apologizing for. When Billy starts to calm down, Huey looks at Mindstorm and says, okay, a deal's a deal. But before he can teleport him anywhere, Soldier Boy has returned and he starts attacking Mindstorm. Because it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where Huey teleported him to. Huey tries to step in, but Soldier Boy ends up punching him in the face pretty hard. And while Billy wants to retaliate, he knows that he deep down needs Soldier Boy, so he doesn't do anything. Soldier Boy then puts a bag over Mindstorm's head, and Mindstorm tells Soldier Boy exactly what the TNT twins told him. That the entire idea was Black Noirs. But the new wrinkle is the fact that Vought gave him the green light to do it. When Soldier Boy asks why... Mindstorm tells them it's because they had a new guy coming up in the system that they thought would be better than Soldier Boy. That person was Homelander. But the real interesting part is that Soldier Boy is Homelander's father. Soldier Boy gets so angry he bludgeons Mindstorm to death. 
And then they just take off back to the Legends place. And Black Noir is currently camped out, hiding from Soldier Boy at an old pizza arcade that he used to go to as a kid called Buster Beavers. He has fond memories of this place, even though it's completely run down and abandoned. But as he sits there alone, his imagination starts running with him, and he starts being joined by the cartoon characters on the wall. And they give you the backstory on exactly what happened with Vought, Soldier Boy, Black Noir. And what it boils down to is, Soldier Boy was a bully that everybody was sick of, but nobody was standing up to. So Stan Edgar gave Black Noir the green light to do something about it in that moment. So as they were supposed to be fighting the Rebels, Payback completely turned on Soldier Boy and attacked him instead. It wasn't the Rebels and it wasn't a bomb that ended up burning up Black Noir's face, causing him to constantly wear that helmet. It was actually Soldier Boy. But Soldier Boy couldn't fight off Black Noir, Crimson Countess, Mindstorm, and the TNT Twins by himself. Eventually, they were able to get him down to the ground and knock him out. Then, they just shipped him off to Russia. And that is why he's an absentee father. Of course, Homelander doesn't know any of this. He's currently working the Vought PR spin. He's got a rally to go to for Robert Singer for president, but he spends most of it talking about Starlight and how she made everything up. When he finally gets off the stage, he heads to a barn that's close by, but he's joined by Victoria Newman. She tells Soldier Boy, I'm going to tell you the truth because nobody else will. You need to pull your crap together, admit it's Soldier Boy, and take control of the situation. You just spent the last 20 minutes talking about Starlight instead of the next president of the United States. You're Homelander, and you're flailing. And that's when Homelander grabs her by the throat. As she gasps her air, she says, you need someone you can trust. I'm talking a strictly transactional relationship. You help me out with one small favor and I help you. She then pulls out a piece of paper with an address and we can only assume that it's the address of where Ryan is located. He then releases her from his grip and she takes off. But it's become clear to anybody that was at the rally and Vought that Starlight is living rent-free in Homelander's head. And Starlight is camped out with Mother's Milk, Frenchie, and Kamiko, who is back on the mend. Frenchie and Mother's Milk sit down and they start looking over some surveillance footage and they can't figure out why the item that Mother's Milk chucked at Soldier Boy didn't knock him out. Because in the video they're watching, it seemed to. So they start combing over a bunch of chemistry notes. As they're doing that, Annie is in the other room with Kamiko patching up her wounds. But Kamiko has a favor to ask. She needs Annie to go back to Vought and get Compound V, the permanent stuff. Annie really doesn't want to do it, but Kamiko makes an impassioned plea, and at the end of it, Annie agrees to go. And as Annie heads off to Vought, Mother's Milk and Frenchie are still in the living room trying to figure out why the gas they used didn't work. As they're doing that, that rally that Homelander was at is on the TV, and they're talking about Robert Singer's likely VP, a guy named Lamar Bishop. But that's when Frenchie, who is not watching the TV, he's actually trying to figure this out, has an epiphany. It wasn't gas, it's vapor. The Russians were using a nerve agent, something that would kill the normal person, completely shutting down their organs, but the soldier boy, it just knocks them out. And if they're going to get some, they're going to have to go back to Russia. Sounds like a great idea to Mother's Milk, but then he gets an alert on his phone, and it's from his daughter's Instagram, who is posing with Todd at that Homelander rally. So Mother's Milk takes off over to their house, and he waits Todd out. And when Todd arrives, Todd can't figure out what the big deal is. Mother's Milk explains to Todd that everything he's talking about is nonsense because Todd clearly believes everything he reads on Facebook. But when Mother's Milk reminds him that Janine is his daughter, Todd fires back a shot like Janine needs a real man in her life and Mother's Milk ends up knocking him out. With just Frenchie and Kimiko back in the apartment, Kimiko lets Frenchie know that Annie left to go get her Compound V. And just like Annie, Frenchie can't figure out why Kimiko wants it. But Kimiko shows Frenchie the message she gave to Annie which was at first, Kimiko hated the V. But that's because she didn't choose it. Now, she is choosing it. It's her choice. For years, she blamed her powers for her problems. But now she knows that the V doesn't make you a good person or a bad person. It just depends on who's using it. And she plans on using her powers for good, to fight for those that she loves, which includes Frenchie, who she refers to as her family. So Frenchie gets on board and they just wait for Annie to return. Annie is able, by the way, to sneak into Vaught. She gets into the lab, finds the compound V, but then she also notices notes on the temp V, and it's not good. It causes lesions on the brain, basically turning your brain into Swiss cheese, and taking three to five doses could kill you. So this is information she's going to want to get to Huey. As she's leaving Vought Tower, she ends up running into Homelander, though. Homelander tries to bully her into going to the Vought Studios and recanting everything she said, 
But she gets Homelander to admit that Homelander was the one who killed Supersonic. And Homelander is completely unaware that Annie went live on her Instagram. So all these people are hearing this. It gives her the security she needs to get in the elevator, and Homelander tries to play it off like they were running lines, but it's pretty clear that they weren't. As soon as she gets outside, she calls up Billy, asking where Huey is because he's not answering his cell phone, and she fills Billy in on the dangers of Temp V. That's probably what was going on with Billy's ear. Billy, who had just gone through that mental prison where he felt guilty about what he did to his brother, and he sees the similarities in Huey, feels guilty for introducing Huey to such a dangerous product. But when it comes time to actually tell Huey about it, he starts to. He says, yeah, I gotta talk to you about the Temp V. He pivots and says, we gotta swing by the office and get some more. And then, we're all gonna finish this job. And the big piece in that job is Soldier Boy, who is in the room, and he makes a phone call to his son, Homelander. He explains that ye- ah! he explains to him that years ago he gave a sperm sample. That sperm sample became Homelander. And the craziest part is, if they just would have kept him around, he would have given Homelander the spotlight. But you get the sense that now he's not really willing to do that. Back with the woman that is trying hard. Ah! Back with the woman that is trying to kill Homelander's brand. Annie returns to the apartment, and Annie is still trying to get a hold of Huey. Kamiko asks her, "What are you gonna do?" And Annie tells her, I'm going to save Huey. She then hands over the Compound V to Kimiko, and Frenchie shoots her up with it. So her powers are back. And then finally, the Vault PR machine and Ashley weren't just working with the Starlight situation. They were also working with the A-Train. They know what the A-Train did, but the story they're going with is that it was all Soldier Boy. The A-Train actually tried to save Blue Hawk. And the A-Train finds this out in a hospital bed. He wakes up having just undergone heart surgery. And the heart he has is now Blue Hawks. And then over with the deep, he tries to have a threesome with Cassandra, which is cool. I mean, I find her attractive, but an octopus named Ambrosia. And yeah, Cassandra's not cool with that. So that relationship might be on the rocks. And then finally, in episode eight, Soldier Boy tells both Huey and Billy that he is the father of Homelander. And ever since, he's kind of been acting weird. Billy is trying to act like it's business as usual, though. And the plan is to go get Noir kill him, and then the next and final stop is killing Homelander. First, though, they do have to stop and get some more Temp V. On the trip to go find Noir, they stop off at a gas station, and Billy's conscience gets the best of him. After being in that headspace, he does realize how much Huey reminds him of his own brother, and he can't let Huey, in good conscience, take more Compound V. So he does the only way to protect him, Billy Butcher style, knocking him out and leaving him at that rest stop. Then he just gets in the car... And Billy and Soldier Boy take off to finish the job. And because he's stuck at a gas station, Huey has to call the only person he thinks will answer, and that's Starlight. Starlight picks him up a little while later on her way over to the apartment where she's planning on meeting with Frenchie and Mother's Milk. And Huey apologizes for everything. He tells her about the latest development with Homelander and Soldier Boy. And she reveals to him that taking that Temp V is very dangerous. Huey had no idea, but now Billy's reaction makes a lot more sense. Starlight looks at it like Billy's a jerk for not telling him, and Huey looks at it like Billy saved his life. Annie then gives him a nice dose of I told you so, but then she gets a phone call letting her know that there's another person waiting at the apartment, and it's Queen Maeve. After Starlight's social media quest to get answers on what happened to Maeve, a lot of people came out in droves to Vaught Tower. Vaught knew that they had a possible ride on their hands, so they had to drug Maeve up and secretly move her. But the gas that knocked her out only worked for so long, and Maeve was able to break out of the Brinks truck that she was being transported from. So she headed to go see some friendly faces, and that's how she ended up in the apartment. Maeve is really, really appreciative of everything Starlight did. But now, they need to figure out what to do about Soldier Boy and about Homelander. Huey lets the group know about Homelander and Soldier Boy's connection. And there's just a lot of question marks around it. Like, they just don't know what's going to happen when these two get in the same room. What they're worried about is that they start fighting, and Soldier Boy ends up exploding like he did, and Vaught Tower crumbles, which is going to kill a lot of innocent people. Because of that, Annie makes a phone call over to Vaught Tower, warning them about this to evacuate the building, but they just hang up on her. So the group starts spitballing, and one of the ideas is to take down Soldier Boy before he takes down Homelander. They can do that thanks to Frenchie. He was able to secure some nerve gas. It's supposedly the only gas in the United States powerful enough to take down Soldier Boy. But Huey's main focus is on saving Billy. 
And while it isn't going to sit well with the group, he makes a pretty compelling case. Now they just need to go find Billy and Soldier Boy before they head over to Vought, and they figure that they can find him at the Flatiron Building. So, so far, it's been a very busy day for that group, but it's also been a very busy day at Vought Tower. Vault stock has been crumbling since Starlight's feed went viral, where Homelander basically admits to killing Supersonic. If that wasn't bad enough, Ashley and the Deep have to go to him and tell him what happened to Queen Maeve, how she broke out. But as they're trying to get the words out to tell him, Black Noir walks through the door. He tells Homelander that if Soldier Boy comes, he's going to end up trying to kill everybody, so they got to kill him first. But after finding out that Soldier Boy is his father, he's kind of reluctant to do that. He always wanted a father figure, and there he was the entire time, alive. He just didn't know it. He asked Black Noir, what was he like? I mean, you were on his team. And Black Noir just tells him he was a bad dude. But then Soldier Boy asks him, did you know that he was my father? And Black Noir has to keep in mind that Homelander knows everything. He can see his face. So he admits, yeah, I did. And that's when Homelander kills him, literally ripping his heart out of his chest. So now everybody from Payback is dead. He then goes to meet with Ashley, The Deep, and A-Train. And they're freaking out because they heard Starlight's message. They know that Soldier Boy is coming for him. But they get even more worried when Homelander places Black Noir's helmet on the table and says that he's dead because he was keeping secrets. The Deep asks him, what can I do to help? And that's when Homelander remembers the conversation he had with Victoria Newman. She gave him the location of Ryan, but she wanted something in return. So Homelander sends the Deep to go kill Lamar Bishop, the likely Vice President of the United States, which the Deep does. Homelander then embarrasses both Ashley and the A-Train, just dressing them up and down. Over with Homelander's father, he's also having reservations, it seems, about killing his own flesh and blood. He tells Billy all about his own father. The story that everybody got was that Soldier Boy grew up on the streets of the greatest city in the world, South Philadelphia. And he was a happy kid and he saved the Nazis, but all of it was crap. His dad was disappointed in him. He was embarrassed and ashamed. Soldier Boy just signed up for the Vought Trials and became a superhero that way. And when he finally faced his dad as a hero, his dad told him, you took the easy way out. He always thought he had kids out there and he figured one day he would be able to right the wrongs of his dad. Be the exact opposite of him. And Billy tells him, Homelander is not your kid. He was born in a test tube. You didn't raise him. He's the reason that you were rotting in Russia. And then he reminds him of the fact that they do have a deal. Soldier Boy ends up leaving the room. And a little while later, there's a knock at the door. And a Billy surprise, it's Queen Maeve. But she's not alone. She's with the whole group. They start demanding to know where Soldier Boy is because they want to stop him. Billy still wants to go after Homelander. But they try to convince Billy that it's actually Soldier Boy and not Homelander that needs to be stopped. But the person they should have been trying to convince was Queen Maeve. Because she ends up taking that nerve gas and chucking it out the window. She then breaks Mother's Milk's gun and tells them Billy's right. Homelander needs to die. Annie's ready to step in and stop Maeve. And Maeve tells her, I don't want to hurt you. But that's when Soldier Boy shows up and says, she won't, but I will. They realize that now is not the time to pick the fight with Soldier Boy. They're just not prepared. Soldier Boy and Billy then lock the group up and they take off her vault tower. It doesn't take too long for Huey and the Starlight group to bust on out, though. They know that Maeve, Soldier Boy, and Billy have a head start, but they need to formulate a plan. The bad news is they did lose that nerve gas, but Frenchie says, I think there's one place that we might be able to get some more, and luckily we're heading there anyway. It's Vaught Tower. So the plan is going to be for Frenchie and Kamiko to go to the lab and Frenchie start getting his Bill Nye the Science Guy on, while Huey, Mother's Milk, and Starlight try to distract Soldier Boy. All of this is going to be way easier said than done. They head over, but Billy, Maeve, and Soldier Boy have already arrived. And questions about how Soldier Boy and Homelander would act once they got in a room are answered pretty quickly. Homelander pitches Soldier Boy on teaming up. And then he introduces Soldier Boy to his grandson. Because Homelander ended up going and finding Ryan. And he ended up saying everything right this time. He basically was the exact opposite of Billy. When the topic of Becca got brought up, Ryan thought that Homelander would have the same reaction that Billy had. He couldn't believe that Homelander wasn't mad at him. And Homelander told him that mistakes happen, and he's always going to love him. So Ryan was more than happy to come along with Homelander. He's even started calling him dad again. And when he meets Soldier Boy for the first time, he calls him grandpa. But while Soldier Boy told Billy that he wanted to do things differently from his own father, 
Turns out the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He tells Homelander how disappointed he is in him. How Homelander is too soft to be his kid. And then he chokes him. No one's really coming to Homelander's defense because they're all there to watch Homelander die. And it's Ryan who uses his powers to knock down Soldier Boy. Homelander then looks at Ryan and tells him, get back upstairs so that Ryan will be safe. And that's when Soldier Boy straight up bodies Ryan, knocking him down and he's bleeding from the head. And that doesn't sit well with just about anybody. It not only pisses off Homelander, it pisses off Billy as well. And now we've got a situation where the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Both Billy and Homelander use their powers to blast Soldier Boy through a plate of glass, knocking him down. Homelander then turns around to deal with Ryan and see how he's doing, while Billy goes to attend to Soldier Boy. And Soldier Boy can't believe that Billy is doing this because it was Billy who was the one who wanted Homelander dead so badly. Now he's got his chance and Billy is going back on it. But Billy explains that Soldier Boy isn't supposed to go after the kid. That's not part of the deal. The kid is his wife's. And when Soldier Boy realizes that Billy Butcher is sticking up for the son of Homelander after Homelander had sex with his wife, he says, Billy, you're softer than he is. And the two start getting into a big fight. Homelander goes to join, but he's stopped by Queen Maeve, who is out for vengeance. As that is going on, Huey and his group were able to get to Vaught Tower. Huey headed to the intercom system to try to get everybody from Vaught out of there before catastrophe hits. Frenchie and Kamiko headed to the lab, and Frenchie started doing his thing, and Kamiko started protecting him once security came. Frenchie ends up getting injured and shot in the leg, but he is able to finish up the gas and give it to Kamiko to head to the TV studio where the fight is going on. And speaking of the fight, Mother's Milk and Starlight have joined in, and it has gotten bloody. I'm talking like Queen Maeve has lost an eye. In the other room, Soldier Boy is just too much for Billy, Mother's Milk, and Starlight. And when Kamiko shows up with the gas, Soldier Boy throws her to the side like a rag doll. Huey is watching all of this from the control room and he wants to step in. He's got one last vial of Temp V, but he decides to actually heed Annie's advice and let her do her thing. Instead of intervening, he just bumps up all of the lights, giving Annie way more power than she's used to. And with that power, she knocks Soldier Boy down and he's a little bit wobbled. It frees up the group in enough time to trap Soldier Boy and stick that gas mask on him. But as they're trying to knock Soldier Boy out with the gas, Queen Maeve is able to stab Homelander in the ear with an object, which frees her up, and it seems like they're actually going to win this thing. But then they notice that Soldier Boy is gearing up to have one of his big explosions. And Billy looks over and sees that Ryan has re-entered the room. He goes to protect Ryan, And it looks like the group of Kimiko, Mother's Milk, Starlight, they're just going to die at the hands of Soldier Boy. But that's when Queen Maeve steps in, grabbing Soldier Boy, flying him out of Vaught Tower, where he explodes. All things considered, everybody other than Queen Maeve seems to be doing okay. But that includes Homelander. The group is ready for yet another fight, but as Billy is checking on Ryan, Homelander walks up. And it seems like he's ready to kill Billy Butcher. That is until Ryan tells him, Dad, I want to go. And even though Billy doesn't want Ryan to go with him, he doesn't have a choice. Ryan and Homelander walk out of the room. Billy suddenly doesn't feel so good, and he collapses to the ground. A few days later, a few days later, he finds out that he only has maybe a year left to live. All that temp V did its damage. Most of the world, however, is mourning the loss of Queen Maeve, but she's actually not dead. She was saved by Kamiko and the rest of the group, taken back to the apartment and bandaged up. She's still on the mend and she lost an eye, but with the world thinking she's dead, she can finally start a life of her own with Elena. And in case you're wondering, Vaught also knows that she's alive, but they just deleted the footage. And since Maeve survived the blast, so did Soldier Boy. But Soldier Boy's body was taken by Grace Mallory and put into a chamber that will keep him alive, but also keep him sedated. Billy's group ends up going to the Flatiron Building office, which, by the way, that includes Mother's Milk, who finally told his daughter the truth about why he's so anti-soup. And they start talking about the newest member of the group, which is going to be Annie. She's done being Vaught's little puppet. The group has also found their next target. It's going to be the future Vice President of the United States, Victoria Newman. Now we know why she had Homelander do what he did. And speaking of Homelander... He shows up at a rally and introduces all of his fans to his son, Ryan. But there's also a lot of protesters at this rally 
who are anti-Homelander. And when one of them throws a can at Ryan's face and it hits him, Homelander reacts by killing that person on the spot. Nobody in the crowd knows quite sure what to do, except Todd, because of course Todd is there, and he starts cheering, and the entire group starts cheering. Homelander gets a giant smile on his face, and Ryan gets a bit of a smirk as well. And that is how Season 3 of The Boys ends. Thank you so much for getting this point of the recap. Consider subscribing to this channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this recap. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this sucked. I do have a Patreon link. It's in the description. Go click on it. You'll get stuff. I also have merch. Go click on that. You can buy stuff. And if you want to leave nasty comments, one thing you can do is F off. Because I don't have time for that. Too much negativity. It's one of the reasons I usually don't read comments anyway. But I do appreciate you getting to this point of the video.